Hey guys welcome back to the channel this is a story about what if Deku's quirk unravels a mystery in class 1a. If you guys enjoy this movie comment down below and let me know before I start please do support for more awesome content. And leave a like and don't forget to subscribe to my channel and also share this video with your friends and check out the description in my playlist. The author of the story cream peach cake tart from fanfiction.net. So let's start the video. M. Any people can see how loving the Midoriya couples are. Midoriya and Ko is a beautiful woman with her bright green hair who worked in the healthcare industry as a nurse. Following her mother's steps, the youthful heroine, Shuzenji Chiyo, to be a healer, considering she's also an Omega, and Ko thinks that her identity is perfect fit for the job. Everyone knows on how Omegas are valued in healthcare. Not only they can conceive a child regardless of first gender, what Omegas are most treasured for is their calming pheromone. Alphas mostly have aggressive pheromone. Forget helping others. Alphas themselves are prone to pheromone disorders and damaged glands. Betas do have pheromone but can't emit it. Omega's pheromone is useful for pacifying manic alphas, helping disordered pheromone. And for some omegas, they can even heal damaged glands so it can function once again. Even though omegas aren't scarce, but their population are always less compared alphas and betas. And in a demanding industry where they need all the helping hand they can get, omegas have always been a first choice. So yeah, Midoriya and Co. enjoys doing her job. And although she doesn't inherit her mother's quirk, she has already fulfilled her childhood dream to be a healer. And Ko's husband on the other hand, Midoriya Hasashi, is a taciturn alpha. He's a reserved man because of his upbringing since he's a child. Growing up in a family with all power, money and status, Hasashi always felt that he has everything yet lacking at the same time. Busy parents, no siblings and friends to play with has made Hisashi to cherish his words like gold, only interacting with others when he needed. Though meeting Inko has obviously changed him. Even though his parents suggested him to have a relationship with Inko was for relation at first. Because that's all Inko is to his parents' eyes, youthful heroine's only Omega daughter, Hisashi didn't think so. The moment his cold gaze swept over the bright emerald one has caught him off guard. Hisashi is for following his parents' arrangement at first. But when he realized that Inko genuinely loves him, realizing the adoration in her eyes, Pheromone kept wafting over, as if to entice him further. That's where Hasashi knew that he's smitten with the green-haired Omega. The next step is obvious, that is marriage. Inko took his family's surname, Midoriya, and Hasashi felt like he's over the moon when they finally become mates. He knew his wife is a spoiled one. Growing up with the love from her mother, love from her friend and now love from her husband, Hisashi will do anything Inko asked him to do, as long as it doesn't harm herself and others. Like now, Hisashi and Inko have tried for years to have a baby, but they never succeeded. Inko is growing more and more despondent as time passes while Hisashi tried his best to alleviate his wife's gloom. At first, Hisashi took his wife on their weekly dinner outside in a restaurant. It was an enjoyable moment. They chatted, shared their days and Inko told him secrets that happened within her friend group. It was enjoyable. Then walking out from the restaurant, Inko suddenly felt nauseated. Caught a whiff of distressed pheromone, presumably from an unpresented alpha. Same goes for Hasashi but he could control his expression better, considering he's also an alpha. He found the sour distressed pheromone from an alley and began to investigate it. There he found a child, frightened beyond words, light blue hair shone under the moonlight along with his piercing red eyes, who's so dull yet aggressive at the same time. Inko followed him and also realized something is wrong with the child. Like a soft-hearted woman she is, Inko did her best to help the child by helping him up and went to the police station to report a case of an abandoned child. The child thrashed and hissed at first, but Hisashi made sure his glare is enough to silence the feral child inside his wife's embrace. Really odd on how he stubbornly kept his hands away from Inko. Then Hisashi realized on why. The child's name is Shimura Tenko, with his quirk called Decay. Finding out the truth about such past from a young child was horrifying. At the corner of his eyes, Hisashi found that Tenko's eyes began to water, body tensed as if he's defending himself from something. Abused, was Hisashi's first thought, and from the way Inko's hug tightens around the child, he knew Tenko will become a permanent addition in their family. Taking care of Tenko's case was tedious. Thankfully the incident is dubbed as a quirk accident albeit a huge one, and considering his young age, Tenko is free of any permanent records, since the law also denies any criminal capacity from such a young child, though, the process after also doesn't make it any faster. Many, many therapy, legal files and handling, plus the adoption paper that would take them months even years to take care of. At this moment, Hisashi is thankful for the capital he built himself. He's thankful at the weight his surname holds, because with a click of his finger, any proceedings in case can be achieved quicker and more straightforward than most. After everything, Tenko finally become a part of the Midoriya family. At first, his parents have argued and complained, bringing home a child with villainous past. 
but Hisashi shut them down, completely ignoring their dissatisfactions. Shio on the other hand, was wary. She had checked and consulted many quirk counselors and the fact that Tenko doesn't have a switch for his quirk is dangerous. They opted for a glove that Tenko could wear and won't hinder his day-to-day -day activity. More money that Hisashi needed, but he won't complain. Seeing such a bright smile, twinkling light inside the previously gloomy red eyes, and healthy flush on his cheeks, the Midoriyas are content, though Inko might feel that Tenko is her shining star. Not even a year passed after Tenko arrived in their family, Inko is pregnant. The doctors told her that this pregnancy might be hard, considering her many previous attempts always fail. Inko wanted to keep the baby and Hisashi won't fight his wife on her decision. He'll just make sure everything else will go smoothly until the due date. It was an enriching experience for the whole family. Inko learned on how to take care of herself and the baby from her friend's husband, Bakugu Masaru, who also went through hard pregnancy with their newborn son Katsuki. Hisashi began to take classes on how to take care of a baby to the point that Inko chuckled on how overprepared he is. Taking care of a newborn is different on how he took care of Tenko. He used to read books, seek consultations and even took psychology courses for Tenko. Considering such past, Hisashi needed to work and raise his son a bit differently than other child. The day Izuku is born, many people felt different emotions. From birth, the doctors spotted a gland at the back of little Izuku's neck. After running tests, and examinations, they can conclude that Izuku will most likely differentiate as an Omega in the future. Inko cried happy tears when she heard her son's loud cry. Hisashi felt pure joy yet fear of the possibilities. Being a father to an Omega son, Chiyo gave her softest smile after she saw her second grandson and Tenko. He despises his younger brother. The young boy has grown up under the love of both Midoriyas and when he heard the news that he'll have a younger brother, Tenko felt the gut-wrenching fear inside his body. The boy imagined countless way the woman he begun to call his mother would scorn at him. The older alpha he took as a father would kick him out because they already have a better child. A pure baby who doesn't have a past like his. A few months passed by and Tenko refuses to interact with the baby. He refuses to call the child his brother. Inko and Hisashi also realize the reason why and doesn't force the boy to do so. They began to tread carefully between the two brothers, afraid to be seen as favoritism if they gave their love a bit more than the other. With the steady affection he got, Tenko also began to learn that the love he'll get is already reserved for him. Even if their family have Izuku now, Tenko understood that he's loved no matter what. After that realization, the Midoriya couple found Tenko in their bedroom, with tears slipping out of his eyes like a torrent, sobbing and hiccuping, until Inko ran to him and gave him her warmest embrace of solace. Hours passed by with both couple reassuring that they'll love the young blue-haired boy no matter what. And in the depth of the night, Tenko finally called them his parents. A mother and father that he could find comfort in. People that he can consult his quirk with. Someone that would support his hopes and dreams, no matter how unrealistic it might be. After those late night confessions, Tenko began to warm up with the green-haired baby. He can finally see on why Izuku is so lovable. Emerald green eyes that would melt your heart with a glance. Curly green hair followed his mother and a pleasant laugh you can listen to for hours until your fatigue dissipate. Tenko began to experience the joy of having a younger brother. He doesn't remember much of his life before the Midoriyas took him in. But what he does remember is that he had a sister who would took care of him and Tenko also did the same for Izuku. His memory has been hazy ever since the incident but he heard the doctors told his dad something about trauma response or something of sort, but he doesn't think it'll matter as long as he have his newfound family. Days turn to months and months turn to years. Izuku is now four, holding his favorite green rabbit doll in his arms. He was playing with Kakan before the explosive blonde began to fight with everyone he sees. They were playing family, with Izuku being the mother and Kakan, who's fighting, wanted the role of the father. It was weird for the greenette. Since many of his friends kept fighting to be the father and Kakin kept scowling whenever someone else becomes his partner. No, I'm supposed to be the father. The green-haired boy can hear his ash-blonde friend's shouts, considering Izuku enjoys being the role of mother. And no one has ever took the role away from him, the other kids naturally choose other roles. And right now, the most sought-after role is being the father. The role Kakin always fought for with reason the little green-haired Omega will never understand. No way, you were the father yesterday. I want to be Izu-chan's husband. Another kid shouts. I want to be a father now. Hey it's my turn to be Izuku's partner. Another round of argument led to a bunch of kids shouting from the top of their lungs. While some even went into a fight to the point their parents have to intercede. Kakin included. Izuku doesn't understand why they're still fighting while the adults smiled and laughed at them. His data on the other hand seemed like he's going to blow up. A word he learnt from his mama when she's really angry. Anyway, Izuku doesn't really understand this way of playing but he enjoy it nonetheless. Spending time outside with his data and brother and meet up with many of his friend will always make his day. 
While Izuku is enjoying his day, Hisashi and Tenko felt another headache incoming. Your son is really lovable. A woman next to him chuckled when she saw a bunch of kids fighting to be his son's partner. Hisashi only smiled at her comment and kept his eyes on the curly mop of green hair. It's not hard considering his son has always been in the center of a group. They're proud of course. This just proves that Izuku is adorable and many people love him just as much as they do. But the thing is, Tenko can't handle the constant bickering and fights these children will do just because they wanted to hang around with his brother. Asashi also thought the same thing and groaned inwardly at the thought on how puberty and teenage years would look like. Honestly, he would rather shave his head clean before he can even grow any gray hairs. Both alphas already had enough with the Bakugu's only son, Katsuki, following Izuku for years now. The day the blonde toddler proudly announced that he'll marry Izuku is the day Tenko can felt his dad's heart attack across the room. As alphas, both Tenko and Hisashi will feel more protective towards Omegas and their family. His mom is already mated with his dad, so no one would want to mess with her if they don't have any death wish. Now Izuku is on the other hand, is still young, naive and is already confirmed to be an unpresented Omega. Tenko can barely counts on how many children that kept running behind his brother's ass, giving him chocolates, flowers and things of sort while at the same time. Katsuki will blow up, only to fight the other kids until the older boy managed to break it up. Being the babysitter for both boys, especially Katsuki, gave Tenko more than enough experience on how to deal with feral alpha pup. What a sweet burden his son is. Hisashi smiled tiredly at the thought, stealing up his wool and courage to prepare the coming years of chasing away suitors and puppy crushes away from his son. Okami, please give us mercy. Both father and son utters their prayers. They did not, in fact, get any mercy. Asashi had imagined many, many ways his son might develop his quirk. Maybe he would accidentally burn a furniture like him. Maybe he would attract random objects like his mother. Maybe a combinations of both. Maybe a whole different quirk. Or maybe even quirkless. Whatever quirk, or lack of one. That Izuku will end up with, Hisashi will still loves his son no matter what. Though Hisashi would love to get a warning before he got a heart attack from anything related whatever his son has managed to get himself in. Izuku knew he's four. He knew it's the age for him to receive his quirk. Like Kaken, Izuku has been giddy for a whole month. He tried to breathe out fire like his data but it never worked. Tried to turn things to dust like his brother but failed. Tenko even laughed at Izuku whenever he sees his brother's attempts. He also tried to move small things like his mama but all it did is to give him dry eyes. Mama was really freaked out when she saw him crying on the floor with red eyes. He made sure to himself that he won't do it ever again cause it hurts so bad. After all of the failed experiments, Izuku gave up and decided to just focus on learning to read and write. Many has told the little Omega on how clever he is. So Izuku decided to take a step ahead and learn the things only big kids, like his brother, could. And so more months passed by without any signs of Izuku developing a quirk. Of course, the Midoriya family wasn't in a hurry and just let time takes its flow. Until one day, both the Midoriyas and Bakugas were having a simple dinner. Tenko is out training with a couple of friends he met in school, so he won't be participating with today's dinner. Inko, Masaru and Mitsuki were both entranced in their conversations regarding trends and their kids while Hisashi went outside to check on Izuku for a while. The heavens above knew how much his son can lead troubles one after another. Hisashi swore that his heart almost leapt out from his body the moment he saw his Zuku with the Bakugu son. That damn brat was scenting his son, who's apparently kissed the blonde boy's cheek after he got bruised. Hisashi was furious. How the fuck a random mutt can scent his baby Zuku just like that? Maybe it's the alpha genes. Maybe he's just naturally overprotective. But he managed to yank the brat off from his son before Mitsuki yelled behind him. Apparently, Mitsuki saw the scene where he yanked her son away, but not the moment her son scented his. What the fuck do you think you're doing to my son? Mitsuki would probably rip him to shreds if it weren't for her husband to stop her. Calming pheromone wafting over to pacify the furious blonde woman. Hisashi is not the one to be outdone. Well your son has been hair-raising mine. Inko also stepped in at the right time to alleviate the situation. Both alphas aren't going to back down without a fight. But when Hisashi caught a whiff of his son's distressed pheromone, the raging fire inside him immediately died out. A glance at Mitsuki also proves that she also sensed Izuku's discomfort. It really worked like a charm considering alphas couldn't stand omegas that are feeling uncomfortable in any way. And once they secrete adverse pheromone signals, alphas will do anything in their power to make the omegas feel better. Like right now, where Hisashi saw the blonde mutt comforting his son. It's really naive and childish but considering Izuku began to calm down, whatever the blonde said to his son is working. Maybe the kid wasn't so bad. But then Masaru lets out a gasp when he saw splatters of blood on his son's cheek. He ran towards Katsuki and began to check his body frantically only to find no cuts, bruises nor scars on his son's body. The brown-haired Omega questioned his kid. Katsuki, where did you get cut? Why is there blood on your cheek? 
The boy only blinked and grinned. Zuku healed it. We were playing, and I feel they're also really scary cut on Kaken's cheek uncle. Izuku cuts off. Katsuki gave an eager nod, which is weird considering getting hurt isn't something to be proud of, and said. Then Zuku came and kissed the pain Hisashi growled before Inko smacked her hand on his arm to stop his embarrassing behavior. And the Oi gone like he said. Now that attracts both family together. Inko is the first one to ask Izuku what happened after he kissed the pain away from Katsuki's cheek. The scary cut start to close Mama. It looked really cool how it start to, uh, sitch, itself. Inko chuckled, it stitched ear. Izuku beamed and gave his mother the widest smile his face can muster. Yes, yeah, stitch. Kaken's skin moved by itself Mama. You should see it before, it's really cool. Katsuki's skin began to heal itself after Izuku kissed him. Katsuki's skin began to heal itself after Izuku kissed him. Asashi felt dread but yet pure joy from the thought of his son's quirk. Though Inko's eyes lights up when she also realized Izuku's quirk finally manifested, and a healing one at that. Without a beat, Inko scooped up her son and dragged Hisashi to their car, immediately went straight to the hospital. The Bakugas also follows suit to check on their son's previous cut, just in case. The ride towards the hospital is silent. Izuku kept chattering about the previous accident and the games he played with Kaken. Inko hummed in response while Hisashi is having a crisis, driving his car towards the hospital. At the hospital, Mitsuki stopped Hisashi on his tracks when Inko and Izuku went in for a checkup. Her furrowed brows loosened. Hey sorry for yelling those things before. I got freaked out for a while. You know my son and husband are my priority. Might be a bit more protective on Masaru. But hey, us alphas are more possessive regarding our omegas. Hisashi didn't reply but Mitsuki went on. Anyway, sorry, can't imagine how hard it is to have an Omega son as endearing as Izuku. That earned a chuckle from both alphas, the tension between them vanished subtly. And I know it's going to be a handful once puberty hits Hisashi. Better keep that tough father attitude before your kid runs off with another alpha when you're not looking. Mitsuki lets out a breathy chuckle. She seemed to be amused with the thought of Hisashi chasing Izuku while he tries to run to the sunset with the first crush he has. Hisashi smiled at that. He has anticipated everything and is pretty confident to chase away any pesky kids that disturb his son. Yeah. I also apologize for grabbing your son like that. I was too shocked at the time. So yeah. Hisashi offers his hand for a handshake. Truce. The blonde woman grinned. Truce. Her eyes. Full of affections, seemed to dart between her husband and son behind Hisashi before she focuses her gaze to him once again. I'll also teach my brat to stop harassing your pup. Might save you from another fright like that. How does that sound? The man sighed with a tired smile. That sounds great Mitsuki. Thanks. No problem. She replied before she heads towards her family and Hisashi heads towards his. The day Izuku's quirk got officially registered, the whole family celebrated. Tenko came back from his trip only to miss the whole protective mode his dad did at the dinner. The boy kept laughing and teasing his dad about it. He might never live that down for years to come. Then hearing the news that Izuku's quirk manifested to be the same as his grandma, Tenko is ecstatic. His brother not only developed a quirk, but a healing no less. The whole family, plus Chiyo had a pleasant dinner together. Chiyo even brought Izuku along as her apprentice to better learn and manage his quirk. After dinner, the boys are busy playing video games together, while the adults started to discuss further plans regarding the green-haired Omega. It's not a bad thing to develop a healing quirk, really. The only problem is that Izuku's quirk is akin to panacea. After multiple blood tests, examinations, and checkups, Izuku's quirk worked similarly like Chiyo, activated with a kiss from the lips without the stretching part. So Izuku needs to get his face close towards the wounded area in order to heal. Tests also proves that Izuku doesn't only heal using his kiss, but any type of liquid he can secrete can also become a healing property, such as tears, saliva, sweat, and even blood. Though the first three isn't as potent as a kiss, but they also consume less drawbacks when Izuku uses it. Not only minor bruises and cuts, doctors and researchers has confirmed that Izuku's quirk has the potential to evolve into something that they would consider as a miracle. If the boy trained his quirk and is clever to avoid drawbacks, he eventually can heal more severe injuries, like deeper cuts, broken bones, even missing organs and amputated limbs once he's strong enough. Though there's a possibility they're too afraid to confirm, considering on how outlandish and insane it is, that the boy might be able to turn a stagnant heart back beating. Now the only thing Izuku has to worry is dehydration. Since his quirk not only uses kisses but secreting liquids, the boy would be prone to issues of lacking water in the near future. So the Midoriya's got the heads up to stock more water in their household. And for some reason, the upper echelon has gotten the gist of Izuku's quirk. The fact he's also an unpresented Omega has also made the boy became a living treasure that Hero Commission will pay high price for. Asashi is no fool. He knew what would happen if he handed his son over to HPSC for training. Asashi has lived at the top for years. 
He knew the skeletons HPSC has been hiding inside their closet. Many times, HPSC has tried to rope his youngest son to become the next up-and-coming hero healer, regardless of Izuku's wishes and Hisashi is sick of it. He can also see on how frustrated Chio is every time HPSC official would come and bombard her with their series of training promotions. This happened quite a lot until Inko brought it up at dinner one day. It's a simple family dinner. Inko is scooping up the soup for Izuku to eat while Tenko placed the fish millet on his brother's plate. The light blue-haired boy chattered about his day at school, which apparently he met a really cool-looking red-haired boy called Taoya, who's three years older than him. Inko hummed and laughed whenever Tenko did those exaggerated body movements to describe how bright this boy's fire quirk is, how big he can make the fire blow and the length on how long his fire can keep burning. The glee in Tenko's eyes whenever he casually mentioned how he and this Taoya boy burnt trashes in their schoolyard gave Hisashi another headache that's not related to Izuku for once. Hisashi sighed. Tenko, you can't burn things without any proper safety measures. You should say that to your friend too. The Alpha is currently rethinking on his decision to let Tenko skip a whole three years school period because of his intelligence. Should have let him stay in elementary school a bit longer. He huffed. Inko, still feeding Izuku while the greenette is mesmerized by his brother's storytelling chuckled when she saw her husband's exasperated face. She gave a consoling smile. Knowing how much of a troublemaker teenage kids can do, don't worry too much about it dear. She turned her attention to her eldest son, Tenko, you didn't harm yourself and others right. In which he gave a strong shake of his head before he shouted, no. His voice echoed in the dining room, which attracted the passing maids and butlers. Tenko's cheeks flushed at the attention and lowers his voice, I won't hurt anyone mom. Inko glanced back at her husband, a knowing glint in her eyes since she knew Hisashi won't fight her once she resolved the situation herself. The Alpha saw that eyes. Kami knows that he's so in love with his wife, but he can't even utter any counter-argument against her and she knew it. Hisashi gave in and told Tenko to stay safe. Don't kill anyone. Don't commit any arson and if he managed to do one or both of those, wait until his grandma got the gist of it to get himself a good smack on his bum. Hisashi's old heart can only stand Izuku's problems at present and future. While they were happily chatting and Izuku arranging the stack of broccoli on his plate, Inko remembered something that slipped from her mind, dear. Hisashi's attention drawn to his wife, raising his brow, HM. What's wrong? Did HPSC official has come to you regarding Zuku's training? Now even Tenko and Izuku's attention focused on their mother. Hearing the mentions of HPSC, Hisashi frowned. His brows furrowed at the unpleasant memories Chio also told him about before. The Alpha has already expected it, really. He knew how rare a healing quirk is and he also got the gist of whatever HPSC project is doing. Although he doesn't drabble in heroic industry. Knowing on what HPSC is working on has brought a sense of disgust at the pit of his stomach. Imagining on what his son might face is already enough for the man to riot against the commission himself. He doesn't elaborate, but calm his wife's anxieties on whether Izuku has to go through the so-called training. He gave his most comforting smile, don't worry dear, I'll handle it. And true to his words, no HPSC official has come and disturbed them again. Inko doesn't know what her husband did but she's grateful that she won't get separated from her baby son. Mr. M. Idoria, we understand your concerns regarding our training plans for young Izuku. A man at the end of the desk argued, but healers has been a scarce asset that we need to hone and cultivate more. Heroics are dangerous as you can see. There's more heroes out there than healers, so if young Izuku entered the field, many casualty can be avoided. Hisashi's dark eyes gazed at the man in front of him, so my son is an asset. Voice low, making the listener shudder as if his tongue laced with poison. Sensing the danger, the man composed himself, a smile stretched at his wrinkled face. That's not what I meant Mr. Midoriya. I apologize for my poor choice of words. He took a shuddering breath when Hisashi's warning pheromone leaked, suffocating him. We hopes to nurture a talent like your son. There's many dangers when it comes to healers. We HPSC mainly wanted to protect such talents. Hisashi retracted his pheromone when he saw the president's shaking body. Eyes pierced back at the man. He spoke, It's really great that the commission has their attention at my son. I presume the training is similar to. Ah, Takami Kago is it? A pregnant pause. Hisashi can sense the other man stiffen. But he couldn't care less and continued, such a charming young boy he is, I believe he'll be an amazing hero once he hits of age, Mr. President must have high hopes for him right. It's a trap. The President knew it. He knew the Alpha in front of him will be giving his ultimatum. Gritting his teeth, hate and rage bubbling inside his chest. The fact that he, as HPSC President, can't retaliate to this M. Idoria Hasashi will always be one of his shameful moments. He regretted ever messing with the man named M. Idoria Hasashi. Hisashi stood up, preparing to leave this revolting place not before dropping his last sentence. I won't drag this matter further. And before I go, Mr. President, maybe you'll need to check your group of heroes. 
You might want your pretty little assassin to handle it. Karma will come around Mr. President. Have a good day. And with that Hasashi left. Not even a month passed. Hasashi saw the news regarding HPSC change of president. He smiled, scrolling away and continued to take a sip from his cup of coffee. Now Izuku is five, turning six in a few months. He finally understands the use of his quirk and all of the possibilities that he can do. Right now, Grandma Chio told him they're going to the park like usual. Both of them sat inside Dada's car until they reached their destination. On the way, Grandma Chio has been pointing at the things outside their car so Izuku can explain what they are. The boy replied with giddiness every time he saw lots of stuff he doesn't usually see. The boy piped, that's a candy store grandma. You never go to candy store before. Izuku asked with genuine concern, seeing her grandson's eyes widen. With his chubby freckled cheeks puffed up into a frown, Shio tried to hold the chuckle at the back of her throat in feign confusion. Ah, grandma's memory must be getting bad. Now Kanzuku explained to grandma what's inside a candy store. She also furrowed her brows with a hum for dramatic effects. It seems like the boy took his grandma's question as a personal offense. He began to list all of the candies he, his mama and his brother usually bought to, dot 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 and in this mall, there's a really big candy store. His short arms stretched wide to visualize the size of such store. Shio smiled while at the same time, she can hear the driver's amused laughter at the front. Izuku began to ramble on the places he went to and asked his grandma whether she knew those places or not each time he mentioned something new. If Chio answered that she knew, Izuku would move on with his story. But if Chio said she doesn't, Izuku will stop and explain those places until he'll get sidetracked and change to a new topic. Along the journey, Chio is entertained seeing her grandson's energetic appearance. Once they entered UA, Chio hugged Izuku to get out from the car. Chio wanted to surprise her grandson that they'll be going to UA today, and Izuku can follow her along her work, with Nezu's permission of course. But once they went inside, Izuku tugged his grandma's hand and asked, Grandma, this is not the way to the park. He gave a wary glance towards the huge hallways. Shio was stunned for a moment, but later she chuckled at her grandson's cautious behavior. Zuku, we're not going to the park today. She explained patiently. Shio almost died from the huge cute crit attack when her grandson's wide puppy dog eyes stares at her. We're not. His voice soft with disbelief. But who's going to remind brother to do his homework? We're not. We're at you right now. She held Izuku's small hands and slowly tugged her grandson who's in tow. Mama will remind your brother to do his homework, don't worry. She gave her most comforting smile. Before, Tenko would usually procrastinate whenever he's doing anything school-related. The boy is smart, but Asashi wanted to teach him the importance of diligence and time management. Though none of his advice, warning, even threats of taking away his video games worked. Then he saw how Izuku told, more like command, Tenko to do his homework before playing together, and it worked. More and more time passed, Hisashi's observation came to fruitful ending. Whenever Izuku goes left, Tenko will never go right. Whenever Izuku goes south, Tenko will never go west. The older boy might not even realize on how his brother got his heart wrapped around his little fingers. Though, the rest of them aren't any better. It was enlightening. The family realized this new power Izuku has. The next thing they know, they began to bribe Izuku to give orders to other family members whenever they want something. Tenko would bribe Izuku by letting him play with his hero toys if Izuku asked mom or dad for the new video game. Worked every single time. Inko would bribe Izuku with stuffed dolls, mostly rabbits, when she wants Izuku to accompany her for shopping. Sometimes, she even told Izuku to ask Auntie Mitsuki and the blonde alpha will never refuse. Asashi on the other hand, tried to bribe Izuku with sweets at first, but then Chio smacked his head with her cane when she founds out about it. The boy shouldn't be eating too many sweets at a young age. So Hisashi changed his tactics and uses what he has best, money, to tell his brother to do his homework before playing. So far nobody ever realized on how much bank the young Omega has made by just asking his brother to do his homework. Right now, Chio placed Izuku on a vacant infirmary bed and gave him a notebook with a pencil for him to pass the time. The woman knew how much her grandson enjoys heroes and quirks, so she thought bringing her grandson to a place abundant with both will be a great idea. It is. Izuku kept glancing and staring at the passing students outside the infirmary. His small woes and ahs are never missed from Chiyo's ears. She's glad Izuku is enjoying his time at Yua with her. Truthfully, the reason why she brought Izuku to Yua is because of Tenko. Apparently, that Taoya boy Tenko has been playing with has been proclaimed to be dead. Shio still remembered on how Tenko's loud sobbing while he thrashes and disintegrate every piece of furniture in the living room due to his quirk getting out of control because of his extreme emotion. Inko is the one who stepped in and grabbed both of her eldest son's arms before he can hurt himself. 
Both mother and son were sobbing in a pile of ashes while Hisashi contacted several people regarding this news. Chiyo knows on how sharp her son-in-law's intuition is. Once he felt something was off, there's a high chance that it is. She doesn't know the reason for Hisashi's suspicion, but she could empathize with Tenko regarding the loss of a friend. She knew her boy doesn't deserve on whatever fate has thrown at him. From the grief of losing his biological family, the pain he went through all alone and now his closest friend is gone from quirk overuse. Midoriya Tenko really deserves better. Now, Inko and Hisashi has been accompanying their eldest son to mourn for his friend. Shio knows on how bad her boy needs a healthy way to cope from grief. Thankfully, Inko and Hisashi is there to help him. Izuku on the other hand, is still too young to understand his brother's extreme emotions. As a young alpha, Tenko will have times where pheromones would slip out under stress or extreme emotions like before. Although young pups pheromone won't affect the adults. But Izuku, who's still a baby, will suffer from it. The Midoriya estate is now covered with a heavy bitter pheromone that shows the owner's sorrow. Hisashi has already called their housekeeper to air out the excess pheromone so by the time Chiyo and Izuku comes home, their house won't smell like a blizzard after it got mixed with burnt sandalwoods. Those pheromone scent is saying something when Tenko's scent is supposed to be petrature, calming, fresh, distinctive scent that make one relaxed when they sniff it. Chiyo sighed. This is going to be a long day. Her stupor is broken when Izuku ran to her with a notebook filled with drawings and scrawly handwriting next to it. On the first drawing, Izuku seems like he tried to mimic a passing student's features, and next to it is filled with his observations. Oh, what is this Suku? Chiyo asked. She grabbed her grandson from his sides and hauled him up so he can sit on her right thigh. Izuku showed the first page and using his finger, he points to the places he thought interesting. Indeed this one is Suo Cool Grandma. Her hair is floaty and, and it turned colors. He flipped to another page that held another drawing of the same girl but different hair color this time, like this. I wonder if she can turn her hair to like Mama's pretty dress. He mutters. Oh, the flower one. Uh-huh, the one with white, blue and green flower. Mama looks so pretty when she wears it. Shio heart melts at the earnest compliment Izuku said. If Inko is here right now, she would probably be bawling her eyes out from her son's compliment. Shio pinched Izuku's cheeks, earning a confused gaze from the greenette. What's wrong grandma? She sighed. Don't be too cute boy. There'll be bad guys who will eat you up. The response she got was a terrified gasp. While Chiyo laughed, the day passed faster, maybe with her grandson to keep her entertained. Chiyo doesn't feel as bored as she used to. Gosh, she'll miss having her grandson to accompany her in the future. Some students who went for healing also noticed the tuft of curly green hair. They began to coo and crowd Izuku, seeing how adorable the boy is. Izuku seemed like he's used to the attention. He smiles, eyes twinkle whenever there's a new student incoming. Shio gave him a task to guide the wounded students on a vacant infirmary bed. Izuku had asked her once, Grandma, why do they look so sad? On the young face held some kind of innocent sympathy. Shio raised her brows. She knew kids as young as Izuku will have a lot of questions, especially since his quirk will deal with a fair amount of those sad people. Chiyo will need to teach her grandson on how to properly deal with it. They're sad because they're hurt, dear. After grandma helps them kiss away the pain, they'll feel better in no time. She patted the green curls. Now can Izuku help grandma to lead these students to the infirmary beds? Izuku hummed at his grandma's explanation, and he nodded at the task his grandma gave him. The infirmary door opened and a swarm of hero students came in. Izuku, whose shoulder is burdened with a task, is going to do his best. He ran with his short legs to the first person he sees, a tall boy with an injured right arm and bruises on his face. The hero student is surprised to find a toddler at Yue, but he remembered about the rumor of recovery girl's grandson at Yue today. The boy must be her grandson, he thought, before he managed to smile. The green-haired kid held his hand and dragged him to a vacant infirmary bed. Seeing the serious expression on such cute face made the boy melt. He began to lay down and glance back at the kid, hoping he did right. Apparently, he did. The kid gave a satisfied nod at him. He thought it would be the end of it but he felt a small palm patted his hair. Don't worry. Grandma will help you, so don't be sad no more brother. He's dead. Nope, no one can deny him on this. He's dead and he won't revive after hearing such milky voice from recovery girl's grandson. The kid patted his hair too. If this is bliss, the boy might not want to wake up from it. His friends who still standing on the doorway also saw this exchange between him and the kid. He can see from the corner of his eyes her face etched with jealousy. Before he even became smug, his friend let out a dramatic gasp. Oh no. She let her body went limp, resting near the door before she saw the pup ran to her. She smirked before continuing with her drama, I think I can't stand. Add a sniffle and perfect. Izuku ran to the girl. She has a wavy blue hair. Maybe her quirk is related to water. Anyway, he held the girl's arm when he saw her face contorted in pain. Are you okay sister? Do you need Zuku to help? The girl, as if she found a jackpot, nodded vigorously. 
180 degrees from her weak act before. Izuku then kissed the girl's forehead before he let out a satisfied hum when he saw some cuts heal itself on the girl's arms and cheek. Shio who still attending another student saw this scene. She knew how mischievous teenager can be, so when she saw the girl's drama queen act, she almost laughed from anger. Then Izuku kissed the girl to heal the wound and Chio is ready to grab her cane and shoo the girl away, considering she's already healed and all. The girl knew she messed up, lets out a chuckle before running out from the infirmary room, saving herself from recovery girl's deadly cane attack. Even after she ran out, echoes of laughter can be heard across the hallway. Izuku, who didn't know he had been tricked, beamed up at his grandmother, Grandma Look. Zuku kissed the pain away like Mama said. Shio doesn't want to break it to her grandson that the girl wasn't even injured, maybe cuts here and there, but that's common occurrence in heroics. She just smiled and patted his head. Great job Zuku, now just let Grandma handle this okay. From there on, Izuku became a darling amongst hero students. Nezu however, cackled at the heartthrob effect Chio's grandson has. The boy will be an interesting addition if he ever decided to enroll in you in the future. Hello. At the end of her shift, Chio got a phone call from her daughter. Hello mom, can you send Zuku to the Bakugas for today? Tell him that he'll stay over for a while in there. Her voice laced with worry, Inko. What happened? A pause at the other end. I can't really explain the mess from the phone, but can you come here mom? We kinda need help from you. Everything is fine don't worry. Chio breathed a sigh of relief. Alright, I'll drop Izuku off. Is it something about Tenko? She has a premonition in her heart. Another pause before Inko replied. Not really about Tenko, but it's related. Hisashi is already on it don't worry. Also, I already told Mitsuki and Masaru about Izuku's overnight stay, so you don't need to ask them again. Alright, well, okay. Just make sure to tell me after I arrive. Chiyo sighed. She can hear Inko's tired laugh at the other line. I will mom, thanks. And the call was hung up. Izuku was in the brink of sleep when he got inside the car after tiring day with his grandma. He doesn't realize that helping people would be this exhausting but the boy is proud nonetheless. Guiding people to their beds so they won't get lost or comforting them like grandma said also brings a smile to the small, freckled face. Though for some reason, when Izuku heard that he's going to have a sleepover at Kaken's house, his body is filled with more energy than he was before arriving at Yua when he saw Kaken's home. Izuku can't wait to immediately get off the car and hug his friend. From the looks of it, Kaken also couldn't wait playing with him too, since he's already standing at the front door with Auntie Mitsuki. Kaken, the greenette tried to ran off after the car got parked. Shio only shook her head with a smile seeing how energetic her grandson is. She stopped Izuku at his tracks and gave him series of instructions. Be polite, okay. You'll stay at Bakugu's house for a day or more, so grandma expect you to be in your best behavior, okay. Izuku gave a frantic nod then asked. Can I go to Kaken now grandma? Shio then gave a nod. Like a flash, the tuft of green curls disappeared from her vision, running up to the blonde kid standing at the front door. Chiyo doesn't stop Izuku but she also went to Mitsuki to explain some things before heading up to the Midoriya estate. Mitsuki ushers the two boys in and prepares a simple homemade dinner. Come on, you kids can play after you ate. She placed the last bowl of rice in front of Izuku, which he began to gobble without anything added. Mitsuki raised her eyebrow and lets out a chuckle. Izu, dear, you also need to eat the soup too you know, you can't just eat the rice only. Oh, he began to chug the whole bowl of warm soup while Katsuki tried to speed eat everything he saw. Mitsuki had just sat down before she saw this whole thing went down. She genuinely wanted to record these boys' eating behavior as if they just survived famine and send it to Inko for a good laugh. Sadly, Masaru is having overtime at work today so she can't joke about her brand stupidity today. Oh well, Izuku is staying for a few days. Might as well collect some blackmail material for his son's future wedding. She knew she really shouldn't pair kids up together but then again, seeing how starstruck her son is whenever he saw Inko's pup has made her consider on preparing their wedding venue and all. Though this is a fun mostly on their parents' side, so they're not going to take it too seriously anyway. Seeing the two pups' eager eyes to dash of and play, Mitsuki chuckled and let them be, focusing on her own food aunt texting Masaru while she's at it. After they ate, Kaken dragged Izuku's hand upstairs to his room. Although Izuku would meet Kaken weekly, but he will always miss his friend considering Izuku is homeschooled and all, so Kaken is his first and closest friend he currently has. When Kaken dragged Izuku in, he began to show all of his hero merch collection to the green-haired boy, in which Izuku's eyes began to glow at the sight. All Might Limited Edition Merch Izuku couldn't help his exited jitter and asked Kaken, Kaken, can I play with your toys? Please, please, please. Who could resist Izuku's wide pleading eyes? Not Katsuki, no sir. Blush began to creep at the base of his neck and towards his cheeks when he saw how close they're standing together. Katsuki doesn't really understand why he felt nervous around Izuku but the boy always made him happy and content whenever he's around so Katsuki couldn't help to get closer with Izuku than his school friend. 
Sure, the blonde huffed, crossing his arm around his chest. Katsuki gave a proud hum to the fact that Izuku likes his toys. If anyone else asks you to play with their toys, don't believe them, my toys are better, he declared. Izuku seeing his friend's confident gesture cheered out loud. Yeah, Kakin is the best. And cue the butterflies in Katsuki's stomach. He coughs to cover his tomato red cheeks and began to give Izuku his most precious toys for him to play with. Here, you can play with this, and I'll use other toys. After an excited nod from Izuku, both boys laid flat on the floor, playing something about heroes and villains. Izuku is the villain while Kakin is playing as the hero. Izuku can't help but stare in awe how heroic his friend is whenever he saves his plush bunny hostage and defeats the villain goons, using Kakin other figurine toys. Time passes so fast when you're having fun. That also applies to both Izuku and Kakin. While they were playing, Auntie Mitsuki knocked on their bedroom door and told them it's time for bed. They replied with okay, and hurried off to the bathroom, to brush their teeth and change into pajamas. After everything is set and done, both of them laid on Kakin's bed side by side, since his friend's bed is wide enough to have both of them sleep together. Even though it's bedtime but Izuku still has excess energy from all of that playing. He also saw his friend's eyes wide awake and started a conversation to pass the time. Kakin, HM, Kakin's voice isn't as loud as it was when they're playing before. What is your school feels like? Izuku turned sideways to meet his friend's face. He saw how Kakin hummed at his question and think hard. It's okay, Kakin answered, you don't go to school. Izuku wanted to shake his head but then he realized he's laying sideways so he answered, no, Dada said it's dangerous. Why? Cause I have healing quirk and all, Dada said that. Kakin seemed to be pondering at his answer, your quirk is dangerous. Why? No, Dada meant that people will do bad things to me if I'm not careful. Izuku's voice wavered. He didn't know why bad guys is after him so he'll have to stay home school. Kakin gave a huff, that's stupid. Now Izuku is confused on Kakin's answer. He never heard anyone refuting his Dada after all, why? Because as long as I'm here, no one can hurt you. Kakin stated proudly. He also pumped his fist to the air with a shout. If anyone wants to hurt you, I'm going to give them these explosions. Though Izuku managed to stop Kakin from using his quirk. But he smiled on how caring his friend is. Yeah, Kakin is the best. As he said for a thousand times. Both of them fell into silence again before the blonde quips, wanna do prank calls. In which Izuku answered with wide eyes full of shock. Rying 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 Toshi can you take the call real quick. At another town, a man nudged his purple-haired son to the phone on the coffee table. He's still too preoccupied with his work dealing with paperwork for the night. Itoshi stood up and grabbed the ringing phone at the coffee table. As far as he knew, Dad would never have other contacts other than Pops, him and his colleagues, and each of them have a specific ringtone. That means this call is from a stranger. Hello, he answered. There's a brief silence before Hitoshi can hear muffled laughter at the other end. His brows furrowed when nobody answered. Kaken, are you sure this is okay? Hitoshi can hear a soft whisper from a boy. This Kaken said with a louder voice, it's gonna be fine, the hag doesn't use her phone that much anyway. In which Hitoshi can also picked up someone getting slapped in a soft o, presumably from this Kaken guy, what was that for? You can't talk about your mother like that Kaken. It seemed the other boy's anger managed to quell Kaken's anger from the soft mutter of okay and I'll be more polite, even though Hitoshi is amused with this conversation. He also needed to know on who do prank calls at night, and managed to get his dad's number by the way, hey, I'm still here. Oh Kaken. Answer him. The first boy urged. Sorry, we're busy. Kakin answered and hang up. That was weird, Hitoshi thought. He placed the phone back on the table and sat next to his busy dad on the couch. His dad didn't glance towards him but asked, who called? Hitoshi shrugged even though he knew his dad wouldn't see it. I dunno, prank calls. After that, his dad stopped his work and turns his head towards him, prank. Calls. Hitoshi gave a confused glance. Yeah, that's what I just said. Well damn, nobody should be able to contact my phone, he mutters. Toshi, get me my phone. Hitoshi groaned. He really hates it when his dad is being lazy and he has to do the rest while the old man could do it himself. But Nuo, his body is too heavy for him to get up and take two steps towards the coffee table, which also is in his arm's reach. But like any good son he is, he get back up again and handed the phone to his dad. He'll just report this to his pops and watch how he'll enact his revenge in the future. While Hitoshi is preoccupied with his revenge plan, Shouta took the phone and checked the security settings inside. Ah, he finally found the problem. This phone hasn't used Nezu's protection software. Any phone can be contacted if you have the correct numbers but if Shouta uses Nezu's pre-made security software, it's proven that only series of people can contact him since his phone became inaccessible to the outside world to contact, use or hack without his permission. A really wonderful tool for a small price of having his data and search history getting tracked by Nezu himself. 
It seems that Shouda has to consider that teaching position because he knew Nezu wouldn't let him scoot free being just an underground hero. But as a teacher at Ua2 after he resigned himself using this damned software. After the small incident, both father and son forgot about it and continued with their sleepless night. Izuku on the other hand, is laughing on how stupid the conversation was. I can't believe you said that. Kakin also laughed and placed his mother phone back to her purse in the living room. Both boys tiptoed back to Kakin's bedroom and gently closes the door so they won't awaken Auntie Mitsuki or Uncle Masaru. Izuku climbed up Kakin's bed and crawled inside while Kakin laid on the other side. They're still giggling and whispering about their successful attempt of doing prank call, even if they only managed to call one person after their dozens of tries. Both of them are still satisfied anyway. This is a reason why he likes playing with Kakin. His brother is fun too, but brother also has friend other than him, especially the boy named Taoya, so Izuku doesn't want to interrupt. Besides if Izuku told brother to do things like this, all he got will be a scolding and more lectures on why he shouldn't do it. He does feel guilty though. He felt bad for interrupting whoever was on the other line and promises to himself to never do it again. Once is enough, the boy thought. Zuku. Izuku can hear Kakin calling him. Yeah, what do you want to do tomorrow? Izuku began to think hard. He really doesn't know what to do since he passed the time playing with his toys or drawing on the papers his mama bought him. Wanna go to the park? He finally asked. Izuku rarely went out after his quirk manifested so imagining the park full of people. Ice cream trucks and stores he can go to with Kakin sounds like a great plan. Kakin also thought the same too when he nodded with the same excitement. After another round of chatting, the boys finally felt tired enough and went to sleep. Tomorrow is going to be a great day. What are we going to do now? At the Midoriya estate, Inko whispered to her husband. Both of them are standing outside the infirmary room Hisashi had for whenever there any of their family member got into an accident and unable to reach the hospital. The infirmary is already well stocked with basic medical equipment, so any quirk accident can be tended before it worsens. Right now, the couple are staring inside, watching their son, Tenko, who's sitting next to the infirmary bed with a resigned expression on his face. On the bed, lay a child older than their son, his face and whole body is covered with bandages, while Chiyo is tending the burn wound on the other side. Hisashi knew something was off regarding this Taoya boy. He heard and memorized whenever Tenko told him about his adventures with his friend. The fact Tenko often described Taoya with full of bruises or wrapped in bandages has made Hisashi concerned regarding the friend his son has made with. Truthfully, Hisashi wouldn't pay too much attention to this. As long as son is happy with his friend and stays out of trouble, Hisashi will let one of his eyes close to whatever kind of person Tenko made with. It can also be a learning lesson for his eldest son if one day this Taoya boy did him wrong in the future. Hisashi has met the boy once when Tenko invited him for dinner. To put it lightly, Hisashi isn't pleased with Taoya. A boy with such extreme beliefs and ideals isn't going to be a perfect fit to be Tenko's friend. But his personality isn't a problem. Taoya's family is. With how messed up the whole drama inside the Todoroki household, Hisashi began to worry that this problem would affect Tenko in the near future. Either Taoya cuts off contact with his son, or he will do it himself. Though Hisashi did not expect this, the older alpha wouldn't give two shits regarding the messed up Todoroki family but if one of the kid is related to his son's happiness, then he has some job to do. He patted his wife's shoulder as a comfort, I'll take care of this dear. Then he went upstairs headed towards his study. The next day is weekend. Izuku and Katsuki is allowed to play in the park for the whole day. Both boys were so excited for their adventure for the day. With Izuku packing his notebooks, pencils, and coloring pencils inside Katsuki's yellow All Might backpack, Auntie Mitsuki was supposed to accompany them at the park, but she got a call about work emergency or something that Izuku doesn't understand, so she handed her phone to Izuku and a bunch of money to Kakin. Here is some money, buy yourself some treat, okay. She mostly reminded Izuku, but her eyes also darts to Kakin a few times. Masaru will pick you kids up later at noon, but if you want to go home earlier, you can just call, got it. The moment both boys nodded, Mitsuki waves her hand and bid them goodbye. Kakin cheered after his mom left. Zuku, what do you want to do first? He stared at Izuku with eager eyes. Ma gave us bunch of money. Look at this. Izuku took a look at the stack of money on Kakin's hand. It seems that Auntie Mitsuki accidentally gave them way too much money for them to spend. He glances back to Kakin with a worried frown. Kakin, can we really use these much money? What if Auntie needs them later? Izuku doesn't really understand the concept of money. All he knows is that he shouldn't use too much every time Dada gives him allowance. Though, Kakin doesn't seem to think the same as him, PSH. That hag, ouch, okay, Ma, bought more expensive stuff anyway. Kakin patted his left shoulder where Izuku smacked him, with a hiss, could have hit me lighter, Zoo. Izuku huffed. Well you should be more polite. Emerald eyes scanned around the park, until he spotted an ice cream shop not far away. Kakin. Kakin, look. Ice cream. 
He held Kakan's arm and shook it with frenzy. Kakan's attention also followed Izuku's line of sight, where he also found the said shop. Oh yeah, he turned his gaze back to Izuku. Calm down nerd, it's just ice cream. His voice sounds amused. Izuku rolled his eyes, imitating his brother whenever he's annoyed and crossed his arms in front of his chest, again, like his brother, well, I want you to accompany me, then pouted out of habit. Katsuki, who saw the small pout combined with Zuku's wide green eyes, relented. He naturally took Izuku's small palm into his and walked in front to the ice cream shop with Izuku in tow. Katsuki has walked carefully since he knew how fast his pace is compared to Zuku's, but for some reason, the nerd has managed to stumble. Katsuki was horrified when he felt Zuku's body arching forward, so in hurry, he went in front of his friend and shielded the fall. With a loud thud, both boys fell to the soft grass, with Izuku fell on Katsuki's chest and Katsuki at the bottom, ouch. Katsuki tried to sat up while he carefully held Zuku's body and placed him on his lap. You okay Zuku? Izuku groaned and sat up after he rubbed his head in pain, sorry Kaken. His voice muffled from leaning against Katsuki's chest. While Katsuki tried to take a sharp breath in to disperse the blush on his cheek, Izuku stood up and patted his pants and shoes, Thanks Kaken, I could never walk without tripping if you're not with me. He gave a soft giggle. Izuku might not realize, but Katsuki can smell the faint minty cinnamon pheromone Izuku accidentally emit. Maybe because he was shocked before so he unconsciously emit his pheromone but right now, the blush on Katsuki's cheek didn't dissipate. Instead it spreads more fervently towards his ears and neck. Even his palms got sweaty from the touch before. Katsuki turned his head around to avoid seeing Izuku's eyes, maybe because of nervousness but he can't focus on his friend without crackle and pops of explosion to appear on his hand. Shut up, nerd. His voice isn't as gruff as he wanted to. Maybe if you stay with me you wouldn't get fall so much. His tone got lower and lower as he spoke. Hurry up Kaken. The ice cream might be gone when we arrive. Katsuki turned his head back to Izuku only to find his friend's attention on the shop across the street. The blonde huffed and stood up, rubbing his sweaty palm on his pants. Katsuki took Izuku's hand again and lead the way, much slower this time. Izuku hummed a tune he doesn't know but suddenly cuts off. Oh yeah, what did you say before Kaken? I'm sorry, I didn't hear you. Izuku asked in a soft murmur. Katsuki denied ever saying anything but deep down he's embarrassed to ever remembering the words he just said. After they arrived on the ice cream shop, Izuku went to find a seat for the both of them, while Katsuki orders their favorites, it would take a while with a long line in front of him. Kaken has surprised Izuku with how patient his friend can be at certain things sometimes, but he understands if Kaken is willing to wait for ice cream. Izuku, too, will do anything for his desserts. It wasn't really crowded in the shop, but Izuku saw a group of people huddled together while watching the TV that's mounted on the wall. The boy also got curious and followed to watch. Izuku watched for a while but he's not really interested regarding the topic. He then continued to walk and search for the perfect seat for him and Kaken. Izuku found a seat at far corner and he took out the phone Auntie Mitsuki gave him. He doesn't know on how much money they can use but to make sure, he wanted to confirm with either Auntie Mitsuki or Uncle Masaru. Not knowing which number he should call, Izuku pressed the top one in the call history. Even though Data gave him a phone before, but Izuku only used it to play hero games or to do his homework with Mama's help, so using the call function is a new experience for him. Ring 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 it took a while before the call is connected. Hello, Auntie Mitsuki. It's me Izuku. I just want to know how much money we can use, is it okay to buy ice cream? Me and Kaken is buying one right now, but if, whoa, hey calm down. That's not Auntie Mitsuki. Izuku stared back at the call, which shows a bunch of number that he doesn't understand, then back with the call with a confused frown, um, hi, who is this? There's a faint background noises on the other side, yeah I should be the one asking that, you're the one who prank called me before, right? Oh, shoot, no, Izuku tried to convince the other person. He held Auntie's phone with both hands, afraid to let it fall, I'm sorry to prank call you yesterday sir. Sir, do I sound old to you? Well, you sound scary, the greenette replied before he realized it was rude, um, sorry. Did we interrupt you yesterday? I'm really sorry if we did. Calm down. And no. I was just watching some cartoons, so it's fine. Izuku sighed in relief, but then he became interested. What cartoon are you watching? My favorite is All Might, the forthcoming. It's really good. He expressed with giddiness. The person on the other line seems to be thinking before he answered. Um, mine is the new release cartoon about wild wild pussycats. Not really a fan of All Might. Izuku gasped but he managed to place his palm on his mouth to contain his shock. Someone doesn't like All Might. Though, his shock fade away when the other boy mentioned the new cartoon. Oh yeah. I also saw that one too and I really like it. Mama said that I can buy their merch when it got released. You like it too. His previously calm voice now held a bit of enthusiasm by how fast he questioned Izuku. 
After that, their conversation has never been smoother. As if a dam has broken, Izuku and the other boy kept on rambling about their favorite movie. Then the topic changes to their favorite hero. Then their hobbies and soon, they exchange their names. I'm Midoriya Izuku. The greenette beamed. Yeah I remember when you said it at first, I'm Hitoshi Shinzo. Izuku muttered the name, Hitoshi Shinzo, and nodded to himself. Amen. It's really nice to know you Hitchin. Hitchin. Oh, okay. Hitchin mumbled the last part. Uh, do you want to call again like this? Izuku can sense Hitchin's nervousness and immediately agrees. Yeah, it's really fun talking with you. Kakan only likes All Might and he doesn't know other heroes as well as you. Letting out a giggle, Izuku continued, I have a phone Dada gave me, we can exchange numbers. Your dad allows you to have a phone. Yeah, why? Your dada don't. Hitchin hummed, he said I'm still too young. How did you convince your dad to have one? I asked him, oh, can't do that with mine. Hitchin replied with a frustrated groan. Izuku also realized the issue of no phone to communicate with. He was dazed in his own thought about helping Hitchin to buy a phone until Kakin came back with two of their favorite ice cream. Green eyes brightened at the sight of his favorite strawberry flavor, so he placed the phone on the table and began to scoop his ice cream. Kakin realized the call on his mother's phone and asked, Hey nerd, who are you calling? He sat down and licked his chocolate ice cream. The greenette paused on his dessert and focused back on Hitchin. Oh yeah, I accidentally called Hitchin and now we're trying to find a way to call with each other. Just exchange your phone numbers, duh. Kakin rolled his eyes. Yeah that's the problem, I don't have a phone. Hitchin interrupts. Izuku also nodded to backs up his claims. Yeah and Hitchin is really smart. We talked about the new cartoon I told you yesterday. It's about wild wild pussycats and mama said, All right I got it Zoo. Kakin cuts him off, still remembers the one with cats, they're all cats. Izuku complains. And how cool their quirks are, Kakin continues. But if he don't have any phone, how is he calling you right now? Kakin pointed at his mom's phone. I'm using my dad's phone. Dad forgot to block you, so the call can come through. Izuku gasped at that. Whoa, you can block calls. Yeah, Ma did that a lot. I saw her blocking someone called Bitch, in which Hitchin coughed over the phone, but Izuku frowned and worry, are you okay Hitchin? After Hitchin calms down, he lets out a loud laugh, Bitch is a bad word. Pops would shout at you if he heard. Kakin then began to glower and mumble something along the lines of I'm going to shout at you or you're the bitch as a response. Izuku couldn't catch other words, but he's intrigued with something else. Hitchin, what is Pops? It's a cake pop. Old man made them a few weeks ago. Kakin I don't think cake pop can tell Hitchin a bad word. What? No way, Pops is those round cake thingy. Both began to argue on what a Pops is until Hitchin explained it to them. Maybe a bit exasperated. Pops is my other dad, not a food. Are you sure Pops is not a food? Yes Izu, he's my other dad and is very much human. Wah, how come you got two dads? I also want one too. The old hag is annoying. Oh, okay, okay no more bad word. The blonde huffed. He's grown too accustomed with how uptight his friend can be. Izuku narrowed his eyes at his friend's promise. But after a while, he beams back again at Heichin. How do you have two dads? Can I also have it too? Heichin didn't reply for a second. But Izuku can picks up another voice in the background getting louder and louder. Were you calling Toshi? A friend. Yeah Pops, accidentally met him, his name is Izuku. Heichin's voice began to fade into the background. Kakin only stares at the phone confused, gazing back and forth from Izuku to the phone, which Izuku knew it's Kakin's way of asking him something. Though, Izuku is also as puzzled as him and only shrugged. It seems the conversation on the other side has come to an end, in which Hitchin finally answered, Hey great news. Pops said I can use his phone to call with you. Izuku also began to squeal in delight. That's great Hitchin. Okay, okay I remember my number, it's 81xx30-40. to The two exchanged numbers, chatted for a while and bid their goodbyes after. It's really nice to know you Hitchin. We should talk again sometime. Yeah, nice knowing you too. I'll call you later Izu, Pops also said goodbye. Then he hangs up, placing the phone down. Izuku almost vibrates in his seat after making a new friend. Kakin who saw the whole interaction only scowls and munched down the melting ice cream in his cup, is it done? Which Izuku replied with a loud, yes, we made a new friend Kakin, and clapped both his hand from joy. Kakin rolled his eyes at him, I didn't make a friend, it's you. The greenette only pouts, I'll come one Kakin. Hitchin is a great friend, he lets out a soft hum, maybe we can play together sometime. Once the idea sprung, Izuku began to ramble about the games they could play, movies they can watch, and so on and so forth. Kakin has been listening and answered with either a nod if he agrees or a frown if he disagree. Overall, it's a nice day for both of them. After they finished their snack, both boys went back to the park to enjoy the rest of the day in the playground, playing with swings, making sandcastles, or drawing in Izuku's notebook until Uncle Masaru picks them up. To Izuku's surprise, his mom also came along. Seeing his mother, Izuku immediately ran up to her and tackled the woman into a huge hug. 
When Izuku sniffed at his mother's familiar pheromone, his body unconsciously relaxed when she also hugged him back. Sorry baby, mama was busy with something so I can't pick you up yesterday. She lets go of her hug and took her son's hand. Now, the things has been handled and we can go home. Huh? Both Izuku and Kakan utters in surprise. I thought I can have sleepover for a few days mama. Izuku's lips began curl downwards into a frown. Grandma said so. His mama gave him a comforting pat. Ah, uh, I'm sorry baby, but mom and dad has already finished our things now. Izuku can come home sooner, don't you miss brother Tenko? Mama also chuckles. Mom remembered that yesterday your brother kept asking about you a lot, you know. Izuku's thoughts got distracted by that. Wait really? MHM. He kept asking your dad when you'll be home every hour. Izuku didn't even realize that his mom has been holding his hand and guided him to their own car. Once they're already inside, Izuku snaps back from the conversation with his mom and cried when he saw the familiar road back home. It took a long time for Inko to calm her son down but when they arrive back, Izuku's usual cheeriness is back, even with red puffy eyes, when he spotted his brother at the front door. Inko smiled seeing her sons hugging each other even though they've only been separated for a day. Her thoughts drifted as she hears Izuku narrating his whole day playing with Katsuki today. She also spotted Tenko's smile while they're talking about their day. It's a nice change after what happened yesterday, she thought. The moon hung high on the dark night. It's a rare peaceful time for Aizawa Shouta, since he worked mainly in the night. Up until now there's nothing that grabs his attention, so he heads back home early. What did catch his attention is how his husband still sat in the living room with stacks of documents on the carpet and coffee table. He did expect Toshi to stay up late, probably sneaking around and secretly watching cartoons on the TV. But he didn't expect Hizashi to stay late, when he's usually on their bed, sleeping already. Hey show, he turned his attention to his husband, giving a small smile then back at the piles of documents again. I'm just checking something real quick. Shouta slowly walked closer to the couch, peeking at whatever his husband is working on. He didn't expect so see two photos of young children inside, complete with all their information and relatives. He gave his husband a side glance and took one of the documents with a photo of a spiky blonde child in it. Zashi what are you checking on? He scanned the info inside the paper. Name, age, gender, quirk, families. Everything seems normal, nothing out of the ordinary, maybe richer than most but that's it. Bakugu, huh. He knew the Bakugu Mitsuki is the famous model Nimari has been catching up on, constantly appears in media magazines, interviews, and fashion shows. But he didn't expect the alpha to settle down with the mysterious designer called Masaru, who owns famous luxury brands his husband has been begging him to buy ages ago. It's even more unexpected that both already had a pup. But everything is the ordinary. Masaru and Mitsuki's job occupation is already listed. With all their ties and relations to everyone they knew, nothing real. Oh. Shouta saw a name right at the bottom of Mitsuki's friend group. Midoriya and Ko and Midoriya Hasashi. He might never meet the woman, but he knew she's Chiyo's only Omega daughter. Who's also already married with a mysterious alpha. Who he now knows is Midoriya Hasashi that Chiyo herself rarely talks about. The name won't raise his interest if it's not for the blank data inside Hisashi's file, which raises some question. The basic name, gender, age, and date of birth has been filled, but important things such as his photo, occupation and relations which was always used for investigations is missing. He placed the paper down and peeked at the one Zashi is holding. Hey can I check that one? Zashi hummed. He gave the paper to Shouta and began to check on the other. This one has a picture of a young green-haired boy, which he can guess must have been Midoriya and Ko's son, from how he remembers Chiyo describing her daughter of having a hair that resembles the color of a bush. He checked the name, age, gender, quirk. Oh this one has a healing quirk, must have inherited it from his grandmother. Then he checked the family column and he's right. Izuku is the son of Inko and Hisashi, and an adopted brother underneath the parent column too. Why are you investigating these children for anyway? He finally questioned his husband. Zashi didn't turn his attention to him but kept on reading. Toshi made some friend today. And you decided to stalk these kids. As Zashi sputtered, what? No, oh gosh, I wouldn't do that. Shouta only raises his brow at that. Eyes glancing back and forth from the blonde man in front of him to the piles of documents scattered in the living room. Hazashi finally sighed. Okay, Toshi accidentally made some friend today. He paused then began to purse his lips. He told me something about prank call kid, but he looked so happy chatting and I felt bad if I interrupted. Something clicked in Shouta's mind. Oh, what oh? The blonde now gave his husband a scrutinizing glare. A few days ago, random kids managed to access my phone number and did a prank call. I guess I forgot to block their number after I used Nezu's software security. What happened? Did those kids prank call again? His ashy lets out a chuckle and shook his head. Oh no, this time it's an accident. Toshi has been very lonely after we transferred him to another school. So when I saw him chatting with other kids, I can't help but to let him be, you know. 
Shouta also understood his husband's concern. After they took Itoshi under their care, they knew on what kind of hardship they're facing on raising such bruised child, discriminated against from the moment his quirk manifested. It's hard to find a safe schooling for the boy without ending up either isolated or bullied, so it's a challenge for them and their son to find a place with secure environment for Hitoshi to grow. Though, a lesson of stranger danger is a must now. He doesn't want his kid to get lured into a random van with candy, cause he knew for a fact beating up criminals are exhausting and time-consuming so he better to do prevention before anything unwanted happen. Alright then, so you're checking these kids too. Make sure they're safe shoe. As Ashi finished. Other than being the whole definition of capitalism, I don't find anything suspicious, no villain relatives or whatnot. Shouta's eyes are back on Midoriya Hisashi's file, yeah except one. Is there anything I missed? Shouta handed Hisashi's file. Look here, Izuku's father. Nothing is inside other than basic name, age and gender. Did you ask Nezu to investigate or did you use other connections? Hisashi gave a glance and perks up. Oh yeah, Hisashi, he took the file. I asked Nezu for help and when he handed me the information, he warned me something about Hisashi guy. What's wrong with him? Nezu didn't really elaborate but he told me something about a powerful man. If capitalism is a person, Hisashi collected every paper and placed them neatly on the coffee table. Hisashi is the perfect embodiment of it. Shouta hummed. So our son made friends with Rich Rich, in which earned a chuckle from his husband. Oh honey, they're wealthy wealthy. On the other side of the town, light blue haired boy snuck into his brother's room. Thankfully, the huge wooden door didn't make any creak, or he would be found. Slowly tiptoeing to the edge of his brother's bed, Tenko carefully held his breath. After he saw Izuku's sleeping figure, Tenko carefully pokes his brother's cheeks. He kept poking until his brother's eyelids fluttered open, brother. Izuku's voice held drowsiness in it. The greenette sat up and rubs the sleepiness out of his eyes, focusing his gaze on his brother. What's wrong? Tenko seemed to be overly cautious, glancing back and forth to watch out for anything even though they both knew Izuku's room wouldn't have any other person besides them in it. The older boy whispered, Zuku, I need your help. And then he stepped back, motioning Izuku to follow him. Huh. Izuku tilted his head in confusion. Knowing nothing, he climbed down his bed and followed his brother out from his bedroom and down to the stairs. Tenko has been holding his brother's palm with his gloved hand, making sure Izuku won't fall or trip. On their way across the long hallways, Izuku finally asked, Brother where are we going? Tenko didn't stop and replied, To the infirmary. Why? Tenko didn't reply for a long while, but his steps began to slow down until he finally stops. He turned around with pleading in his eyes, Zuku, can I ask for your help? Izuku doesn't understand why his brother has such look on his face, but he smiled, of course. What can Zuku help with? Tenko's eyes has been darting to the walls and the floors until he answered, Remember brother Taoya, the one I played with? Izuku nodded, uh, he got hurt, really bad. The greenette gasped at that. His body leaned forwards to express his worry, what happened to brother Taoya? Is he okay now? He's okay, but I was hoping you can heal him better. He finally said his intentions. Tenko felt guilty at the thought of asking his brother to heal his friend. But he also won't force it if his brother also doesn't agree. Though, Izuku is well known for his bright smile and golden heart, so he immediately said yes, okay, take me to see brother Taoya. Tenko really loves his brother. He already forgotten on how repulsed he was seeing Izuku when he was a baby but now, if Zuku asked him for the stars, Tenko would hand it to him, complete with the moon, and string it into a beautiful necklace for his Zuku to wear. After they reached the infirmary, Tenko carefully opened the wooden door to reveal the person sleeping inside. Taoya's burns didn't worsen, thankfully. But the sight of a young boy with charred red skin across his face and body is horrifying to say the least. Izuku gasped at the sight. He hid behind Tenko, grabbing a fistful of his brother's sleeves. Is, is that brother Taoya? His voice wavered at the sight. Tenko nodded. MHM, he got quirk injury. He quietly guided his brother to step forward and let him stand next to Taoya's bed. You can still refuse if you want, I won't force you. Izuku shook his head once he saw the severe burn injury on brother Talia. He tugged his brother's pajama sleeve and asked his brother to take a small stool so he can climb up and reach the older boy. Tenko immediately used the swiveling chair that's located at the corner of the room. Once Izuku climbed up the chair, he began to inspect the injured skin and frowned. Slowly, Izuku's face inched closer to brother Talia, activating his quirk and kissed him on his burnt cheekbones. The smell of rotten skin permeated to Izuku's nose and he almost gagged, but kept on forward, letting his lips stay longer until he saw something changes. It's really fascinating on how new layers of skin began to grow on the area Izuku kissed. Soon enough the yellow pustules disappeared while red open muscle tissue began to have a new layer covering it. Though, there's only one problem. The healing didn't spread towards the other side of his face nor the rest of the body. Izuku frowned when only one side of brother Taoya's cheekbone has healed but the other side remains the same. 
He huffed and asked his brother to drag the swivel chair to the other side of the bed. Once he's ready, Izuku repeated the same motions and kissed the left cheekbone, along with the neck, arms, and legs while he's at it. The healing took longer than what Izuku expected. Watching the previously scorched skin grew a new surface layer apparently took ages to finish. The greenette also stared annoyed at how the newly formed skin isn't even in Brother Taoya's original skin color, but instead it's pale pink. Tenko, however, marveled at how miraculous his brother's quirk is. He saw the previous Taoya before Grandma treated him, and in his honest opinion, if anyone asked him whether he saw a monster before, burnt Taoya will be his first answer. You did a great job, Zhu. He hugged his brother in joy. But Izuku didn't feel as delighted. He didn't know why the healed skin isn't within his expectations. He didn't know why the healing process took so long. And he didn't know why Brother Taoya isn't awake either. He groaned and tried to focus on the sleeping boy again. This time he kissed the white-haired boy with more strength and held his lips onto the teenager much longer. Hey, hey Zhu. No need to heal him anymore, it's fine. Tenko tried to grab his brother. But every time he managed to grip his brother's body, Izuku slipped out and continued to heal Taoya. Izuku didn't know what exactly he's healing. He can feel the torrent of energy went inside Brother Taoya's body but after that, his quirk scattered to many different areas, creating smaller and smaller thin strips that aims to every acupoint inside the body. The more he unloads his quirk, the more blurry his head become. It didn't hurt him or anything, but haze seemed to swept in, confusing his thoughts until it just snaps and Izuku's vision turned dark. Tenko managed to catch his brother who passed out from quirk overuse. But before he managed to fall into panic, a groan cuts off his thoughts. Tenko stared up at the patient bed, seeing his friend's eyes flutter open and another groan escaped his lips. Tenko really wanted to cry. He didn't know what to do so on instinct he let his brother's body to sit on the swivel chair and ran upstairs to their parents' bedroom, waking up both his mom and dad, along with Grandma Chio, to check on whatever has just happened. He knew he's in a deep trouble, but he's prepared to face whatever will happen after. The next day is quiet, and Ko stares at her still sleeping son, with his gentle breathing, assuring her that Izuku is still fine. Hisashi has talked with Tenko all night. Something about letting Tenko to learn a lesson and the next thing she knew, Tenko will have extra classes until the next six month with Hisashi. She didn't know what they discussed about, but Tenko didn't complain or annoyed after knowing he'll study extra hard. Inko also agrees that this is a learning lesson, not only for Tenko but Izuku too. A moment later, her mother came in with Hisashi in tow, presumably already compiled all of the things she knew about Izuku's quirk. Her mother sighed when she saw the sleeping Izuku and began to narrate everything she picked up from her observation with Taoya. All right, it's not really concrete but Izuku will need to have a checkup and tests later. She continued, From what Taoya has told me, some parts of his body felt lighter while the other is heavier. I also did checkup but a MRI scan is needed after this. I was 100% sure the boy will fall into a coma before, though this just took me off guard. I already had a guess on how Izuku's healing works. But this has confirmed my previous conjectures. Her husband stayed quiet, watching their son's slow rhythm of breathing. Her mom continued, Izuku's quirk needed him to visualize the parts he needed to heal. For example, Izuku knew how healthy skin would look like, so if he saw someone with a bruise and heals it, his quirk will replicate the image his brain provided and heals the person until it's the same as his expectation. It's not a problem of course, but his lack of knowledge regarding how internal organs worked is. He can heal surface skin because it's the easiest to visualize and replicate, but internal organs are different. We're glad that Izuku didn't heal Taoya's internal injury to the wrong way, but this should be the last time he's allowed to heal injuries he didn't understand anymore. Hisashi finally spoke up. Taoya will have a full body checkup later, but Zuku might need a bit of time to digest this. Chio also nodded. Izuku's quirk is powerful, very impressive. When the doctors tested his quirk before, they only used his blood and saliva, not with Izuku actively using his quirk, so time limit and drawback was previously unknown. Now however, he needed to use it with extra caution. He's still young and his energy limits the amount of power he can use. I'll train him on how to use his quirk appropriately later. Izuku will start to follow me to you in the future for his training, so his schoolwork and tutors must change online. Inko gasped at her mother's words. But Izuku is still so young. Sensing Inko's pheromone going haywire, Hisashi stepped in and gave his wife a comforting hug. Chio also sighed at the decision, but if she doesn't start now, it'll be harder for the boy to grow later. I just wanted to minimize the damage that might happen if he's not educated regarding medical issues. We're lucky the bruises he healed before were minor enough to not alter other body parts. Shio frowned at the memory of seeing her grandson laid on that chair, unmoving. It's already enough to make her blood runs cold at the sight. She hopes she doesn't have to witness something like this ever again. Ah, uh, recovery girl, is Izuku going to be a permanent addition to UA? A student asked. It's a few weeks later after the accident and Chio has been taking Izuku with her whenever she went to work. 
She had requested permission from Nezu regarding Izuku's training as her apprentice in Yue. She had prepared all the files she needed to ask Nezu but the stoat didn't even bat his eyes at the documents she handed. He grinned and gave her immediate permission and told her that Izuku can start anytime he wanted. Although Chiyo doesn't have much contact with the principal, she knew how cunning he can be. She doesn't know what the stoat will do, but at least Izuku can enter and exit you at will now, letting him to use his quirk as his training experience. Yeah, recovery girl. Why can't Izuku heal our training injuries? I saw his healing before, and it's quite powerful. Another asked, snapping Chiyo back from her absent-mindedness. She wrapped the bandage around the student's shoulder with ease. Yes, Izuku will stay at Yua for training. And no, he's not allowed to heal any severe injuries yet. She finishes, gazing back at the curious group of students. He's still training. It'll be dangerous for both you and him if he heals other injuries more severe than skin trauma. The group of students nodded in unison. Chiyo has been used to these kids coming in and out the infirmary. She used to chase them away with her cane when they first came. But then it became more frequent to the point Cheo just lets them be as long as they don't disturb other injured students. Most of them would come in and entertain the boy anyway. Helping him build up his social skills that he hasn't been able to hone considering he's homeschooled and all. It's all the usual. Students trickle in, some injured, some just wanted to grab the little Omega's attention and then Cheo would check on Talia's and Izuku's test reports from a few days before. It's the end of her shift. The woman has been packing all her stuff and head back home. She was about to call Izuku until she saw the boy sitting on a vacant bed, frowning as he reads the study materials Cheo has given him. She sighed, taking a slow step towards her grandson. Once he notices her, he began to let out a small whine in restlessness. Grandma, why do I need to study these again? It's really hard. His small face contorted into a frown. Cheo saw the page he's in and gazes back at her frustrated grandson. She sighed and stood next to Izuku and explained, so you can heal people better. She gave a simple reply. Izuku seemed dissatisfied with his grandma's explanation and complaints. But I can heal people right now. Why do I need to learn this again? You can only heal injuries on the outside, not inside. She knew her grandson doesn't understand medical terms. And she explained it as simple as she can. The difference between healing outside and inside is a lot. What is the difference then? Well injuries on the outside are mostly skin. Like the bruise you heal that Katsuki kid when you first got your quirk. Izuku smiled at the memory. He's still fascinated whenever he remembers the way Kaken's skin began to close by itself. Injuries inside the body are like this, Chiyo showed, carefully taking a small skeleton model on her desk. Despite the skeleton being small, but compared to Izuku's petite stature, the model skeleton is almost the same height as him. She had commissioned a specific skeleton model that can be assembled easily. While some parts of the bones can be snapped back and forth, using magnets inside, it cost quite a price considering how flexible she wanted the skeleton to be, letting Izuku to explore all of its anatomy. Once Izuku masters the human body, she'll let him learn mutants and those with non-human physique. But for now, she snapped the tibia in half, letting the magnet inside to pull back. Izuku almost screamed when he heard the crisp click of the leg bone. He stared wide-eyed at the now broken leg, almost bursting himself to tears when he imagined how painful it would be for Mr. Skeleton. Chiyo wanted to laugh seeing her grandson's expression, but she decided to ignore it and move on. Look, this is called tibia. Isn't it called legs grandma? Why is it tibia? The little Omega's voice shook, but in the end, he maintained his calm. Tibia is what we call this specific part of bone. She saw Izuku nodded. Now a broken bone like this is what I would call a fracture. Remember when I told you that your quirk needs you to imagine the healed outcome for it to work perfectly? Again, the greenette nodded. Now what if the injury is inside the body? You can't see what you're healing. You don't know what's wrong to the bone right here. She gestured the snapped bone in her hand, if you didn't check first. Now let me show you what would happen if you heal this bone without any prior knowledge. She then began to stick the bone on the opposite direction of what a normal structure would be. You might heal the bone like this. Showing the result to Izuku, who only gapes at the result. This is wrong. The leg shouldn't look like this, right? Izuku gave a curt nod, eyeing Mr. Skeleton's badly healed leg. The bone now sticks like this unless we do a surgery to fix it. Then snapping the leg back to its correct position, Chiyo placed the model skeleton back to its place. That's called malunion. When a fractured bone healed in abnormal position, she explained, that's only the bones, now what would happen to the muscles surrounding it? What would happen to the person when they wanted to walk? It'll harm them more than it'll heal. Giving her simplest demonstration, Chiyo patted the boy's tuft of green curls. Don't worry, as long as you learn and train, I'm sure this type of thing wouldn't happen. Though, she never got any answer from Izuku. Only then she found him bawling, tears streaming down his face. Worried, Chiyo began to pat her grandson's back. Why are you crying dear? Izuku hiccups. He tried to inhale some air only for him to choke and cough. Once he calmed down, Izuku muttered. So Izuku is not strong then. 
His face flushed, with eyes puffy from the running tears. Chiyo raises her eyebrow. Who said that? The boy kept silent. The older woman sighed, slowly rubbing the back of her grandson's back for comfort. You are strong dear, but strong quirks need more responsibility. Learning the basics doesn't show that you're weak. It means that you're willing to be stronger, more responsible to handle the already gifted quirk of yours. She gave a soft smile. Everyone has their start somewhere. Grandma also used to be bad using her quirk when she was younger, but Grandma learned and practiced until Grandma doesn't hurt people anymore. Izuku's attention shifted to the topic. Wait, really? The healing hero nodded. My quirk uses other people energy for it to work, so if someone is badly hurt, they won't have enough energy for me to start their healing process. Usually, I would make patients tired and sleepy after healing. Her mind wanders to her past memory. I had this one patient before. I didn't account his vitality after he got into a bad accident, so I almost hurt him. Izuku stares up at her in worry. And then what happened? Well, I stopped healing him when I knew. After that, I practiced more until I get better. The solemn expression on Izuku's small chubby face created such a cute contrast that made Chiyoku. Though she kept it in and focused on teaching Izuku about the basics of his quirk. After everything is said and done, Chiyo held Izuku's hand and lead him outside of Yuya gates, walking towards their designated car and head back home. Once home, Inko immediately hugged her son and took him upstairs for a quick bath. Chiyo knew how daunting it is for her to be away from Izuku this long. She's not an Omega but she can imagine how stressed Omega parents can be once their child is away for too long. She only smiled at Inko and kept walking towards Hisashi's study, ready to hand out the test results from both Taoya and Izuku. Knocking the tall wooden door, Chiyo went in after Hisashi prompted her to. Walking towards the large mahogany table, she placed down the files and documents for them to discuss. Taoya's tests aren't abnormal. Important parts in his body has been healed, although not perfect, but it allows him to do basic activity in the future. The kid might need physical therapy and maybe also mental ones. Kami knows on what Endeavor has done to the point his son burned alive. She stated, checking the pages and handed it to the Alpha. As Asashi scanned through, Chiyo continues, Kid definitely needs support items if he wants to use his quirk in the future. His fire quirk is notable, but his body constitution can't handle such strong quirk, and he's already set up for failure if this goes on. Asashi hums, he also scanned the other files on the desk. Izuku however, Chiyo paused. She was quite surprised when she saw the test result a few weeks ago. Although she does expect the nature of her grandson's quirk, she didn't expect another thing she has missed. Asashi also sensed Chiyo's hesitation and immediately snapped his eyes to the older woman. What's wrong with him? Pheromone began to spread out, emitting danger. Although Chiyo can't sense the Alpha's pheromone, she knew the rising tension inside the room and began to explain, There's nothing wrong. Just, something I didn't expect. Pondering the correct choice of word, she asked, Remember the time when Izuku got his quirk and doctors told us that he can secrete liquid with healing property? The man nodded, eyebrow raised in skepticism. Shio continues, Well, my first conjecture is that he uses his quirk and the rest of his body also got affected with it, making his body to be able to contain healing properties. Picking up a folder, Chiyo handed the file to Hisashi, there, turns out, under his heart. There's a small gland that naturally produces some kind of medicinal elements in it. We tested it out on skin injuries, and it worked similar to a skin glue, which doesn't immediately heal like his kiss would, but it would take a couple tries like how you would normally use creams. Then we tested it with illnesses and diseases, which was taken orally. Minor ones worked but more severe ones only seemed to stagnate and doesn't eliminate the source. All in all, it worked similar to any medications would. Either we either need to apply it multiple times depending on the severity, or we need to take it orally, which I along with the other researchers and doctors can come to a conclusion that his quirk and this gland worked separately. Hold on, Hisashi stopped the beta woman. How come this gland has just been found out now? What happened to his previous checkups and tests? Considering how small this organ is, I'm not surprised that we missed it when we first check Izuku's body. We suspect that there might be a trend for it to grow, so hospital visits are going to be frequent from now on they both took a break from their discussion and Hisashi began to read the reports Chiyo pointed out to him. Something clicked in his head, wait, if Izuku naturally produced medicinal property, what are the side effects? Chiyo took a sip from her drink, none. What do you mean none? She stares at Hisashi's eyes, like I said, he naturally produces it, right? This healing effect has been coursing through his tears, saliva, blood, and whatever fluid he'll discharge. As long as he doesn't dehydrate himself or bleed too much, all of it will be absorbed back to his body. A hum escapes the Alpha's lips, his eyes drooping in realization, like a cycle. Yes, a cycle. That's also the main reason why he doesn't feel tired using his quirk because the gland has been providing him energy. 
both worked separately, but interchangeably linked to each other. Glands provided energy for his quirk, activating quirk strength in the gland. Shio also mentioned, though, Talia accident happened because he tried to use his quirk all at once, forcing his body to shut down because the energy his body provided isn't enough to heal that kid's internal injury. Everything about Izuku is new for the Midoriya family, and the adults decided to tread carefully, one step at a time. Asashi then pointed to a condition inside the last page. Here says that Izuku needs to do blood draw every month. His voice turned sharp. Unfortunately, the hero sighed. Considering the nature of Izuku's quirk and body constitution, we decided to do blood draw not only for testing but also to reserve it if something happened and he needed it in the future. Hazashi wasn't reassured at the plan, but he also knows every precaution needed to keep his son safe, just make sure he won't be in danger. His mother-in-law nodded in acknowledgement. It was silent inside the dim study. Both Chiyo and Hisashi began to discuss more plans on how they'll handle this matter until late at night. In Izuku's bedroom, Inko tucked her son into his bed, kissing his forehead and bid him goodnight. Once Izuku saw his mother turning off the lights and closes the door, the boy shimmed out from his weighted blanket and walked to take his phone inside his bag. After a long day learning with his grandma, Izuku wanted to tell his story to his closest friends, but Kaken probably already asleep, so Izuku can tell him later when they meet at weekends. The other is Hitchin, who said that he's usually awake until 10. After the call accident, Izuku kept in contact and talked with Hitchin about anything and everything regarding heroes and their favorite movie series. It's really fun talking with someone that also likes the same thing he does, from their favorite heroes to their school assignments, then their daily life and everything else. Hitchin steadily climbed up in Izuku's best friend rank. Mama and Dada also knew Hitchin and told him to stay safe when they're talking but other than that, they don't disallow him from making his first online friend. Though, Dada seemed to be more upset when he knew Izuku exchanged his phone number with Hitchin without asking his permission. Another punishment added on top the last one and Izuku can't help but to feel bummed out. He learned his lesson to not give out any personal information again after that. Hitchin will only be the first and last time Izuku told people his personal information from now on. Ring ring ar hey, Su. What's up? You never call this late. Izuku lets out a small giggle, Hitchin. He tried to contain his glee and whispered, How was your day? It all started the same. Both ask about their day, what food they ate, interesting thing that happened and it's never boring even if both fell into a peaceful silence. Hitchin seemed to hesitate, but he answered, nothing much, the school didn't give out too much homework these days. Izuku listened to Hitchin's day. It's really interesting on how different Hitchin's world compared to him. He said that he lives somewhere called apartment. He went to school, like Kakin, he doesn't have tutors, nanas, butlers or housekeepers so Izuku always kept imagining how Hitchin and his parents do their day-to-day -day lives without those people to help. The places Hachin also visits are so different from him. Hachin always described it as crowded, full of people and noisy, but whenever Izuku went to public places, most of the time it's bare, but then again, he would ask his nanny to buy the things he wanted, so he doesn't have to go out in person. Hachin also doesn't have archery, piano, violin and swimming lessons like Izuku does, which made him gasp in shock, considering both he and his brother took up those lessons, with his brother having additional martial arts and sparring lessons with private instructors. Even Kaken has a quirk instructor to teach him on how to better his quirk usage. Izuku can't get enough whenever Hachin narrates his day. Everything is just so new and interesting for him, and Hachin is a genuinely nice and fun person to talk with. After that, he began to narrate his own day, telling Hitchin on how hard the lessons his grandma gave him. But with determination, Izuku promises to be the best healer there is. Don't worry Hitchin, if you're hurt in the future, I will come and heal you. His voice low as the promise is made, but receiving no reply, Izuku continued, Hitchin won't hurt as long as I'm here. Izuku will kiss Hitchin's pain away. Then a smile bloomed on his face. Izuku really hopes he can meet Hitchin one day. Then he'll let his friend play with his new toys Mama bought few days ago, so Hitchin can play together with him and Kakin, and they can go to the park and eat as many ice cream as they want. Though their call must end after Hitchin's papa told both of them to sleep. Hey little listener, this is Hitoshi's dad, his voice sounded nice and kind. Izuku felt a bit familiarity hearing it. It's already late for both of you, so I'm reminding you to go to sleep alright. Hitoshi is going to go to bed right now, so you can also follow suit too. On cue, a yawn escapes his mouth and he hummed, Okay Hitchin's papa. Good night Hitchin, good night Hitchin's papa. He mumbled before hanging up and placed his phone back inside his bag, scurrying back onto his bed and immediately went to sleep. Time flies so fast when you're enjoying it. The same goes for Midoriya Izuku. The boy is now nine, an almost permanent resident in you as a healer apprentice under his grandma's name. 
Many of the aspects of life has changed. From his usual hero cartoon to medical documentaries, his hero toys and fluffy dolls turn to a doll-sized model skeleton and model human body. Quirk analysis. Well, he still does that, became his study notes. If it's not for his brother and Kakin that dragged him out to play at weekends or hitch and calling to gush about latest movies and merch, Izuku might have lost his touch in reality, dedicating himself in medical study. Izuku's next milestone is when he finally differentiated as an Omega. It's not a surprise for everyone, but it's something worth celebrating. Similar to when Tenko differentiated because his parents held a grand celebration when he became an Alpha. A few weeks after he differentiated, Izuku began to learn on how to use his Omega pheromone to maximize his healing and spiritual area with his mom, another set of extra lesson for him. Was it tiring? Izuku might say yes, but his passion has always been healing those who needs one, so Izuku kept a smile even at his most frustrating days. From only healing skin trauma, Izuku is able to heal simple cough or flu, then cold, after that sore limbs and quirk-related injuries. It wasn't easy. There's many trials and errors that almost left him quit healing because of the hardships, but his family held his hand and slowly guides him on how to solve his problems, leaving him more confident than ever that he can be better. Izuku also has fair share with hellos to new people and goodbyes to his dearest ones in his life. The first time he felt separation is when his dearest brothers and sisters in third years are graduating. The first time was a mess for him. Izuku cannot stop himself from crying when these people he sees as role models wave their hand to bid their farewell with the boy. Not even a second later, Izuku began to realize that they never actually left. They would still visit and call him whenever they can, though some never came back. The first time he learned about eternal separation is when one of his sister-like figure has been confirmed dead after a villain attack. Izuku is only eight, attending the newly graduated hero student's funeral, realizing on how easy it is to lose the one he loves. It wasn't the best time for him. Everyone tried their best to cheer him up. Despite their obvious grief and concern, Izuku also learned to heal. Funny thing is, his brother, Tenko, is the one who understood him the best when he's feeling down. His brother is the notorious cold alpha. He doesn't do hugs or smiles and even a compliment from his worth more than a thousand gold, while only to other people except his family. His consoling is completely unexpected, but not unwanted. It took a while for him to make peace with such knowledge at a young age. Izuku doesn't know where the drive came from, but he strives to be the best healer so no one can leave before their time is due. From his quirk to his pheromone, Izuku wanted to use it all, he wanted to give what he can to help. But of course, it's not always sad. In fact, the new meetings and beginnings has shadowed the loss he felt. First is Brother Taoya. Izuku only knew Brother Taoya from Tenko, but after the incident, Brother Taoya became closer with him, almost like Izuku's second brother. Though he doesn't know why, after a few months Brother Taoya lived with them, the older boy left without any notice, which his dad told him that Brother Taoya is going back to his home, no longer staying with them. It was upsetting of course, but Brother Taoya visits once in a while for both meeting him and his brother. He can also see Brother Taoya at Yua after he enrolled to a hero school. The second is the new teachers in Yua Izuku doesn't mind the previous pro heroes that teaches in the school, but they're no match to the new three teachers Mr. Nezu has hired. Midnight Sensei and present Mike Sensei are the most entertaining teachers Izuku has ever met. It's not like he ever been taught in schools, but if he has to choose between his tutors or them, Izuku wouldn't hesitate to choose the latter. Aizawa Sensei is a bit different. He's tall, intimidating alpha that's silent and seems to have permanent scowl on his face. Izuku had cried when he saw the man but then when Midnight Sensei and present Mike Sensei took him to hang out with the gloomy alpha, the boy realized Aizawa Sensei isn't as scary as he first thought. And the last is the best. He finally met Hitchin after only chatting and calling using video calls. It was the best day for him. Apparently, present Mike Sensei is Hitchin's papa while Aizawa Sensei is Hitchin's dad. Izuku must have been so shocked that Heichin laughed at his expression. The boy felt like he found out a top secret information after Hicks and shushed him and told him to keep it a secret. Izuku placed his hands on his mouth, nodding eagerly as he gave Hitchin a pinky promise. Izuku has sputtered out questions after questions after that, from how both his fathers are alphas, why Heichin doesn't have his parents' surname, who is his dam and Heichin has been patient to answer all of his questions. Turns out, Heichin's dam has been hurt, which made his dam unable to take care of him, and he's adopted by his current fathers. He never changed his surname to retain the only memory of his dam. Izuku had asked Heichin whether he can heal his dam, but Heichin himself doesn't know who his dam is because his dads didn't really tell much. Then Izuku asked Heichin about his quirk, which Heichin hesitates at first, but he told Izuku that it's brainwashing. He beamed knowing there's such powerful quirk like Hitchin that would work perfectly at heroics. He gushed and rambled about the great possibilities Hitchin can do, asked him whether his quirk has drawbacks or hurting him. He even offered to help with the drawbacks if it's within his current capabilities. 
He didn't know why Hitchin's face was so red nor why Hitchin loses his speaking skills, stuttering and misspoken some words. Izuku was worried if Hitchin suddenly got sick but before he can get closer to check, the purple-haired boy ran away with his stiff legs. The days followed after is nice. It really is. Izuku is finally able to introduce Kachin to Hitchin now, letting the three of them to play together in the playgrounds or anywhere they deemed as fun. Sometime Izuku also enjoys watching both alphas spar in training rooms or in Yua gyms as their part of lessons, taught by Aizawa-sensei most of the time. Though, Izuku is still baffled by how both his friend kept themselves getting injured whenever he's around even though they can avoid it perfectly fine, making Izuku has to help them with a kiss. He sighs, worry in his small face, thinking on how his friends can survive if he's not around to help. Then everything just passes in a blur. His brother is going to take classes to prepare himself for entering hero school. High chance he's aiming for UA, in his three-year gap after he graduated middle school early. Brother Taya is preparing for his future hero work after he graduates. It's peaceful. Well, as peaceful as it gets. You're doing fine Toshi. Shouta grumbles, watching his son fumbling with the buttons of his shirt. Hizashi is taking millions of pictures as their young son having a puppy crush crisis at 7 in the morning. Sipping his NTH coffee for the day. The raven-haired man stepped out his son's bedroom and went back to the kitchen for another refill. While waiting for his coffee to brew, Shouta kept thinking on how he reached this point to have his son willingly wake up at the crack of dawn without them interfering. Deep inside, he knew why. That Midoriya kid is the whole reason. When he and Zashi took the teaching job with Nimuri, he and his husband decided to move so they can be closer to Yue. Another reason is to find another school for Toshi. His son's school environment wasn't the best to begin with, so when they noticed Toshi coming home with purple and black bruises he tried to hide, he and his husband decided it's for the best to move. A few connections also helped them in their favor to put the school staffs under investigation, which dismissed several teachers in the process because of their neglect. Moving to a new place hopefully gives them a better and fresher start. Shout a new Midoriya kid is Chiyo's grandson, but he doesn't expect to see him in you as a healer apprentice. Safe to say, he has been infatuated with the little Omega. Midoriya has been nothing but pure sunshine, like a small ball of light that almost makes Shouta breaks from his cold teacher persona multiple times. Not to mention Zashi and Nimuri. Both of them has been talking about Izuku this and Izuku that the first few weeks they met the boy. Shouta swore he can almost feel his ears falling off from hearing the name Izuku. He can't blame them, of course. The kid resembles a small kitten whenever he's sleepy and Shouta has to hold it in himself to not pat the fluffy green curls. Right now, the Midoriya family is inviting his son for a simple lunch at some restaurant with some French name that Shouta doesn't even bother to know. Knowing how whipped Toshi is to the Midoriya family's only Omega son, Shouta can't really say anything because he knows Toshi won't even listen, probably too preoccupied with his nervousness. Midoriya is a nice kid. A really nice kid. Kind. Caring. Makes people smile with his mere presence. Intelligent. Likes cats. And Shouta can list a bunch more of the green-haired Omega's advantages. He doesn't want to be that kind of parent. But if Toshi can't snag the boy into their family, even after him and Zashi helping him to court, then he doesn't know what to say. He won't force his son, of course. He can love whoever he wants if he loses this puppy crush in the next few years. Though he would prefer if his son can successfully court the greenette. It's an unwritten fact on how Alpha and Omegas who stayed together from their course of childhood will have better bond as mates in the future. Many AO couples become mates because they're childhood sweethearts. Shouta can't really say for Omegas, but he can confirm how Alphas are possessive creatures, and if they grew up with someone long enough, they'll see the other person as family or potential mate. Nimuri and Tensei becomes his family, while Zashi becomes his lover because he grew up and experienced ups and down together with them. It's just natural that he'll become possessive. He sees Izuku as a potential in law not because of personal reasons. Well there is some, but also the proven facts and statistics. Shouta knew their stay here is likely going to be permanent. And if there's nothing separating his son with Midori, the green kid becoming Toshi's potential mate isn't going to be far from that list. Oh, and maybe the same goes to Bakugu kid too. Dad, where are my shoes? I can't find them. The man lets out a tired sigh. Gripping his newly brewed coffee, he took slow steps to his son's room. I look like a nerd. The ash blonde alpha shouted. Just wear that you brat. Got a woo midori as kid. The older alpha woman gave a playful smack at her son's upper arm. The boy only grumbled, muttering about something and then stares at himself intently at the mirror. Katsuki is dressed in a semi-formal wear. Buttons up, black khaki pants, and a simple black sneaker. No matter how much he hates wearing other clothes that's not his home wear, Katsuki begrudgingly kept it on. It's just a simple lunch at Zuku's family restaurant. It's nothing special, but Katsuki still feel nervous with how his hands can't seem to stop sweating. You think Zuku will like it? The boy turned around to meet his mother's gaze. He saw how his sire chuckles at his question, which made Katsuki scowl. 
Mitsuki knew her son tried to mask those tense nerves with his arrogant face. Little did he know how his pheromone betrays his concealed emotion. If you try hard enough, duh. Then the door to his room opened, revealing Masaru holding a small black bag, probably for Katsuki to bring for his lunch later. What's happening here? Brat wants to woo Inko's kid. Mitsuki told her husband, in which Masaru smiles at the young alpha. He went in and places the black bag on Katsuki's bed. Then he sat down on the All Might-themed sheet, emitting his calming pheromone to ease his nervous jitters. Don't worry cats, Izuku will like you no matter what. If you have a crush on him, just be yourself. And don't pester the kid too much. The last time you tried to send Inko's pup, Hisashi almost gave me hell. Mitsuki adds. She doesn't have that Omega instinct nor Omega child but she understands Hisashi's extreme protectiveness over his only Omega pup, not only because he's an alpha but also because of his dragon bloodline. An information Inko told her before. Though he seems to slowly realize on how Katsuki can't get separated with his son in the near future, so he began to warm up with the idea of her brat being a potential family member. Not like she would complain anyways. She would gladly accept Izuku and her family if her brat can get this wooing job right. I don't have a crush on him. He roared out, with face so red similar to a ripe tomato. You don't. Mitsuki now covers her lips with her palm, not wanting to make her son blows up when he sees her smile. No, crushes are for gross people that kiss and do lovey-dovey thing. Ugh, I want to be his bestest friend. That's cooler. He huffed, crossing his arms around on his chest. But Izuku usually kiss you, right? Masaru raises his eyebrow. Doesn't that mean he's your crush? Her son's sputtered words and stiff reply made her burst out in laughter. On another side, a tall man stands still next to a hospital bed, eyes staring straight at his friend and hero partner. He sighs, trying to hold back the bubbling grievances in his chest. The damage his partner has received has obviously cripples him, losing an entire stomach with his respiratory system damaged beyond repair. Fortunately, his friend can preserve his life, but for how long? He needs to do something, anything, to save his friend, hero partner, idol. Mirai will find a way. Ryan Ryan Riai, hello. He took a deep breath. Recovery girl, this is me, Sasaki Murai, Sir Nidai. He pauses, I need your help. The lunch went great. Hisashi and Tenko did have a bit of foreboding knowing Izuku's two fanboys' friends also joins them. But to their surprise, these two young alphas are civil with each other throughout the whole lunch. Too bad Hisashi had a call incoming and they have to end their lunch early. Inko wanted to send the kids back home but seeing the three pleading to spend more time together, she relented and called both Mitsuki and Hitoshi's parents for their permission to let the kids stay in their home for a while. Mitsuki immediately agreed while Hitoshi's parent, Aizawa, doesn't mind. After promising to send both kids back safely, Inko ushered everyone to hurry head home. Once they arrive, Inko asked Tenko to watch the kids, something about building bonds with each other, while she and Hisashi have important matter to discuss. The boy nodded, watching the trio running to the second floor from the corner of his eyes. The nanas around has also been instructed to watch over the young masters for the day. After everything is said and done, Hisashi took his wife's hand and lead both of them to his study. All right, mom said I'm in charge so you three better listen to me. Tenko barges into his brother's bedroom, seeing the three sitting on the carpeted floor, playing with hero figurines Izuku owns. Okay, came Izuku's reply. Hitoshi just nodded while Katsuki rolled his eyes at the statement. Yay, sure, whatever. Then the blonde continued to play by himself. Tenko has been dealing with the kid for years now. The little taunt he did doesn't deter Tenko at all. Instead he laid down on his brother's bed while watching them play amongst themselves. The light blue-haired boy almost smiles when he remembered how different the games he used to play compared with his brother. Back then, him and Taoya mostly spend their time by burning random things to ash. Then they would compete with each other on who can disintegrate non-destroyable metals faster, with their school railings as the victim of their abuse. Their fun has been on the thin line between arson and murder so he's quite glad his brother doesn't follow his footsteps. But at the same time, he sympathized with his brother a little bit. Izuku is gifted with the perfect quirk, perfect gender that matches his quirk, and born in a perfect family. It's a beautiful sight to be in. Izuku is resilient, kind, and he won't give up until he can make you feel better. But at the same time, he sympathizes with how his brother has been burdened with lessons and studies that even Tenko can't help to gape at such intensity. At least he's able to attend school where he met with a bunch of people and classmates. Not to mention his training sometimes include kids his age too, which Tenko is grateful for. But Izuku has been homeschooled since he's a kid. The only friend he has is Katsuki, because mom is friends with the kid's mom and Hitoshi. Even befriending Hitoshi is an accident, and he knows mom lets him because she's also worried for Izuku's sake. Other than that, Izuku's only social interaction is his family. Then the Yua training happened. Even if Izuku made friends, the kids in Yue is double his age. Plus they're not the same like Katsuki or Hitoshi. Kids Izuku's age where they can play with toys and make pillow forts together. 
like a delicate flower inside a fortified greenhouse, is what Taoya describes his brother. Tenko frowned at that, but he can't refute the older boy's statement. His brother will always become his main worry, from the past into the future. Tenko is prepared though. He knows caring about your younger sibling is a part of the job description when you're the oldest, even when your sibling is a total piece of shit. Thankfully, Izuku is a little angel that made his job for caring and loving the Omega easier. Tenko's thoughts got cut off when Izuku asked a question that immediately caught his attention. Heichin, how do you know that you're adopted? Tenko opened his previously closed eyes, suddenly interested with whatever these kids are discussing. Hitoshi doesn't even bat an eye. Still holding one of the figurines, he answered, I kinda noticed that dad and pops aren't similar with me. Then he blinked, seemingly recalling a memory. Then I think Pops took me to sit on the sofa and told me that I'm adopted. What's adopted? Katsuki interjected. It's where you pick someone to be your family. Wait, is it? Izuku answered with uncertainty. Is it or am I wrong, Hitchin? Then he stares wide-eyed towards Hitoshi. Hitoshi hummed, I think it's right. So your old man isn't your real dad? Katsuki asked again. Tenko exhales slowly, reminding himself that he's just a kid and doesn't understand what he's asking. Tenko can see how Hitoshi's lips turned into a frown. They're my real dad but they're not related to you. Tenko breathed a sigh of relief when he senses the confusion inside Katsuki's voice. All right, it seems that he has to step in and mediate the situation. He stood up and walked towards the trio, sitting down next to his brother and flicked the blonde's forehead. They're Hitoshi's real dad kid. Tenko reaffirms. But how? Katsuki scoffs while holding his forehead that got flicked, with the other two also staring up at him. The explosive boy is actually cute if he's not at the edge of constipation all the time. Well, family are those that lives together with you for a long time. You know they'll support you and you feel safe with them. That's what family are. Tenko explained in the way how his mom explained it to him years ago. Families aren't always blood. That's what he learned from his own experience. As long as his parents and brother is there, he'll always have a family that loves him and he loves them back tenfold. Both Katsuki and Hitoshi went silent. Seems pondering at the answer but his brother is staring at him with stars in his eyes. Brother is so smart. He gushes, you know a lot of things. Tenko sniffs and hid his small smile. Izuku has never been stingy with his compliments and that's what he loves about his brother, helping him to boost his ego. Tenko is feeling a bit playful with how his eyes glint with mischief. The older boy doesn't dare to prank with his brother, but that doesn't mean Izuku's friends are off limits for him to tease. Say sorry to Atoshi for saying mean stuff. Tenko ordered, Katsuki only pouts, but he eventually relents, muttering out his apology. Louder kid, can't hear you mumbling. Sorry, there, softer, jeez, you're apologizing, not seeking out to fight. Katsuki grumbles, ugh, sorry. Then he stares back to Tenko, waiting for another complaint from the older boy. Tenko enjoys messing with kids like Katsuki, so he smiles, sorry for what? We don't know what you're apologizing for. But brother, I think Kakin Kayan, Tenko shushed his brother, watching how the blonde's face distorted, probably wrecking his brain to form the right words. Itoshi is just there. Blank as he experienced the rare one-in-a-lifetime Katsuki's apology. The blonde alpha growled under his breath, Sorry for calling your dad not real. A few seconds passed and Izuku corrected his friend, Kaken, your apology is wrong. Tenko held back his laughter, watching how his brother chides Katsuki. What? I already said sorry. Yeah, but you made it sounds like Hitchin's dad is imaginary. The blank stare in Itoshi's eyes just shows how absurd the whole conversation is. Izuku continues, You should say sorry for calling his dad is not his real dad. Yeah that's what I just said. Sorry for saying his dad is not real. But that's not proper wording Kaken. To hell with proper wording. Katsuki blows up. Crackle of small explosions managed to pop on his palm before Tenko flicked his head once again to calm the boy down. He felt a bit bad for bullying Bakugou's kid. But if there's anyone he can pour his gag to, it's Katsuki. He can't pull pranks to his brother because of his soft heart and Hitoshi is way too smart that he can see through his plan. Boys, boys calm down. He tried to calm the kids down placating the angry blonde, who reminds him of an angry cartoon cat with its furs all blown up. Okazu, okay, Katsuki already understand proper wordings. Izuku replied with a satisfied hum which then Tenko continues, and cats, no more saying things without thinking, K. Okay. The way Katsuki sent him resentful stare but still nodded anyways made him burst in laughter. Mid-laugh, Tenko got an idea to mess with this blonde even more, and cats, no more saying mean things about Hitoshi being adopted, you're also adopted too you know. The silence that follows after is satisfying. Izuku just tilted his head in confusion while his friend stares agape. Hitoshi is more of a surprise finding a same fellow while Katsuki is just pure terror. No way. You're F-U-C-K-I in line. Yeah brother, Kachin looks similar to Auntie Mitsuki. There's no way he's adopted. Izuku interject. 
Yes way, look at this. Tenko took out the phone as his pants pocket, searching for Auntie Mitsuki's popular lookalike back in the day. Mom had told him the story once on how some random woman in the internet got mistaken with the famous model Mitsuki. Even though their prominent features are vastly different, such as doppelganger Mitsuki has straight cherry red hair and sapphire blue eyes. Many speculated Mitsuki is taking some kind of job that needs her to change her appearance but after the rumors got dispelled, everyone soon realized that the person they've been discussing for months straight wasn't even the model herself. He saved the picture and showed it to the three boys. Here, believe me now. He also carefully picked out the most similar picture with vague lighting to mask some discrepancy. The Mitsuki we know now deliberately changed her appearance to match you cat. He points the similar features. Here look at this. This is Auntie Mitsuki before Katsuki is born. She has natural red hair and blue eyes. Mom told me that Uncle Masaru picked you up from the sewers. They felt pity when they saw you, so they took you in. Katsuki snatched his phone away, staring at the photo with wide eyes. Hitoshi and Izuku is right next to him, peering at the corner. Kaken, that's Auntie Mitsuki. He whispered, maybe you are adopted. He muttered, astonished at this new turns of events. Explodi is a sewer baby. Hitoshi covers his mouth with his palm, containing the shock inside his body. Tenko fueled the fire. MHM, Aunt Mitsuki felt bad if you realize that you're not the same as her. So she began to dye and spike her hair, plus turning her eyes red so she can be similar to you. He gave a fake sympathetic sigh. Don't worry cats, even if you're a sewer baby, we still love you. Katsuki didn't answer but instead lunges at Tenko, sinking his teeth deep into the older Alpha's arm. Tenko can't do anything other than screaming at the top of his lungs as a feral blonde hang on his right arm with sheer strength of his teeth alone. Young masters, soon enough, the Nanas ran into Izuku's bedroom when they heard the commotion. What was that sound? Inko furrows her brows in worry when she heard a distant shout outside. Asashi took her hand and cupped it with his, intertwining their fingers together. It's just kids playing around dear. Now where were we? His focus is back towards the man sitting in front of them. The study is quiet with Inko and Hisashi sitting next to each other on the black leather couch while Chiyo stood next to Hisashi's mahogany table, compiling all of the files Sir Nidai had provided for them. Hisashi was a bit irked when his lunch got disrupted but the conversation he has with the number one hero's sidekick isn't fruitless. Sitting alone in front of the Midoriyas is Sasaki Murai, or Sir Nidai. His usually slicked back hair is a bit messy while his appearance is pale due to excessive worry. He's also wearing his usual suit and tie, though Hisashi can spot wrinkles from the creases. Sir Nidai isn't unkept, but he has been in better condition. Hisashi took the tea on the coffee table, stirring the oolong tea inside then handed it to his wife for her to drink. His eyes focuses back to the man across him, ah oh yes, All Might's recovery. Chiyo took it as her cue and decided to sit next to Murai, handing in all of the compiled files on the black wooden coffee table, according to the hospital record. All Might suffered heavy injuries on his respiratory organs and he lost his stomach after a major fight, which is not stated inside this file on who he fought with. Hisashi peers at the documents. HM, yes, and the fight took place days ago, which made me wonder on how no news get a hold of such information. He paused for a moment, and to be able to harm All Might to such extent, must have been one powerful villain. Inko placed her tea down after she took a sip. Is there stated anywhere on who this villain is? It's quite worrying if that person isn't handled well. Who knows what they can do to others if they were let to roam free. Her husband handed another file, which is a transcript that kept track of everything that happened, not so detailed but enough for them to get a gist of what went down. As Inko read through the whole document, Hasashi continued, but I must refuse Sir Nidai. Murai kept silent, staring up at the man in front of him, not hiding the disappointment and desperation in his eyes. The Alpha leaned forward, tapping the coffee table as he took a blurry photo of All Might kneeling inside a huge pit with someone laid down in front. It's the aftermath of the fight it seems. I can't risk putting my son in danger when I know there's a chance this villain is still alive and could target Izuku. Murai is quick to respond. No need to worry Mr. Midoriya. We've confirmed the villain has died in the fight and your son won't have to worry such things, are you sure? Murai was taken aback. Well, yes. Did you see his body? Did you take it for further handling? How did you confirm the villain has died? With All Might's words, please enlighten me Sir Nidai. Murai went silent at the multitude of questions because he knows the answer would be negative even if he responds or not. His ashy side, thought so. He cupped his hands together, staring straight into number one hero's sidekick in the eyes. We won't risk Izuku's safety even if it means losing the number one hero. I hope you'll understand Sir Nidai. Family is important to us. Murai understand it well. He might be a beta but he has learnt and seen how Alpha's and Omega's parent would do their utmost best to keep their pups safe, even if it meant risking greater things in exchange. He really can't argue around such reason, worse yet, he still needed their help, 
and he can't make much demands, pushing down the anguish inside. Murai tried to confer another solutions. Please Mr. and Mrs. Midoriya, is there any other suggestion you could offer? I, Sir and I die, will do anything within my ability to repay. The Midoriyas made eye contact with each other. Then Inko took the lead to answer, there is, it's just. She hesitates, I'm not sure this would work to be honest. Murai grasped the chance as fast as he could, please, it's better than nothing at all. He almost kneeled to show his despondence. He really need this. There's no other healers that can fully heal All Might and he knows having the chance of recovery girl's healer grandson to help Yagi is slim, almost to none, but he's willing to try. Hasashi leaned back on the sofa, taking his wife's hand in his, our son has other method of healing. It won't require him to attend but it would work just as well. The problem is that this method of healing hasn't been tested thoroughly to know whether it'll work on All Might. Murai understands. Losing a whole stomach and heavily damaged respiratory system would take Miracle to completely heal. But as long as the man can stay in his best condition, Murai won't be the one who makes demands. If I may know, how will this healing work? And its success rate? He stares at the couple in front of him but Hisashi motioned Recovery Girl to answer, turning his head around. Murai began to watch how Recovery Girl stood up and searched for something inside one of the bookcases behind them. She explained while flipping some files. It's another method of Izuku's healing. How it work is classified but after multitude of testing, I can presume this method can completely heal All Might's lungs. His stomach is another problem, but we can find something to deal with it for the meantime. That's it, even though Recovery Girl is still not sure regarding the success rate. But if the woman confirms it can heal, then it must be able to heal. He clenched his hands into fists, breathing slow to calm his erratic heartbeat. I will take it, please. Is there anything I can repay with? Recovery girl seems like she found the file she searched for, frowned at Murai. Are you sure? The success rate hasn't been confirmed and there's a possibility that it might won't work. I'm sure. I've tried contacting other healers and none has been able to help with more severe damages. That or their healing didn't stay permanent. It won't matter whether this works or not, I am willing to give it a try. Hisashi kept silent, glancing towards Inko and the woman gave a curt nod in approval. He then stares back at Murai. Well then, Sir Nidai, we will reach back to you with contracts and NDA for you to sign, for legalities. After that, we will brief you on how this will work and I can assure you there won't be any drawbacks or side effects with it. Murai almost faint in relief when he heard. Hisashi kept stating their negotiation and process. You won't tell others regarding our discussion and there will be consequences otherwise. Recovery girl here will assist you in the whole process so if there's anything you're unsure with, you can ask her. The man paused when his wife whispered something in his ear. After they're done with their private conversation, Hisashi continued. Also, we request that All Might relocated to our private hospital ward for extra safety measure. Don't worry, the private hospital is under my wife's name so you can be rest assured with the quality. Then finally the repayment. With that, we're hoping your assistance when we needed to, of course. Everything will be written clear on the contract. But no need to worry, we won't be seeking for money. If you agree with all of that, then you got yourself a deal, Sir Nidai. Many thoughts are running through his head. Murai knows the best way for him is reimbursement as money since numbers has always been clear. But if Hisashi doesn't demand for money, then Murai has to be ready for anything. But he won't refuse either way. As the number one hero's psychic, Murai is confident he can provide with what the Midori is needed. It's a deal. At the end, Kakin and Heichin went back home before dinner time, accompanied by his mom. Izuku held back his tears when he saw his friends packing their bags not caring the way his brother kept staring daggers at Kakin after their fight. The three of them bid their goodbyes at the front door. When his mom ushered his friends into the car, Izuku suddenly remembered he forgot something. In a flash, the greenette ran towards his friend, ignoring his brother and dad calling him back, and gave them a quick peck at their cheeks, making both Kakin and Hitchin eyes widen, cheeks stained with blush. Izuku giggled at the sight while his brother yelled, Zu. Don't do that. Sounds of frantic footsteps can be heard behind Izuku, which then strong arms picked him up. Izuku can see his brother carrying him back to the porch when he turned his head around, separating him from his friends. But why? Mom and dad does that every day. Why can't I do it too? He muttered when his brother placed him on the ground. Not a second later, he felt his hand being grasped by his dad, who's waiting on the front door. All right, mom and dad are married, so we can kiss each other's cheeks. Yes, goodbye dear. He smiled down to Izuku but then snaps his head towards the already leaving car, where his mom has the windows rolled down, with Kakin and Hitchin next to her, waving at them goodbye. His dad smiled and softly waved back at mom, then took him inside with his brother in tow. Once inside, his dad made him sit on the sofa, crouched down to meet his eyes and sternly lectures him, you can't kiss other people except your family again, especially alphas, if it's not for healing purposes. Why? Izuku tilted his head 
watching his brother walking towards the kitchen from the corner of his eyes then focuses back to his dad, because that's not appropriate. Kissing can only be done when you're really close with other people. His dad sighed, example is me and your mom. We can kiss because we're married. Izuku blinks, beaming at his dad. Then I'm gonna marry Kakin and Hitchin. No, both his dad and brother shouted at the same time, in which his brother's voice echoes from the kitchen. Izuku flinched at the loud shout, frightened at the way his dad's face suddenly darkened into a deep frown. Before he can cry in distress, his dad immediately hugs him, patting his back. Sorry baby, dad didn't mean to be so loud. Then, gentle mint pheromone envelops Izuku. It's his dad's calming pheromone. Izuku recognized the fresh aromatic scent every time he went nervous or panics, even though he prefer his mom's warm and fruity calming scent. His dad's always made Izuku feels like he's wrapped in a cool breeze. Seconds later, the tension left his body and he smacked his dad's arm with his bald fist. Dad is being scary. Small complaint left Izuku's lips, pouting when his dad lets go. The man merely chuckles. Sorry, sorry, but next time, remember not to kiss anyone if it's not for healing. Okay. Dad doesn't win. Dad's lecture got interrupted by a stranger that walked down the stairs, accompanied by his grandma next to him. The stranger's tall build and sharp features immediately attracts Izuku, somehow gave him a familiar feeling as if he saw the man somewhere before. His thoughts were snapped back when his dad slowly stood up and approached both the stranger and his grandma. The three of them were discussing about something Izuku can't hear about for quite a while. Izuku's interest peaks, recalling on anyone that has slicked back green hair, wearing glasses and mean face. He's too preoccupied in his thoughts that he didn't notice his brother slowly enters the living room with two cups in his hand. Who's that? His brother asked once he placed one of the cups, which filled with milk, into Izuku's hand. He merely shrugs, observing the stranger again. There's often strangers coming in and out their house at a specific time and date. But Izuku doesn't recognize any of them, considering those strangers before are usually the same age as his grandma or plain. Do you know who's dad talking to? I think I saw him somewhere, taking a sip of his milk. Izuku asked his brother as he watched his dad and grandma conversing near the front door. A moment later, his dad seems to gesture a nearby butler to accompany the stranger out. The stranger gave a deep bow and walked away, escorted by the butler outside. His grandma and dad didn't come and sit together with them, but instead they stood in the same place and kept talking between themselves. That's Sir Nidai. He heard his brother's whisper. Izuku's eyes widen. The realization suddenly dawns on him. That was Sir Nidai, All Might's sidekick. The man didn't appear much in news but he and his brother is a hero nerd. Constantly following the hero forum, from newly debuted heroes, sidekick to underground heroes, there's no one that they can miss when they're surfing the forum together. But when Izuku starts his training, he can't always be online like his brother does. Though, staying at Yua gave him a free sneak peek on who will debut once they graduate. Sir Nidai might not be the most popular, but being All Might's sidekick gave him enough prominence where those who doesn't follow heroics can also know his name. That's Sir Nidai. Izuku repeated his brother, but louder, which attracts his grandma and dad's attention. His grandma gave them a smile and went back upstairs, while dad stepped towards them and sat down next to him. Izuku gave a bright smile. Placing the cup and climbed to his dad's thigh, Dad, Dad, that was Sir Knight I write. I was staring at him but I didn't realize he's All Might's sidekick. What is he doing here? Do you have an, calm down baby? Dad chuckled, securing Izuku so he'll be more comfortable sitting on the older Alpha's thigh, and yes, that was Sir Knight I. Whoa, both brothers gasped in unison. Izuku's eyes grew bright, smiling from ear to ear knowing a pro hero sidekick has entered their house. But he notices the way his brother's face scrunched up in confusion. Tenko asked, wait, if he's here, that means he have some business dealings with you then. Izuku doesn't really understand anything related to business that his brother and dad often talked about but if it's related to heroes, then Izuku is all ears. His dad only raised his eyebrows, smart and yes, we have business to do. What is it? Can I know about it? Once his brother utters his question, his dad merely nod and picks Izuku up in his arms, taking him and leading his brother towards his office. Once inside, Izuku saw how his grandma sitting on the couch with a bunch of papers on the table. The Omega almost cringes when he saw the papers, reminding him of his homeworks that his mama signs daily. Close the door Tenko, I can tell you the details here. His dad put him down on the couch, next to his brother who's already seated. Dad walked towards his desk and took out a paper with contract written on the top, handing it to his brother. Izuku tried to peer the text inside this contract paper thing in his brother's hand. Decipher the content and explain to me on what the deal is about. After that, list out the advantages and disadvantages on both sides. You'll understand why Sir Nidai comes to our house, his dad said, making his brother groan. Izuku saw how his brother rolled his eyes, muttering something under his breath but focused himself on the paper afterwards. 
It was silent in his dad's study. Only sounds of paper shuffling and rustling can be heard. His brother is busy studying the contract. Dad also started to continue his own work and grandma is preoccupied with whatever she's handling. Izuku just sat there, watching his family being busy and professional, while he's preparing to take a nap before dinner. If only he brought his study material. Izuku can also follow suit and pretends that he's a part of some cool study group or something. Ah that reminds me. His grandma suddenly broke the silence. Izuku, do you remember the blood draws you have to take every month? This question attracts Izuku's attention. The Omega nodded in confusion, wondering what his grandma wanted to say to him. She continues, Well, grandma has been keeping the blood safe in the reserve bank now, and right now, someone needed your blood to heal so grandma thought to send out some for them. Don't worry, your dad has asked compensation for you. The greenette blinked, My blood. To heal. Who got hurt grandma? She gave him a soft smile. Well, it's someone important. Izuku can meet him if you want. In which he nods in enthusiasm. He knew everything in his body can be used for healing. But this is the first time he has used it for healing other than his kiss. Alright, grandma can take you to meet him after he got better, okay. After that, a knock interrupted them. A butler came in, informing his dad that mom has come back and is currently in the dining room, waiting for them to have dinner together. Izuku giggled when he heard his mom came back and ran out the study. But a hushed conversation can be heard inside. Izuku's steps halted. He slowly peeks inside, listening to his brother talking. Important person related to Sir Nidai. Since he ka, Sir Nidai. Indeed. But tell me, what have you learned from this counter? A shuffle of papers can be heard. Empensation is medicine and medical supplies, which stated that it's blue. Oh, blood. What are they talking about? But then his brother continued. Benefit is clear and your part of the deal can be easily achieved. But the other side is, there's something that happened more in the background. But Izuku can't understand any of the term his brother is talking about. Duration is unclear. Schedule is also unclear. The other person's responsibilities seem to be ambiguous. Not clearly specified on WH, even though Izuku doesn't understand much. But he knew it feels like a bad thing. Is his dad having a problem? You're basically slaving away the other person with all these imprecise terms and agreements? Dad, are you sure he will sign this death sentence? Izuku wanted to peek in a bit more, but someone suddenly calls to him, Young master? A familiar-looking nanny crouched down, gently spoke. What are you doing here? Madam is currently waiting for you to start dinner. Izuku gave her a curt nod, taking her outstretched hand and follows the nanny towards the dining room to eat. He really wanted to listen a bit more, but it seems like he won't find out anytime soon. So, how's the date today? Aizawa asked once his son has changed into his pajamas. Both father and son is currently lounging on the sofa with Aizawa in his rare day off and Shinsu still in high spirit. His son just sighs. Sounded a bit too dreamy in Aizawa's opinion. It was perfect. Did you know Katsuki got picked up from the sewers? I know now. After that, he began to ramble about everything and anything Izuku did throughout their lunch and when they hung out together, not explaining one bit on Bakugu part. Aizawa has already memorized the way Izuku's eyes glint. How cute his laughter is, the amount of freckles the boy has on his face, his pheromone, wait, hold on. His pheromone. How did Toshi can smell Izuku's pheromone? Toshi, does Izuku wear scent patches on his gland? Aizawa asked just to make sure of something. Scent patches. Um, yeah. I saw he has the pretty white one with cute cartoon drawing. Then another paragraph on how cute the boy's scent patch is even though it's the most common scent patch that's sold in the market. And you can still smell his pheromone with the scent patch on. Aizawa narrowed his eyes and gave a tentative question. MHM. He has a really sweet mint cinnamon scent. Dad, do you know that? I really like whenever he. The older Alpha does know. His son has been obsessed with telling him how sweet Izuku is whenever they've played with each other. Really, he kind of wished his son would shut up for once whenever it's Izuku related. But then again, if Toshi can smell Izuku's pheromone despite the boy wearing his blockers, then that only mean one thing. Even though he has foreseen this, Aizawa is still not prepared for it to happen. True to his grandma promise, Izuku finally meet the mysterious important person. The man looks sickly, and there's a lot of machine and wires stuck around him. The man is really kind. With long tuft of hair at the front, the man has a really bright blonde hair, almost similar to Kakin. There's a deep eye bags under his eyes, probably due to the medications he's taking. Izuku, this is Mr. Tashinori. His grandma introduces the man. Oh, please just call me Yagi, my boy. It's really nice to finally meet my little savior. His laugh is loud, almost booming inside the hospital ward despite his skinny stature. Mr. Yagi is nice, Izuku thought. He really liked Mr. Yagi. He doesn't have any uncles or aunts, but Mr. Yagi feels like the gentle uncle that's always on cartoons or movies he watched. He wants Mr. Yagi to be his uncle now. He's pretty sure his family won't say no to him and if his grandma is confident enough to introduce him to Mr. Yagi, 
Then he's sure the man isn't someone dangerous. Dear, stay here for a while. Grandma need to take a call. She pats Izuku's hair, turning her head and said to Mr. Yagi, Can you please watch Izuku for a while? I'll be back soon. Mr. Yagi beams, of course, no problem. It's my pleasure to watch young Izuku. After his grandma left, Izuku's attention is wholly focused on the blonde man, Mr. Yagi. He began to call out. Yes, my boy. And please, no need to call me mister, just Yagi is enough. He smiles towards Izuku. Oh, okay. Um, Yagi. Izuku hesitates a bit, but he finally asked out, do you want to be my uncle? His question might be a bit surprising considering mister. No, Yagi sputters and chokes on nothing but air. Wah, what? Oh, no, no. I'm not. He stops himself when he saw Izuku's teary eyes. You don't want to be my uncle? The Omega's voice wavers, clearly stating his melancholy from his slowly scattering pheromone. Yagi seemed to be flustered, sweating so much that the heartbeat monitor began to make a rapid beeps. Izuku felt a little bad for teasing Yagi but before he can retract his pheromone, the man rushed to say, Yes, yes, I want to be your uncle young Izuku. Please no need to be sad anymore. Your grandma will kill me if she enters this room. Watching the man's begging and pleading, Izuku wipes away the fake tears in his eyes and slowly gave Yagi a wobbly smile. Can I call you Uncle Yagi? Of course, of course. Then he beams at the affirmation. So that's how Izuku gained himself a random stray uncle he found in the hospital. Every time he finishes his training at UA, Izuku kept asking his grandma to visit Uncle Yagi at every chance he got. Izuku really enjoys spending time with someone that's not his family and friends for once and Uncle Yagi has really cool merchandise of everything related to All Might. Izuku doesn't want to admit but the truth of him spending more time with Uncle Yagi is so that he won't have to come home early and meet the unending piles of homeworks and lessons. But hey, Uncle Yagi is fun and when he found out the man is All Might's secretary, Izuku's enthusiasm to spend time with him has skyrocketed. His days are nice, except for his dad who for some reason always in a low mood every time Izuku came home from the hospital. His brother also has the same frown too. They did complain once on how Izuku randomly took in some stranger as his uncle but his mom just shushed them and smiled, ruffling his hair. It's great you've bond with Mr. Toshinori, dear. I'm sure he gets lonely in the hospital all alone. His mom praised him, and no need to listen to your dad and brother. I'm sure you're smart enough to know that Mr. Toshinori isn't just a random stranger. Izuku agrees with his mom. He nods and takes a scoop of his dinner, eating in glee despite the gloom wafting on his dad and brother's side. You're just encouraging him to be a menace, dear. He heard his dad sighed, whispering with his mom. She just gave a small chuckle, with proportion of course, and don't act as if he's not giving you a headache already. Dad also lets out a soft exhale, sounding a bit more of an exasperated chuckle. Yeah, you're right. A menace with proportion. I hope he's not another Tenko. Hey, his brother seemed offended at the mention of his name. Izuku tilts his head, but I can't destroy things like he does. Oh baby, dad wasn't talking about you destroying things. Then what? It's your special skill, his brother piped in, chuckling. You use your eyes and everyone just, zop, bewitched. He even put down his spoon and fork just to tease Izuku. Really, Izuku stares wide-eyed at his brother, only for him to barks out a laughter. You're doing it. His parents even let out a soft laughters. Izuku really can't wrap his head around whatever his parents and brother are talking about, so he just lets out a frustrated hum and began to focus back on his meal. Kakin, there, laid bare on Katsuki's bed is his best friend. Familiar green bush-like hair and glowing emerald eyes has been enticing him to walk forward, slowly step by step towards the nude boy. The scent Izuku has been spreading is intoxicating. Sweet cinnamon mixed with the fresh mint invaded his nostrils, so heavy Katsuki can practically taste the sugary scent at the back of his throat. The once small and petite Omega has grown annoyingly adorable as the years passed by. Nothing much has changed from the nerd except that he grew taller. Not as tall as Katsuki or Mindfuck, but at least it proves that he has some growth spurt during puberty. The way his eyes would glow bright emerald green under the pouring sunlight remains the same. The way his laughter and smiles give him a jolt of contentment never changes. The way his lips puckers and pouts whenever he encounters difficult problems always stays the same. Maybe more inviting now since Katsuki has been considering doing some unimaginable things to those lips. His scent has always stayed the same, sweet and fresh whenever Katsuki caught a whiff of it. After the nerd enters his first heat when he's 12, Katsuki can't help but grew some longing to scent him, sneaking a sniff here and there to catch Izuku's pheromone to himself, indulging on the short, sweet bliss. But Izuku right now is different, laid bare on his bed. Izuku has his stomach facing down while his nude back is full on display for Katsuki to see. His has his feet up, swinging back and forth in a slow motion, as if hypnotizing the blonde to come closer, to do something. His red pupils travel further up from the end of his heels to his thighs full of scattered freckles on it, and with a deep inhale, his ass, 
There, with a more abundant tiny, scattered freckles, arching upwards intentionally so the blonde can better see the running slick on the nerd's thighs, staining his bedsheets. Izuku's thighs are glistening with how much slick smeared on his skin. If Katsuki tilt his head a bit, his eyes might be able to peer on the boy's hole, probably aching and shivering right now, wet and warm, so so perfect for him to breathe. Taking a deep breath to calm his rapid beating heart, he swallows the lump in his throat, pushing down the heat growing at the pit of his stomach. His mind is clouded from the thought of his tongue, deep inside the Omega, wondering whether he'll taste just as sweet as his pheromone, taking all of the boy's slick, pushing his face deeper and deeper until his nose can't smell anything other than sweet mint cinnamon. Katsuki forces himself to tear his eyes away from the boy's backside. He doesn't need to see the growing tent inside his boxers because he can feel the painful ache as he tried his damn best to keep it in himself. The boy's bare back and shoulders also didn't make the spreading itch inside placid. Instead, it made him wanting more. K. Kaken. There, again, with the soft moan of his name, Katsuki began to focus on Izuku's face, dazed as he watched on how breathy the nerd's usual chipper's voice has become. The ends of his tone grew whiny, calling out to him to satiate his desire, their desires. Izuku has his face deep inside the mattress, digging his nails into his sheets, only his lidded hazy eyes and tuft of sweaty green hair can be seen. Even though his mouth has been muffled, but like a siren, Katsuki has been fully captivated by the boy. Katsuki wanted to know what euphonious sounds Izuku can make if Katsuki captured those lips with his. If his hands traced those freckles, as if he's tracing constellation. And deep inside him, his teeth clamping the boy's gland with fervor, popping his knot inside, filling him up so his needy omega can. Katsuki, are you up yet? A knock can be heard, waking Katsuki from his salacious dream. Reaching his hand underneath his blanket, the blonde can feel the stickiness inside his pants, staring at his ceiling for a long while until his rapid heartbeat calmed down. Got him nit. Not again. It's been so long he hasn't seen the nerd after his and Mindfuck's fight. It was stupid of him to fight for the right to court the Omega right in front of his family, especially Uncle Hasashi. The man is terrifying. And Katsuki often wonders on how he's still alive after all of the hogging and almost scenting Izuku throughout their childhood years. Not to mention Handjob. Izuku's older brother is more annoying than terrifying. But the older Alpha can wreck his and Mindfuck's shit if they do as much as sniffing Izuku's scent in front of him. It's going to be hell to please Hanjob and Uncle Hasashi but if he wants to take Izuku's hand in his, he must suck it up and prepare for the best. The hag had explained to him on what he has been feeling lately, giving some tips of her own on how to court Omega, which the old man refuted. He told Katsuki how his sire's tactics work because he's already head over heels for the hag, making everything she does has this rose-tinted filter on it. He's not sure on whose advice to take but being the best is the first step. Being a hero and defeat Hanjob is a part of that step. And the first thing in his agenda is to prepare himself for Yue. He'll do his damn best to become a hero and prove himself. No, Izuku whines, but Dodd. He gave his dad a pout, mixed with his wide doe eyes. I promised Kaken and Hachin to play together today. His dad gave a sigh. Baby, dad understands if you want to play with your friends but I can't handle those two being together. Then he gave Izuku a pointed glare, you know why. Feeling resigned, Izuku gave up talking to his dad. Going back to his room instead, okay, then. And he walked out his dad's office, taking a slow step towards his bedroom. Izuku clearly knows why his dad won't allow him to play together as much with his friends anymore. They're now 14, has already passed their first heat and his dad has always tried to separate them away after the incident. After Kaken and Heichin got their first ruts, his dad always told him to keep his distance with his two alpha friends and Izuku doesn't understand why. Both of them still the same, maybe a bit clingier. But they don't change much. But it seems their aggression towards each other has grew exponentially as they can't stop bickering and growling at each other whenever they got the chance. Most of the time, it's a friendly fight but others are just not so friendly. The incident his dad has talked about is when Izuku is nearing his heat and both of his friend began to do this weird staring thing with each other. Izuku swears their eyes glows and then they bared their teeth towards each other with similar rumble of growl at the back of their throat. Izuku doesn't understand what happened in between those seconds they're aggressively staring at each other. But the next second, these two began to lunge at each other and fought with every ounce of whatever their body can muster. Izuku is clearly panicked. He's used to the friendly taunts and teasing these two has thrown at one another. But now, they've actually became hostile with each other because of something Izuku himself doesn't know. Not only that, both his friend has been throwing punches and kicks right in the middle of his living room, where his family can see. He's panicking. His brother on the corner is recording and his father just took a sip of his tea from the dining room, watching what it seems to be a show for him. At least his mom actually helps and tried to mediate the situation. After that, Izuku got ushered upstairs, away from the hostile alphas and stayed in his room until his mom came in and told him that they both had been sent home. 
He doesn't know what kind of enmity his dad and brother have for his friends but when they have dinner later that night, both Alphas has been smiling in joy when dad got a call from Auntie Mitsuki and Uncle Aizawa Sensei one after the other. Auntie Mitsuki called first and after her call finished, Uncle Aizawa Sensei called right after. They profusely apologized for both Kakin and Heichen's attitude before, promising to teach their sons better in the future and ends it again with another round of apology. Well, I got concerned regarding their fight. It was aggressive and hostile that it terrifies Izuku. I hope your son won't visit for these few weeks. Let Izuku calm down for now. How does that sound? Izuku's eyes widen at his dad's proposition. He was terrified but he obviously calmed down and can hang out with his friends at the coming days. What does he mean not letting his friends visit? He used the same excuse and wording to both Auntie Mitsuki and Uncle Aizawa Sensei. What's worse, both agrees to his dad's proposition. After the call ends, Izuku began to complain. Dad, why can't Kaken and Hitchin play with me in the next few weeks? I obviously wasn't that scared like you described. Dad only gave him a smile. Baby, did you forget your heat is coming up? Dad only wants to make sure that these boys won't interrupt you on your heat. Though, he remembers about his heat, but then asked again. But after that, can I play with them again? His dad tried to mask his grimace, but Izuku can still capture the way his dad frowned. Yeah, of course. And that spans for a month now. He did call and chatted with his friends often but even after his heat ended. His dad still forbade him to hang out with Kakin or Hitchin and vehemently refuses Izuku to be in the same room with both alphas. He huffed in annoyance. At this point, his dad is just taking advantage of the situation and tried to separate Izuku from his friends for reasons he doesn't even know. Once he's inside his room, Izuku plops down on his bed, lazily stares at the piles of notebooks on the top of his desk. Years has passed now. The lessons and trainings hasn't decreased one bit and even though Izuku enjoys the feeling of successfully heal another patient, he can't help but to feel burnout. He wanted to tell his grandma or mom about this, but Izuku knew how much faith they have on him, believing he's some kind of miracle child, subconsciously made Izuku to push harder and harder at himself. He felt bad if they knew Izuku isn't as perfect as they thought him to be. The more pressure he faced, the more his interest as a healer dwindles. He still enjoys healing, of course, but the weight of it all just too much. And with all of these lesson plans, theories, study materials, trainings and so so much more, he felt like he suffocated inside his own body sometimes, confined underneath the expectations and weight of everyone's appraisal of him. The older he grew, the more he began to question a lot of things. He did promise himself that he'll be the best healer, but can he? The last severe injury he healed is Talia's burn and brain injury that helped him woke up earlier than estimated. But even then, he began to learn how much of a risk he can put Taoya through. The man, hero now, can die if Izuku thought of something different in the process of healing him. The seriousness of the situation hasn't dawned on him when he was younger, but it became more prevalent as time passed by. Patting his cheeks, Izuku began to sit up, taking his notebooks and began another round of study. He needs something to occupy his mind. He's born with a body meant to heal, a quirk perfect for helping and even his pheromone can help damaged glands. His parents have paved the way for him, his brother and friends are his biggest supporters. Everyone is watching him to grow as the next generation of healer, taking up his grandma's mantle when he's old enough. He shouldn't complain. He can't complain. Why should he? Everything is pristine. Everything is perfect. He should be grateful. He should. He. Should. Izuku sighed. Everything is easier when he was younger. Why change now? Why everything just suddenly overwhelms him? He needs his friends, but dad won't allow them to play with him. His brother is busy with his job. Just debuted as a hero not long ago so he doesn't have anyone to pass the time with. Uncle Yagi is now back being busy. After his lungs completely healed, Uncle Yagi immediately went back to work. Occasionally comes back for checkups and quick healing from his bruises and injuries from Kami knows where. Mom and grandma got busier after the new influx of patients that comes in, forcing them to stay at hospitals sometimes just for work. Dad is even more busy. Izuku has never been lonely. Always have at least someone around him to entertain him or help him pass the time. But when everyone has their own things to do, Izuku can't help but feel alone. Focus, his mind snapped. Izuku took a deep breath. Everyone can't revolve around him. Besides, Yua entrance exam is just months away. Izuku needs to focus more on his study so he can enter Yua considering he's entering as a hero student at front. But his own exams and tests will be different from actual hero students. His grandma has recounted her own experience when she's on her way to get her license and told him it's better to just get a hero license considering it's more applicable in any situation rather than a normal quirk use permit license for specific profession. When he knew using his quirk needs a permit, Izuku had cried back then, afraid how uncle or auntie police will come and arrest him for illegal quirk use but instead he's replied with a laughter from his family. His brother is the loudest. He didn't know his grandma has gave him a permit. 
The name of Recovery Girl's Apprentice wasn't just some title to make him sounds cooler, but it's an actual title for him years ago until now. No one has ever told him about this simple information and common sense and Izuku began to fear on what else he has missed throughout his life. Will he survive high school? He never went to any school before. He never has any classmates of his age. Never have any friends beside Kakin and Hitchin. Never do any of those outings. Or trip to the mall or arcades or more things he began to realize he missed. Will his Yua classmates be nice? Or will they hate him? But Izuku has never encountered any blatant hatred before. How can he respond to it? What should he say? Kami, there's a lot of questions that he wouldn't have any answers to. All he can do is to just do his best. He misses Kakin and Hitchin. Dad, I think I have a problem. Shouta took a second to place his mug down and turns around to meet his son's eyes. What is it? Toshi, I think I have heart problems. His husband, who's sitting at the couch, choked on his drink, coughing as he huffed out a wheeze which turns into a booming laughter. Toshi doesn't look appeased one bit. Dad, pops, it's a serious matter. I can die. Thank whatever gods he believed in that he trained his poker face to perfection. He knew damn well how healthy everyone in his family are. Well except him and Toshi's excessive coffee addiction. Other than that, everyone under this household have regular checkups and every result has shown them to be healthy. If his son actually has a heart problem, Shouta will eat his left foot. Why do you think you have heart problems, Tosh? Just out of fatherly care, Shouta decided to entertain his kid. His face scrunched up. Like, at random times, my heart just beats rapidly. Like so fast I think it's going to burst out of my ribcage. And it feels. Hot. I don't know how to describe it but it just feels that way whenever. I'm thinking about Izuku. You're thinking about Izuku. Both father and son said in unison. Hitoshi seemed as if he gained something new. His face just shows he began to realize some things in his head. Wait, hold on. Am I allergic to Izuku? His ashes laughter has accompanied their brain damaging conversation like a background music. Once they're, usually smart, Sun began to ask another idiotic question. Leaning back on the counter, Shouta listened to his husband laughter getting louder. He just stares at his kid, having a crisis in the middle of the kitchen, afraid as he might have some kind of allergy towards his own crush. Why did you suddenly ask this? Really? Shouta wanted to know why Toshi hasn't realized his growing crush on the greenette. Well, he muttered. After being banned from seeing Izuku, I started to think about a lot of things. And it's related to him. Yeah, but every time it happens, I have this weird feeling sometimes. Same thing happened when I fought with Sewer Kid. I didn't know what I'm possessed with but, my instinct told me to fight until he's gone. Not dead, but just, gone. Shouta closed his eyes as he began to listen to his kid narrating the whole feeling of him getting possessive over his not-boyfriend. Fighting with Izuku's another not-boyfriend for a duel. He can't believe his son has been so blind regarding this aspect. Maybe taking a day off and spend his time teaching his kid the basics of courting and potential mate would be beneficial in the future. Welcome back dear. Hisashi greets his wife, watching her taking off her shoes and cardigan. It's his rare day off, free from any work, and he wanted to spend it with Inko. Though, when he didn't see any familiar bush green hair, Hisashi immediately sit up straight. Where's Izuku? He asked as Inko walked towards the living room, sitting next to him on the pure white sofa. She only gives him a small smile, snuggling closer to his side that Hisashi subconsciously hugged her into his embrace. She leaned her head to his shoulder. He said he wanted to be dropped off at Hitoshi's house today. Oh, he wanted to be dropped of Hitoshi. He shouted in disbelief. Why did you drop him off at that kid's place? Inko made a low shushing voice, patting her husband's chest. Oh don't be such a spoil sport. Izuku is already a teenager, dear. Let him have his freedom. Hisashi only huffed. Leaning back on the sofa, oh, I don't mind him to have fun and all, it's just, why it must be those two alphas. I can buy a whole island for him to spend his weekend off if it means to stay away from those, those. Kid Stealer. Inko burst out laughing, amused at her husband's irritation towards Izuku's friends. Kid Stealer. Dear, I'm pretty sure that's not a word. Once she calmed down, Inko peers at her husband's face. And besides, both of them are good kids, you've already known them for years now. I know what you're thinking, but Izuku is already grown up now. Let him have this. Inko saw how her husband's face softened. She continued. Besides, Izuku will have his own life in the future. We're just his parents, dear. We can't control his life. I'm also sure he needs this break. I can see his interest in healing dwindles now. He used to be so eager. But it seems that we're too hard on his education. Mentions of Izuku's childhood made her frown. Her boy has unlimited potential as a healer. And she knew he'll be an exceptional one. But whenever he saw Izuku sit on his desk, cramming every book she and her mother gave, Inko felt a pang of heartache. When other kids are laughing and playing, Izuku is alone in his room with his head down to medical books. When other kids went to school and make new friends, Izuku is stuck by her and her mother's side, watching them handle patients at the hospital alongside first-year residents. Maybe that's why she has been so lax on her son's social life. 
Her husband also seemed to think the same way as her. He sighed, fine. But those kids aren't getting out from my watch list anytime soon. If they want to pursue Izuku in the future, they must get through me first. Binko only chuckled, but her husband added with Schadenfreude, and then Tenko. I know for a fact our son is waiting for a showdown with Bakugu Kid for years now. The mention of her eldest son places a soft smile on her face. It's already been so long but he seems to never live that grudge down. She remembers how Tenko kept grumbling about paying back the bite from when they were young. I can bet you, if they do have a brawl with each other, Tenko will try to bite Katsuki down. I'm betting the face. Oh really? I think Tenko is more mature than that. I'm sure he'll beat Katsuki in a fair fight. The atmosphere slowly turned lighter, and soon, their topic changed. Both of them just sat there, on the couch as they enjoy the warmth of one another. You're sure that your dad won't be mad? Hitchin asked in concern. Izuku simply shook his head. Giving the two alphas his brightest smile, I asked mom to talk with him. I can assure you, dad will approve anything mom says. He even gave a thumbs up to support his statement. Kakin and Hachin just raised their eyebrow. The latter shrugged, all right, if you say so. And with that, the trio went together to their usual training space, which is a personal training studio his brother and Taoya uses. Izuku always marvels the range and varieties of equipment inside the studio, plus they have snack bar in the rest area. Izuku has already brought his backpack with stuff he'll probably need to follow his friends to train. Not forgetting to prepare a thermos filled with coffee his dad usually drinks for Hitchin after his training. Something about Saivet coffee. And Izuku doesn't forget to prepare a bag of those coffee beans for Hitchin and his family. Though, he doesn't usually stay to watch Kakin and Hitchin train. Only appears once they finish to give them a quick heal, but he earned this free day off, so he'll use it to spend with his friends, even if it's just sitting and watching in silence. Once they enter the place, Izuku immediately sits on a comfy spot, began to watch both of his friends to spar. Izuku knew nothing about fights and stuff like such, but he enjoys the fluid movements Hitchin does using his legs to attack Kakin, the way Kakin strikes his punches towards Hitchin and how both evade and defend themselves. The way they strike and kick are clean and calculated, similar to how he watched some more physical heroes fight during a battle. Izuku also notices on how Heichin places more emphasis on his legs as a method of attack and defend while Kakin mostly uses his hands. Not sure whether it's due to their preference or something else, but it still awes Izuku with their show of strength. He wonders whether he can also fight like they do, but a quick glance at his flimsy arms and legs made him to curb the thought. Many has told Izuku on how he's too delicate for rough exercise like alphas do and they're not wrong. Izuku will probably get beaten a lot if he tried to spar like Kakin or Hitchin. Imagining the pain of his body falling head first made him wince. Focusing back to his friends, they usually spar for about a few minutes, but Izuku doesn't know why. Both alphas has been fighting for half an hour now, to the point their pheromone is leaking. Heavy caramel mixed with fresh citrus made the Omega's head heavy. Izuku tried to cover his nose and tries to block the scents, spraying pheromone blocker he brought when things like this happen. It's not the first time Izuku smell their pheromone. In fact, he can always smell the caramel on Kakin and citrus on Hitch and even without him deliberately sniff the air. But his mom always warns him regarding inhaling Alpha's pheromone where it can lead to early heat or something similar to that. Izuku has kept everything in mind, but he doesn't think sniffing Kakin or Hitch in once or twice can do any harm. He really enjoys the warmth of Kakin's scent gives him and the fresh calming scent Hitch and made him feel. The thought of having their scent permanently sticks to him has always make him feel giddy inside. Once he snaps out of his daze, Izuku saw Kakin approaching him. Sweat has glistened his skin and the sweet syrupy scent is getting heavier with each step Kakin takes. Once he's close enough, Izuku immediately sprays scent blockers on his friend, which make Kakin hiss. The fuck, nerd. Izuku only giggles, handing the prepared clean towel he has in his bag. Your pheromone is everywhere, I feel like I'm going to drown in sugar. Kakin's motion of wiping his face stopped. Huh. He gave Izuku a glance, do you like it? Like what? Your scent? Izuku asked while he motioned Kakin to sit down next to him, I like it. Reminds me of my favorite candy. Izuku murmured his answer to the unsaid question. The blonde doesn't answer, but instead kept silent as he sits next to Izuku and hands out his arm. After taking out his grapeseed oil, Izuku began to pour a good amount on his palm and began to do the familiar motion of massaging Kakin's outstretched arm. He didn't really expect his little massage hobby became a frequent thing after he practices on both alphas. It started out as a mere curiosity, but then Izuku learned the benefits of massage and he tries to incorporate that occasionally after every spar session. Kakin mainly prefers a massage on his upper body, while Heichin prefers on his legs and back. Izuku's kiss can help their sore muscle, but he doesn't want to solely depend on his quirk to solve problems and decided to do more hands-on learning. Izuku can feel every sore muscles began to grow relaxed with each pressure he placed on the toned arm. 
There's a good amount of bruises too and Izuku decided to give a quick kiss after he's done. Though, Izuku cuts off the comfortable silence and asked, Where's Heichin? Said he wanted to train more, he'll come later. Came Kakin's gruff reply. Izuku only hums in reply. A bit concerned for these two's excessive training schedules. You really need to stop pushing yourself like this you know. Izuku murmured. Gently held the blonde's arm. Aiming for number one is great and all, but you won't reach the top if you kept overworking yourself. His voice is soft, cocooning over Kakin like a warm breeze of spring, subconsciously. The blonde tense muscle relaxed under Izuku's touch. Once he's done with one arm, Izuku stood up to sit on the other side and began to massage Kakin's left arm. From what I've learned, you weren't supposed to spar that long, it can harm your body. If Aizawa sensei is here, he'll probably lecture you too about safety and something about limits. He continued to nag his friend with concern in his eyes. Don't be so reckless next time. He huffs with a smile. I won't always be there to heal you, you know. A few seconds passed and Izuku can hear Kakin asked. But you'll be there, right? His hands paused, confused. HM. Beware. By my side. You'll be there when I'm aiming for number one, right? Izuku saw Kakin's face in a deep scowl. Looked like he would blow up if Izuku disagree. His voice tight, as if the question itself is a forbidden word for him to say. Izuku only chuckled, of course I will. He detached his palm from Kakin's arm. Finished with his simple message for today, I'll always be your biggest supporter. The air seems to stagnate as Kakin sat there with his eyes locked to him. Well, this feels awkward. Izuku thought Kakin will keep staring at him like this until he huffs. When Kakin's gaze turned away from him, Izuku began to steer the topic somewhere else. Kakin has been a bit agitated these days, Izuku noted. His face has that bright flush, an indicator that he's either mad or sick. It's usually mad, though, so Izuku doesn't want to irritate the other even more. His face also have that semi-permanent scowl most of the time. Izuku once joked on how his face will be stuck like that but Kakin only frowned even further. Izuku really misses this. Even if they only laid on the mat together, staring at the ceiling in silence, Izuku is content. There are so many things he wanted to say to both Kakin and Hitchin and he also wanted to hear everything they did while he was away. Izuku doesn't know when their mere presence become his comfort, but he won't complain, enjoying the time together when they can. Though, whatever moment they were having got interrupted by a message notification on Kakin's phone. Izuku peeked, showing Auntie Mitsuki's text for Kakin to head back home. The blonde also saw it and huffed in annoyance. He began to pack his stuff inside his bag while Izuku watches. You got anyone to pick you up? Izuku nodded. I can call Uncle Driver later. I'm going to stay for a while to wait for Heichin. He said as Kakin hauled his bag and nodded, waving him goodbye as he walked towards the door. Izuku stares at Kakin's back, feeling as if he's forgetting something and then it clicks. He stood up, running towards the blonde, Kakin. Then the other stopped on the doorway, turning around to meet Izuku's eyes. You forgot something. Kakin only frowned, wanting to question him but Izuku cuts him off with a quick peck on his cheek. He made sure to let his quirk activates, sending warm flow through his body and ends at his lips. The previously visible bruises immediately healed, giving Izuku a sense of satisfaction. He pats the blonde's arm, ushering him out, all right, there, though, Kakin didn't wait for another second and bolted out the room, not even turning back to say another final goodbye. Watching the gradually disappearing figure, Izuku turns back inside and began to search for his purple friend. Hitoshi kicked and threw blow after blow towards the puncing bag with so much force that all he can hear is the sound of his fist hitting the leather. He began to channel his frustration towards his fist, unconsciously letting his pheromone to leak. Hitchin, a soft voice called out to him, stopping Hitoshi in his venting mode. He huffed, slicked his sweaty hair back and turned his attention towards the source of the voice. Izuku stood there, a few feet away and is holding a clean towel. Izuku gave a small smile, took a slow step towards him and began to dab his face that soaked with sweat. You should tone it down a bit, Hitchin. You can hurt yourself in the future. Itoshi can feel his brain blue screens and his body stiffen. It's not the first time for Izuku to help him like this and he even occasionally massage plus kiss him for healing. A little wiping motion shouldn't be a big deal. But here he is, standing shell-shocked and gulped at their close proximity together. Is Izuku aware on how his pheromone wafting towards Hitoshi? What should he do now? Does he talk? Keep staring. Wait, no, no that sounds like a creep. Okay well, talk it is. He'll talk. He can talk. He can open his mouth and say something. But it's not enough. Fuck. Great way to reply there. Bravo. Not enough for what? For you. But he obviously can't say that. To beat Katsuki. I'm not strong enough. Why do you want to be strong to beat Kaken? Izuku stares up at him, bewildered. The way his lips pouts and cheeks scrunch up made him coo at the sight, well internally at least. Itoshi didn't even realize how small the other is compared to him. 
He doesn't answer, knowing his answer isn't suitable to say to Izuku, just because. Izuku only stares at him, eyes wide like the purest emerald gemstone. But you're already strong in my opinion. He huffed, backing away and lifted his arms, flailing his fists around. You're like pow and bam. And when you do that kick thingy, it was so awesome. I wish I can do it like you. Itoshi laughed, watching Izuku poorly mimicked his fight stance to prove his point. Even with such childish consolation, Hitoshi's heart warms watching Izuku trying to cheer him up. Well, don't be sad, okay. Hitoshi hums, nodded at Izuku's request. I bought that premium coffee yesterday, for you. He whispers, leaning close to his ears. Even though he felt like the fights and his skill aren't enough sometime. Hitoshi is glad that there's people that believes in him and supports him to be a hero. All right, great. Izuku beams, but then he seems to realize something. Oh, but don't drink too much coffee, though. It can be bad for your health. Itoshi chuckled. Of course, don't want me to die young, huh? A cheeky grin appeared on the Omega's face. Yeah, and no one will pay for my katsudan addiction. Right. Hitoshi gave an exaggerated sigh. Fake a pained expression on his face. You'll only remember me when it comes to food. Oh don't be like that Heichin. I'll love you even if you have no money to buy me food. Izuku laughed, not knowing what kind of damage his words did to Hitoshi's heart. Feeling the warmth crept up to his cheeks, Hitoshi gulped. Even though he knew Izuku doesn't mean it that way. But knowing Izuku loving him has made his body heats up, as if standing on a flaming magma. Okay, okay, he coughs, pretending to clear his throat. Uh, where's the coffee again? With his not-so-smooth topic change, Izuku's attention got drawn away and began to lead him to the bench where their stuff is at, giving him a warm thermos and began to ramble about the origin of this coffee. While holding the thermos, Hitoshi realized on how Izuku had packed up a bag of roasted civet coffee beans for him and his family. He stares the bag in daze, whispers, marry me. What? Did you say something? Hitoshi didn't realize he has spoken his thoughts out loud, interrupting Izuku mid-ramble. Nothing, you can continue. What happened with the process again? Once Izuku's attention got distracted, Hitoshi breathed a sigh in relief, absent-mindedly gazes Izuku's face, memorizing the freckles scattered on his face. After the last stunt Izuku pulled, his parents promised him that he can hang out with his friends or Uncle Yagi if he finishes his training for the day. Unlucky for him, Yue is closed considering that it's holidays, but luckily for him, his mom gained access for him to follow a bunch of med students around while they're also working. If it weren't for his Yue entrance exam, Izuku might also have a holiday like he used to. He's a bit embarrassed to be the youngest healer in training, sticking out like a sore thumb. Not only that, when everyone is working hard, doing their rounds and shifts until midnight, Izuku is the only one that has scheduled time for him to arrive and go home. Thankfully, the others seem to understand that he's only there for trainings and he's mostly there for observation at examinations, diagnosis and treatments for specific patients. Izuku tries to be as silent as he can, writing everything he deems important in notes and then consult it to the doctors once they're outside of work. But when someone needed his healing, Izuku won't hesitate to lend a helping hand. Under the adult's supervision of course, soon enough, it become a habit. He'll start his day by wishing to have a day off playing or just doing nothing with Kaken and Hitchin. But then the training starts and he began to busy himself to stop the thoughts of rest in his mind until it's time for him to go. After that, he'll spend the rest of his days just hanging out with his friends or Uncle Yagi as promised. Either watching the two spar in the gym, playing games together in Kaken's home. Burning down Uncle Mike's kitchen, hanging out and gawking at Uncle Yaga's latest merch, or just anything that Izuku enjoys doing. Right now, Izuku and his two friends plan to go to the mall and then they'll have a sleepover at his house. Well, what a shocker. Izuku is allowed to have sleepovers now. He mentioned it as a joke, wanting to have a sleepover to make pillow forts out maybe pillow fights or manicure and pedicure like those western girls in movies do. They made sleepovers look so much fun and Izuku wanted to try having that. Though, he's also prepared for disappointment considering how strict his dad can be. But to his surprise, his dad actually agrees with a ton of requirements. But he agrees nonetheless. Having his mom to talk with dad is the most effective tactic to have his way. Maybe he should try using his puppy dog eyes or whatever his brother calls it directly to dad. He wonders whether he can get Scott free for things like this too. He wanted to try to push his dad's buttons a little by having a sleepover with Uncle Yagi at Mike Tower. But his dad vehemently refused. Izuku soon learnt that any activities related to being alone with Uncle Yagi isn't allowed. Izuku kinds of understands it a bit. The man has been coming in and out the hospital for months now, sporting wounds and bruises no secretary should have, especially All Might's secretary. His dad might be afraid that the dangers Uncle Yagi has regarding his job can harm him too, so he doesn't allow Izuku spends most of his time alone with the man. He got a bit suspicious regarding the bruises and wounds but his grandma, his parents and even Uncle Yagi himself has assured him that it's nothing so Izuku can only trust their words for it. Right now, Izuku is preparing to pack his stuff and head out. 
sitting inside the break room. Izuku packed his scrubs before a bunch of people came in. Oh, hey Midoriya-kun, you're heading back. One of them greets Izuku. He smiles and greets the other back. Yeah, I've called my brother, so he'll be here soon. The break room soon filled with chatter of various people, seems to have finished another tiring shift, even though it's still midday. But even with all these noises, Izuku caught someone said, must be nice to have daddy's money, huh? And Izuku might not be the only one to hear that, because the break room fell into silence. All eyes have turned towards the speaker, a young Omega girl with short black hair, leaning against the counter as she holds a cup of her own drink. She also notices the attention, but instead of feeling shame, she grits out, what? Am I wrong? He's able to come in and go from this place as he pleases, treating our job like it's some kind of playground. Izuku has never seen or interacted with the girl before, but the accusation she has thrown him left a deep ache inside. Before Izuku can even retort, an older Omega man spoke up for him, Yuri, Midoriya kun is not here for work, he's here for training, and he's not harming anyone. MHM. Besides, he's still a kid, an aspiring healer to be. We've always got some batches of exceptional reasons here and there. You're still new here, so it might be a bit weird for you. The girl, Yuri, is stubborn. What do you mean by exceptional? Are you saying he's here because he has special treatment then? Izuku saw the faces of other doctors and nurses lounging. The older ones held a grim expression, staring at Yuri while the younger ones had bewilderment etched in their faces. Izuku on the other hand, felt curious. He wanted to know what that means by exceptional reasons. You seriously don't know exceptional reasons. We've learned this on our first year in med school. One pipes up, shocked to know Yuri has glossed over the basics of their study. Another also muttered loud enough for others to hear. What were you doing when Professor Tamaki covers this lesson? Drawing an eye, Yuri seemed embarrassed at others' mockery of her. The previous Omega man continued. I'm not sure how you passed your exams and went this far, but exceptional reasons means that hospitals and clinics accept young healers to be to train. Not similar to residency or for work purposes, but to purely train with their own modified schedule to match normal schooling hours. Usually, those who's going to be an aspiring healers to be are called hero healers. Considering most programs or education their learning pushed them to work in field with heroes. He took a sip of his water, not similar to us, if you're wondering. All exceptional batches have been scouted by government institutions early in age. They mostly take in kids that have strong healing quirk, but more preferably if they're also an Omega. The feeling of enlightenment dawns on Izuku. He held his bag closer, pondering over this new information. He tilts his head as he listens to the man talking. The reason why he can come and go as he pleases, the man gave an air quote to that, is because his training is the equivalent of school. Just like how you learnt social studies or mathematics when you're in middle school, he learns microbiology and pathology. So obviously, you can't compare your work hour with kids that are still learning. Also, having minors to do pseudo work in healthcare industry is already bad enough but having them to work at odd hours will cause a riot. It happened before. Go search it up. An older woman, he remembers her as Miss Akira, added. The education and hospital board also made their time more flexible because they're still kids, Yuri. By the time they graduate high school, they immediately get scouted and work to the heroes of their choosing. Midoriya Kun, did you get scouted when you're young? Someone asked. Izuku hastily nodded, remembering how his grandma and mom has been harassed by HPSC officials when he was younger. He hummed, but are you joining any programs that they have? And Izuku answered no to that. I'm training under my grandma's mantle. Izuku felt a bit awkward being bombarded with questions like this. Darting his eyes towards the door, he gripped his phone tighter in his hand, giving a small smile and excused himself. Sorry, my brother is waiting outside now. I'll answer everything tomorrow. He made his way to the door and began to dash off, hoping no one will follow him out but to no avail. Someone shouts his name, Midoriya Kun. Wait. He stopped on his heels and turned around to meet his eyes on Miss Akira, running towards him. She gave a kind smile, handing his water bottle that he left behind. He murmured his thanks and was about to walk away before the woman offered to walk him outside. Izuku can't muster any rejection and the woman seemed kind enough, so he nodded. The hallways aren't crowded. With sunlight pours in through the windows, Izuku felt comfortable even in the silence. So, who are you going to work with in the future? Miss Akira asked, gentle as if she doesn't want to break the atmosphere in the quiet midday. Huh, the hero. You're aiming to be a hero healer, right? Izuku blinks, realized on what she's asking about. Oh, um, he mulled over the question until they reached outside the hospital, feeling the warm breeze caress his skin, I'm not sure, was his reply. The woman's smile faltered a bit. Both of them are now standing outside the entrance, with Izuku motioning her to sit on the nearest bench under the shades. Once they're seated, she peers into Izuku's eyes. You haven't thought of who you wanted to work with. Not having a concrete answer to that, Izuku only vaguely replied, Yeah, too many amazing heroes to choose from. I'm sure there are. 
But once you get to choose a hero, choose wisely. The words piqued Izuku's interest now. Oh, why is that? Under the shade, Izuku saw the way her smile reappears. Though she doesn't seem happy, some heroes aren't. Heroic in private. There's a reason why we have the idiom to never meet your hero. But I'm sure you'll land up with a great one. You're a great healer from every of your trainings, from what I can see and from how the other described you. She lets out a small chuckle. Izuku felt a blush crept up to his cheeks from the praise. Oh, thank you, I don't. I'm not sure if I can be a great healer. Are you saying those kids lied? Or are you saying that I'm blind? She raises her eyebrow, a smirk and amusement plastered on her face. Wah, oh, no no, I never meant that. Her chuckle cuts him off. I'm sure that's not what you meant. A look of understanding flashes in her eyes. What you mean is that you're unsure if this is what you want? Right. How? How did you know? I've seen that look, pumpkin. Doubting yourself whether you'll do great in the field you're in. It's normal. Everyone has been through that phase. Once, twice, thrice but I'm confident they have and will find their path in life. Miss Akira points her finger towards Izuku. And I'm sure you will too. You'll find your own path in the future. Whether you'll be a healer or not, you'll do just as great. Izuku frowns at that, but I'm meant to be a healer. Everyone also can see that he'll be a healer. Her brows furrowed, narrowing her eyes as she stares at Izuku. Is that what other people has been telling you? She continues without waiting for his answer. No one is meant to be anything. Other people's words and expectations doesn't dictate on who you'll be. You're the one that dictates on who you'll be. Leaning back on the bench, she breathes out. Everything is a part of the process. Enjoy it while you're still young. Izuku doesn't answer her, and maybe, she also doesn't need him to reply. Sitting in a comfortable silence under the sun as they both wait for Izuku's brother to pick him up. You kind of reminded me of my sister, she spoke up again, mostly talking to herself, though, she's a beta but she had strong healing quirk, plus your enthusiasm to learn. The way you jot down everything into your little notebooks, and your millions of questions, chuckling. Her eyes grew distant in memory. You're quite similar that it freaked me out when I met you. She sounds great. Is she aiming for a hero healer? Izuku placed his bag on his lap, hugging it close. Yep, she was a hero healer. A great one in my opinion. Though, was, averting his eyes. Izuku sends his consolation. I'm sorry. A bit short but that's all he can utters out in the moment. Her figure relaxed from the previous tension. Laughing as she tries to ease the atmosphere. Aw, oh, no need of that. She was a great person and I'm sure she'll give you the same pep talk like I did. I'm giving you one because of her, to be honest. You're a great kid Midoriya. Izuku also chuckles along. Saw his brother's car from the corner of his eyes and bid his goodbye to the woman. Thank you for today. Is there any way to repay you? She stood up, brushing off the fallen leaves and shook her head. Nah, just gave you the words she gave me. Take it as an advice, kid. You can also forget it if you want. It's up you. As he watches the woman leave, Izuku shouts, I'll remember it. Thank you. Her thumbs up is the reply Izuku needed to know that she heard him. He smiled, turning around and approached his brother's car, humming a nameless tune as he walked. Once he's already in and buckled, Izuku beamed at his brother. Tenko has been busy these days, running around Japan after his debut as a hero. His brother only flicked his nose and started the car, driving towards their next destination. You got everything? His brother asked. Tenko can be a bit nagging sometimes but Izuku doesn't mind. Nodding for NTH times, Izuku huffed out. I got everything. I have my phone, charger, notebook, and money so you can go now. He tried to push his brother away, towards his car. But dad told me to look after you. He gave me a bunch of cash too. And mom gave me dad's credit card. I think I'll be fine brother. He stares at his brother, narrowing his eyes hoping the other will take the hint and go away. Tenko also stares back. Both started a staring contest in front of the mall but his brother eventually gave up, sighing as he raises his hand up in defeat. All right, all right. I won't follow you around. But if something happened, call me. Or mom. Or dad. Or two. Okay, okay. I get it. I'll call you when we're done. Izuku waved goodbye as he turns and went towards his meeting place with his friends. He knew his brother isn't going to back down and is probably tailing him right now, but at least he's being discreet. The mall is crowded. Izuku has never went to such crowded place before but thankfully, Kaken and Heichen made their presence easier to find. The three has promised to meet up at the fountain in the middle of the mall, a huge one that can immediately be seen once he enters the mall. And right near the fountain, Izuku finds a blob of purple and blonde. Kaken, Hitchin. He laughed as he tackles both alphas into a hug. But to his utter disappointment, the two didn't even tumble or fall, instead they caught him in ease. How's your day? Hitchin asked first, gently took the bag he's holding and wore it on himself, while Kaken smoothed out the tangled curls in his hair. The three of them began to walk around the mall, matching his footsteps. It's great, but we're not here to talk about my trainings. Izuku began to ramble as they walked. We're here to buy something right. I've never been to a crowded mall before, so both of you will have to lead the way. Oh, can we buy ice cream on our way? 
Or are you guys wanted to visit the stores? What are we even buying today? I done. Calm down, nerd. You'll suffocate if you kept rambling like that, dumbass. Kakin grumbled. And we're buying ingredients for us to cook later. To cook. You'll cook. Where? Hachin took his arm and jerked him away. So he won't hit the oncoming pole? Watch where you're going Zoo. Izuku squeaked as he fell onto Hitchin's body but manages to get back on his feet once again. Hitchin continues, and we're cooking anything, it's just sleepover fun, go crazy. You can make your favorite food, or bake a cake. Heck I'll still be down if we make weird potions too. I think Sewer Kid asked your mom for permission to use the kitchen. Who the fuck you're calling Sewer Kid? Eye bags. Oh, that's nice. I think we have a spare kitchen on the second floor. We can use that one. Both Izuku and Hachin ignored the fuming blonde, laughing as Kakin seemed to explode in rage the more Hachin ignores him. Say that again your D-E-A-D-M-E-A-T. Sewer kid, you son of a, Izuku cups Kakin's mouth and attempt to silence the boy. Like a miracle, Kakin calms down in mere seconds but his eyes still glaring at Hachin as if he'll pounce the next second. Hachin, I think you should stop antagonizing him. Kakin, you need to stay quiet. People are staring at us weird right now. And true to his words, the passing people has been staring at their ruckus. All right, I won't antagonize Bakugu. Hitchin agrees amicably as Kakin grunted in reply. Good. Great. Izuku slowly lets go of his hand, smiling at both boys who's staring at each other. Hitchin has a smirk on his face, while Kakin is giving him the stink eye, be nice. But for the record, even if my parents are bitches, Izuku can feel the dread pooling in his gut. At least I'm not the one that got picked up from the sewers. Izuku saw the fury inside Kakin's eyes. His teeth gritted as he seethes. You better start running. The threat sounds ominous even inside the crowded mall. And Hitchin did run. Hitchin ran while he's laughing in glee. Kakin is following right behind, chasing the other as if the purple-haired boy has some kind of debt to pay. Izuku sighs in disbelief. All right, so we're making katsudon, spicy curry and a normal chicken curry. Izuku hums as he checks all the ingredients stated in his phone. He looks up to ask his two friends in front of him. Now wearing those kid leash Izuku hastily bought at the nearest store to keep them in check. He's a bit surprised to know kid safety leash existed. Even more so when there's a size that fits robust teens like these two alpha. Well, to be fair, the one Izuku bought are for mutant kids, because they're purposefully made bigger to match any size of kids with animalistic traits. Nah, I'm good. Heichin answered first. He still has Izuku's backpack on his back, seemed to be proud to be leashed like a wayward child. Whatever, came Kakin's reply. He sulked as he crossed his arm on his chest, rightfully ashamed of his own decision that made him leashed. Great, don't run around like that okay, I can't catch up. Izuku hardened the grip of the leash on his waist and beamed, All right lead the way. Spending his time with Kakin and Hitchin has always puts him at ease. Somehow all of his worry regarding himself, his future and problems dissolves away the moment he caught a whiff of their scent. He saw their eyes on him, their voices. If both of these alphas are akin to drugs that can make him forget all of his problems, then Izuku can consider getting addicted. Though, he might already be addicted with how frequent he runs towards them the moment he can detach himself from reality. Sighing, he shook away the thought and smiles at the present, watching both alphas playfully bicker with each other. Kakin, Hitchin. He calls out to both alphas, attracting their attention. Izuku then shows them the shirt he wanted to buy. Look at this, he whispers, I want this. Nerd, this is a t-shirt that has the word sweater on it. It's perfect. Whispering, Izuku stares starry-eyed at the shirt. Hitchin also supports him, buy it. And look, they got shorts with the word pants. Don't fucking encourage him, dipshit. What? It's funny. Hell no. It's fashion atrocity. Izuku steeled his will, picking up a bunch of similar shirt and shorts, I'm going to buy it. He ran towards the counter as Kakin tried to drag him away both using his hands and the leash but Hachin dragged him towards the counter. No, yes. After the trip to the mall, the trio went back to Izuku's home for their sleepover. The moment they stepped into the living room, Izuku found both of his brother and dad waiting for them. His dad stares down at both of his friends, Katsuki, Hitoshi. Come with me, I have a word for both of you. He doesn't wait for their answers and left. Izuku nudged his friends, taking the grocery and shopping bags from their grip and motioned to them to follow his dad. They stood still for a while, but their stiff body began to follow the housekeeper that's ready to escort them. Izuku greets his brother, watching him laugh and chuckle to whatever he's occupied with in his phone. He peeped a bit, saw his brother chatting with someone, what's so funny? He tapped Tenko's shoulder, curious on what made his stoic brother amused. Izuku reads some of the conversation and apparently, Tenko is a part of the family group chat. For some reason, family group chat means his parents, the Bakugas and Hitchin's parents. Izuku still doesn't understand on how these adults became friends so quickly. Just sent photos of their kids getting leashed. He laughed as he frantically types a response. Auntie Mitsuki approved it, and Aizawa-sensei just sent okay. Is that a good thing? 
If you can get this man to respond to you, then it's a fantastic thing. Izuku sighed in relief. He was about to stay a bit longer until he remembers the grocery bag he left on the floor. Oh, shoot. He began to grab the bag, only realizing on how heavy each bag is and huffed out in frustration. Need some help. His brother saw his struggle with the bag and immediately stood up to grab all the things and carried it up in ease. Izuku hasn't even responded but at least one problem is solved now. I'll bring the groceries to the kitchen. The maids will bring the others to your room. His brother called the nearby maids to come over and let them take the shopping bags to his room. After they're gone, Izuku and his brother walked side by side towards the second floor kitchen. On their way, Izuku felt a bit curious on what his dad wanted to talk about with his friends. So he asked his brother, Do you know why dad called Kakin and Heichin to talk? His brother only shrugged, MM, dunno, probably some alpha stuff. Alpha stuff. What alpha stuff? Dot 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 just, you know, alpha stuff. Izuku gave his brother a deadpan stare. Thanks, that helps me a lot. Tenko only chuckled in response, changing the subject. Why did you even buy these? Can you even cook? I'm not the one cooking, Kakin and Heichin are. They wanted to have sleepover fun with cooking. Izuku said as they walked through the hallways. HM, sounds fun. They arrive towards the kitchen and his brother dumps all of the food on the kitchen counter, sighing at the amount of stuff they bought. Izuku took out all of the ingredients with his brother when Tenko suddenly stops, mind if I join? He asked with a grin. Izuku knows that smile. He saw it on TV every time his brother pulled a stunt against villains, or doing something utterly stupid. He questioned, I thought you want to spend the night in the game room. What happened to that plan? Izuku knows why. To be honest, he doesn't need to ask. His brother seems to have an enmity with his friends. The most obvious one is Kakin, with how both would holler insults at each other. But Izuku also knows how his brother held a grudge against Heichin for being better than him in games. It's so stupid. Just want to see Sewer Kid and Eyebags for a while. Been so long since I last saw them. When was it? The fight. His brother pretended to be confused. Izuku paid him no mind and continued to arrange the newly bought ingredients. Seriously. For years, Izuku thought his brother knew better than to antagonize Kakin. He knew the blonde is more prone to anger but his brother seems to enjoy messing with the alpha. Hitchin also follows suit with the name-calling thing. Izuku just shook his head. Dumb alphas, all of them. A while later, Kakin and Hitchin also came in, looking pale as if they saw something terrifying. How's the talk? Izuku tried to pry. He sat on the nearest seat, watching both Kakin and Hitchin prepare the food. His brother also standing nearby, smirking. Nothing much, Hitchin answers, just told us some things, no need to worry. Izuku pouted. His brother won't tell him. His friends also kept it a secret from him. Izuku felt a bit frustrated, but he lets go. Maybe. It's a really secret thing, he thought, focusing on both of his friends cooking dinner. By the way, I saw some rooms labeled mutants, non-biological, and humans. What's up with that? Hitchin asked, changing the subject. Izuku's attention shifted, beaming when he remembers those rooms. Oh, they're there to place all of my anatomical models. Your anatomical models. Oh, okay. But why you need a room for it? His brother chimed in, you wanna see? I can take you there. Izuku sighs. Tenko probably want to scare his friends inside that room. Kakin paused. I don't trust your lying ass. Bet there's some creepy ass shit in there. He glanced towards Izuku. In Izuku's opinion, he doesn't think whatever he places in there is creepy. But for years, his brother and brother Taoya always get spooked whenever they came into the room. So maybe, for others, it might be a bit creepy. Hmm, not sure if it's creepy, but I need a whole room because those anatomical models are life-sized. Both of his friends stopped whatever they're doing and stares at Izuku. Kakin is the first to ask, life-sized? The fuck? You got some mutant models in that room. Izuku nodded, MHM. Mutants, non-biologicals, and humans too. I need more rooms for mutants and non-biologicals, they're a bit huge in size. Maybe his brother won't be satisfied being silent. And decided to scare his friends even more, you know the hero centipede. Both his friends nodded. Yeah, Izuku got his anatomical model in there. Izuku is sure Kakin whispered a swear word but it's too small for him to point out. Tenko continues, imagine it. You went into that room at midnight and with no lights on. You want to search for the light switch but when you touch the walls, your hand felt something. Lowering his voice, Tenko continues to narrate, it felt similar to a skin. You squint at it and realized, it's a skin centipede. Half of his face and body is just red. All muscle and bones. I think you should stop. Izuku narrowed his eyes at his brother. And I don't think my anatomical models are that scary. Tenko only laughs at his friend's shocked faces. Nah, it is that scary, Zoo. Taoya pissed his pants when he saw his anatomical model in one of your room. You got the hero phoenix's anatomical model. What? The? Fuck. Heichin stares with his eyes wide at Izuku. Oh come on, I got brother Taoya's permission. Izuku tries to argue. And besides, I also got others too. 
I have Kamui Woods, Hawks, Maruko. Izuku tries to list some of his hero anatomical models. Kakan doesn't look impressed. That's even more creepy, shitty nerd. He frowned. Whatever, I'm just going to continue this thing. The pork can't cook itself. As Kakan immersed himself in cooking, Heichen began to drill him with questions. Is it similar to those wax statues? The anatomical models, I mean. Izuku nodded. MHM. But I can take apart the surface skin and study the organs inside. I also asked Dad to make it customizable so I can also mimic pheromone and blood flow inside the body. Though, non-biological ones don't have pheromones so I mainly try to mimic their individual hormones. The Omega began to mutter and mumble about his custom-made anatomical models. He saw from the corner of his eyes on how Heichen gave him a fond smile. Kakan tried to hide his chuckles and his brother shaking his head at him. Izuku knew he's so going to show his models to them soon. Maybe also his hero merchandise too while he's at it. Yuri grumbled in dissatisfaction. She had the worst day at work today. She knew she made a huge scene at the hospital before and she knew she's in the wrong. But honestly, she's not reconciled. How come someone like Midoriya Izuku can be born with a golden spoon but she's born with a debt-riddled parents that won't hesitate to ditch their daughter the moment she presented as an Omega? It's not fair. It's not fair at all. Walking along the dark sidewalk. Yuri gripped the plastic bag harder, stopping herself to take a deep breath to calm herself down. Thankfully, she only get a harsh scolding and nothing else happened to her. Well maybe she'll get excluded in groups in the future, but she doesn't care. A face popped up in her mind as she tries to calm down. The thought of her son lets her to stop the rage inside her head. Her son, Hideo, is currently having his 10th birthday today. Despite having him in from a nightmare circumstances, Yuri doesn't regret to keep her son and raise him all on her own. It's the first time she's able to get her son a birthday cake this year. From the previous years, Yuri isn't able to celebrate with Hideo whenever he's having his birthday. Now she's already 24. Having her own stable job, Yuri can finally get Hideo a proper birthday today. She smiles at the thought. Her son has never expected anything for his birthday so tonight must have been a surprise for him. She took a slow walk, imagining Hideo's laugh and giggles as they sing birthday songs in their living room. Yuri admits that she doesn't have enough finance to supply everything and more, so she and Hideo has been living paycheck through paycheck from years before. Thankfully, after working in this new private hospital, Yuri is able to breathe as the hospital paid her way better than the previous ones. Not only that, she felt more proud as she remembers on how she's able to pay Hideo's costume and instrument for his recital that his school will hold. Seeing the joy in her son's eyes as she handed the small tux and violin is the happiest moment in her life. Even if the tux is a bit cheap and the violin she bought is a second-hand one, it's enough for her. Hideo deserves it and more, hoping. On any news about the hero Tenko? What? No? What do you mean no? Yuri heard the voice lowers, almost growling. She began to felt the panic inside, not knowing on what to do. Get me a good reason on why I shouldn't disintegrate you. Right. Now, Yuri heard the voice reverberates from the alleyway next to her. She immediately hid herself next to the brick walls, listening into the conversation and search for the nearest hero agency. Okami, oh my. She can't believe on how she could find a villain tonight. She's quite unsure whether the other person is a villain or not, but from how he growls the name Tenko gave her the feeling of bone-chilling hatred. The person this guy is talking about is the new upcoming hero, Tenko. The hero that can be said to rival Hawks with his good looks and brooding personality. Yuri isn't the person that often reads the news or follow any hero-related medias, but she follows the trend. Right now, the young hero, Tenko, is making headline news after headline news with his success. Young, handsome, powerful, and is rumored to come from a wealthy family. Yuri knows that type of hero would often attract jealous eyes. She knew that because she felt it in her life. A constant reminder on how some people are just born worthless than others. She knew that fact, but still, she won't do anything harmful to those people she felt jealous from. She knew better. But apparently, this guy doesn't. It was silent for a while. Yuri found a hero agency near her current spot, but it'll take a while before she can get there. She also scanned the area and is sure that no heroes would patrol this area tonight. Maybe she should run now. She can make a quick report and head home to celebrate Hideo's birthday. Yuri is lost in her thought. Not realizing the other person went silent as the night breeze went to an abrupt stop, she only realized her dangerous predicament when she saw a shadow looming over her. Before Yuri can scream and run, her body went rigid. She can't utter a single word as she felt an invisible hand choking her, stopping her voice to ever slip from her lips. Every part of her limbs can't be moved, as if she's a puppet with a string and the other person is her manipulator. She felt her head forced to face downwards, only seeing a bright red shoes, contrasting the dark night. Looks like we got an eavesdropper. The other person's voice is deep and gravely, scratching her brain with how hoarse it is. Her grip on the plastic bag loosens, letting the cake inside to spill out. Yuri tried to keep her head calm, 
needing to remember every feature this guy has. Right now, she can deduce this person might have some kind of body control type of quirk. Horse voice, red shoes, before she knew it, a hand crept up to her neck. Oh no. Dread pulling at the gut of her stomach as she tries to steal herself from whatever that's happening to her. Fear and adrenaline course through her veins as her breath hitches. She knew what would happen to Omegas in poor areas like this. She knew some went missing or died in the darkness of the night. All alone with no body or evidence found. She just hoped this guy wants her body. She hopes this guy will just take advantage of her instead. She doesn't want to be missing. Sharp, long nails pierced her neck, tearing away her skin and muscle. Yuri felt her back is soaked with warm blood, pouring from the nape of her neck but this guy doesn't stop there. His sharp fingers kept poking and prodding the insides of her skin, almost touching her spine until he stops. He ripped her glands out. The fingers clasped around her small gland, tearing it away from her blood vessels, letting the blood to spurt out. Yuri can't scream. The invisible hand on her throat tightens, knowing damn well that she will howl and cry if he loosens. Instead, Yuri cried. Her tears fell as the burning pain spreads throughout her whole body. She can feel the cold breeze seeping into her, now hollow, neck. The warm liquid gushes out her body. As she felt bits of her torn meat fell onto the cold pavement, Yuri wanted to fall, to let her body rest on the concrete ground but the control on her body forces her shaky legs to keep standing. It hurts. It hurts. It hurts. The sting turned into an ache and soon enough, like a prairie fire, the pain overwhelms her head, spreading throughout her whole body. Yuri's vision blurs as she can't perceive anything else but the sound of this guy's voice, monologuing something about heroes, corruption and something else. She can't focus on anything but the pain flaring in her body and the cake. Her son, Okami. Her son, Hideo. New tears began to spill, soaking her cheeks as she remembers Hideo. Yuri knew she's beyond saving at this point. Either she'll die from blood loss, or she'll die from pheromone deficiency. She has no more hope for saving. Right now, Yuri can hear the sound of lunching from the person in front of her. She quelching sound of blood and organ getting ripped apart overwhelms her. Is, is this person eating her gland? Oh no, he really is. She saw how the guy tossed her blood vessels and gland skin away, letting it hit with a sickening thump. He doesn't seem satisfied with her glands as he starts to pick the torn muscle from her open flesh, taking bit by bit as the sound of munching can be heard. She's going to be eaten alive. The guy still narrates as he ate, voice muffled when he chews. He said something about his name being Tamura or Shigaraki, she doesn't care. She's going to die and she'll curse this man until her last breath. Her mind continues to fog, feeling heady. Her body doesn't feel like her body anymore as she began to lose consciousness. She just wanted to spend the night singing birthday songs and watching her son blew his candle. She wants to capture her son's smile as he held the cake up. She wants to watch her son's recital. She wants to listen to her son's violin, knowing on how hard he trains all month. She wants to finish her medical degree. She wants to keep working in the hospital until her skin wrinkles. She wants to see her son graduate high school, graduate college, finding his partner. She wants to be a part of her son's life. She wants to keep him safe. She wants to see him smile. She has a lot she wants to do. The pain subsides. Her brain might be too overwhelmed, shutting her pain receptor off. Or maybe the guy took apart her brain and shuts it off. But either way, she felt her body went light. The voices overlaps. Somehow, Hideo's smiling face appeared between her closed eyelids. I really enjoy the citrus-scented pheromone like yours. Mama, your pheromone smells nice. Hideo feels safe when Mama's here. Because of that, Yuri always made sure to scent every of Hideo's item and made sure her nest is accessible to her son so he can rest there when she's not around. Doctor is running out of experiments anyway. Maybe I'll ask Sensei to take you in. Ito-sensei praised me. He said I've already mastered the song, Mama. The pride she felt when Hideo told her that brings a smile to her face. Though, she can't feel anything right now, but she knew, she's happy. Yuri is too preoccupied in her thoughts, recounting every memory she had from her rough childhood to the present, dying under the night sky. The last thing she can feel is how her body got hauled up to somewhere she'll never know. The last thing she can hear is how Tamura described on how she can be a great Namo. The three soon head up to bed after they finish their fun. While they're playing, Izuku doesn't know whether wrestling can be count as playing. Kaken finally made his brother and Hitchin to call him the sewer kid. For now, right now, Izuku is laying down on the bed while the two alphas laid on the futons. Coincidentally, Kaken got the yellow futon while Hitchin got the purple one. Izuku wanted to let them sleep on his bed together since his bed is more than enough for them to lay on. But his dad said no, so Kaken and Hitchin have to sleep on the floor. Kaken is the first to rest. Izuku followed suit and turned the lights off for the three of them to sleep. After a while, Izuku got woken up by small cat noises from his left. It's weird considering Izuku doesn't own any pets, let alone a cat. 
Plus, it's a bit eerie considering his room is dark, only illuminated by the moonlight. Opening his eyes, Izuku turn around to find Hitchin still awake, scrolling on his phone to watch cat videos. Hitchin's eyes are a bit bleary as he tried to stifle a yawn. Izuku leaned towards the edge of the bed and whispered, Hitchin, why are you not asleep yet? He glanced at Kakin's sleeping form, afraid to wake the blonde up. Hitchin seemed to be surprised. You're not asleep. He turned off his phone, letting the darkness to permeate. No, I thought you were asleep. Izuku frowned, glancing towards the alarm clock on the nightstand. It's already 10, why are you not asleep yet? Izuku can't really decipher Hitchin's expression in the dark. But he heard a mutter, can't really sleep. Hitchin sighed, I'm thinking about tomorrow. Izuku is curious, what's wrong with tomorrow? Aren't we going to the ice cream shop? Yeah, that, a slight rustle, but Pops and Dad told me that someone might join us tomorrow. Now that's surprising. Izuku blinked his sleepiness away. Interest peaked, who is it? A silence passed. Dunno, it's not confirmed yet, but he's called Tenya or something. Hitchin seemed to think for a while. Pops said that Tenya is the same age as us. His friend's brother, I think. The Greenette tried to contain his happiness from the thought of making new friends. He whispered a bit too excitedly, that's great. But after a while, Izuku asked, but why now? Tomorrow is supposed to be our day. They might be a bit noisy that Kakin groaned in his sleep. Izuku tried to quiet down, holding his breath until he can hear Kakin's soft snores. Izuku sighed in relief, waiting for Hitchin's answer. Amen, I heard that Ida will also take Yue's entrance exam and Pops thought it'll be a great idea to let him train with me. Or with Katsuki too if he wants. But yeah, Izuku can see Hitchin covering himself with the blanket probably preparing to sleep. Pops also doesn't want to ruin our day but Tenya's family will be busy tomorrow, so there's a high chance that he'll join us. Izuku doesn't complain about having another person joins in their fun and Heichin doesn't seem to mind. The trouble is how Kakin reacts tomorrow. Izuku knew how his blonde friend is fierce and often more barks than bites. But even then, Kakin can be a bit intimidating for other people when they meet for the first time. But he'll think about it tomorrow. He'll try to get some sleep tonight. Good night, Heichin. Night, Zhu. Hitchin mumbled, halfway asleep. You're staying here. Hisashi poured himself a cup of water. The study is quiet, as always. Only the small tower lamp emits a soft amber light, giving the study a cozy ambience. Tenko leaned back on the sofa. Nah, got some things to do later. I do want to stay for a few days. But Mrs. Hatsum notified me before, she said the support gear is ready. Hisashi took a gulp of his drink, placing the cup down and sat back on his seat. Shame, your mother would enjoy the reunion. He continues his work. She has been stuck in the hospital for days now and meeting you will make her happy. Tenko sighed at that. He has been away for a long time now, catching up with hero work and moves from one city to another to rise in ranks and to be qualified to take on big cases, alongside Taoya. I'll probably stay until tomorrow. When will mom be back anyway? His dad thought for a moment. Should be tonight. But if there's emergencies, she might be back tomorrow morning. The younger alpha let his nerves relax. He can probably stay for a day and then he'll head out. For the past few months, Tenko has been running in and out of the city to handle varieties of cases, getting more and more dangerous as time passes. There are some rumors he heard through the grapevine that the higher-ups are dealing with some big case. Even All Might and his ex-sidekick, Sir Nighthai, are involved in this. Even Taoya got involved, which Tenko isn't surprised about. Taoya was a famous and a reliable hero when he's in his era. Tenko isn't sure why Taoya would suddenly quit being a hero and decided to work behind the screen now, but he can understand that running a whole agency is a lot to manage. So one can imagine Tenko's shock when he heard Taoya will do underground jobs. The man has already prepared all the files and shit to go underground, and he just decided to tell Tenko a day before he'll officially prepare his underground training. The young alpha immediately frowned when he got the news. He knew the other for years now, but why Taoya never told him about it before he made the decision? Is he so untrustworthy? They fought about it, from shouting match to throwing punches and kicks at each other, similar to their usual spar. They holler insults and jabs daily but it's all good fun. Though, that fight caused a ripple in their relationship. Tenko doesn't know if it's for better or worse. I didn't even want to be a fucking hero in the first place. Tenko remembered on how he stilled after he heard that. His fists slowly uncurl, staring at the older alpha with confusion. Tenko felt even worse when he clearly perceives Taoya's despair and sorrow in his pheromone but isn't able to help. My quirk can literally kill me. He knew that. He, Taoya stops himself. I, fuck. Tenko asked what he meant, pestering the other for days after that but Taoya never answers. As if a paper window got pierced, Tenko is finally able to see Taoya fully vulnerable without all the vague answers and masked composure. Time passed after that. Their interaction remains awkward but a few days ago, Taoya asked a favor from him to take a disguise gear he'll need for his job. It has been weeks since the fight and Tenko won't miss this opportunity to talk with the guy. 
His instincts told him that whatever Taoya is working on right now must have been related to the big case. Tenko, a younger alpha snapped out from his thoughts, turning his head to meet his dad's eyes. HM, his dad stares at him for a while but continue to do his work. If you're done, mind checking your brother. I can't sit still knowing those alphas are in the same room as him. His dad grumbled. Tenko stretched his arms and legs, standing up and walked over to the door. Why did you even allow them in the same room? Holding the doorknob, Tenko glanced back to his dad in confusion. Your brother begged me, and your mother allows it. Uh, that's reasonable. Tenko shrugged, opening the door and heads towards his brother's bedroom. Izuku should be asleep by now but he's not sure about the other two others. He'll peek in and head off to his game room after this. He needs a good break after all. The next day come faster than Izuku expected, and he's finally able to meet Tenya today. It's nice to meet you, Itakun. He gave a slight bow with a smile. Or do you prefer to be called something else? A pleasure to meet you too, Midori Akun. Itakun returns his greeting with a bow. He shook his head, Itakun is fine. He assured, fixing his glasses. Izuku smiled at the taller beta. Ida Tenya is a prim and strict person, but he's also nice and shows off great heroic traits. Ida Kun also have a strange habit of doing hand chop every time they talked and can sometimes be a bit intense. But everyone got their own peculiarity and Izuku thought Ida Kun is interesting. Maybe it's because of the similarity of their upbringing. Izuku can't help but to be comfortable around the beta. He was a bit afraid of meeting new people, scared of being too rigid or too awkward, but Ida Kun is nice, despite his strict personality. Ida Kun is understanding when Izuku asked him a bunch of questions that Izuku felt too stupid to ask. Izuku also introduced Kakin and Hitchin to him but Kakin only clicked his tongue and stormed off while Hitchin gave a curt nod with nothing to say. To ease the atmosphere, Izuku started to talk about random topics and get to know Ida Kun, walking on the sidewalk towards his favorite childhood ice cream shop. The park stays the same, with familiar greenery, laughters and shouts from children running around, and the shops and stalls around. It felt like yesterday when Izuku played with Kakin in this place, thinking that Kakin will be his only friend. He played with Kakin in here, he got to know Hitchin in here, and now, Izuku got another new friend in the same park towards the familiar ice cream shop. So all of your family members are heroes, Izuku asked in awe. He heard one or two things about Ida family. He knew about Ingenium, Ida Kun's brother, but he doesn't expect his parents are also heroes in the past. Indeed, my family came from a long lineage of heroes. Izuku smiled as he listens to Ida Kun narrating his family. He looked so proud in the way he talked about his brother. Ida Tensei made Izuku chuckle once or twice. The baiter really admires his brother and his aspirations to be a hero stems from that. His adoration and pride for his family is similar on how Izuku view his. If Izuku got any other quirk, or maybe not an Omega, he would probably follow Itakun's path to become a hero with the same motivation. Izuku also occasionally try to include Kakin and Heichin in their conversation. Especially with how Heichin got two pro heroes as his parents, Izuku thought their similarity would spark a friendship but they barely respond more than two sentences. What a topic killer. Izuku is just glad that Itakun isn't intimidated by Kakin's grunts or snarls or a bit uncomfortable with Heichin's unresponsiveness. They arrived at the shop and as usual, Kakin took it upon himself to stand in the line. Hitchin seemed to hesitate between following Izuku to find a table or to wait in line so Kakin won't mess with his order. But in the end, Hitchin decided to stand in line, side by side with the blonde and let Izuku to pick the table. After Izuku and Itakun told them their order, Izuku held Itakun's wrist and dragged the beta to his usual spot. Come on, I'll show you our favorite spot. When both of them got seated, Izuku took out his phone to check on incoming messages. He frowned when he read some of the texts. What's wrong? Izuku snapped out of his thought and looked up to see Itakun's confusion. Izuku shook his head, sighing. Nothing, just my co-worker didn't come and someone else have to cover her shifts today. Itakun also frowned. That's quite unresponsible of your co-worker. Shrugging, Izuku placed his phone down. Who knows what happened? Maybe she has an emergency or something else. It's a bit unlike her to skip work. The beta hummed, asking, is the work you're talking about related to being medical professional? I heard from my brother that you've already done internships. Izuku chuckled, no, no, I'm not interning, it's a part of my study. Other omegas that got chosen to be in healer programs will also work in field too. They'll be placed in departments that they must master in. Depends on their quirk application, most of the time. He let his arms rest on the table, leaning forward. But since I'm not joining any programs, I got to choose in what department I want to focus in. I guess that's the only advantage. That's quite interesting. Ada Kun nodded in understanding. So what did you choose? I heard you can be specialized in certain fields. Ah, uh, I. Izuku hesitated. I'm not quite sure. 
Not sure, Izuku hummed. I'm aiming to be a hero healer, he explains, and being a hero healer isn't easy. I basically have to learn a lot of things to be able to utilize my quirk better. Or in simpler term, an all-rounder. I have to be prepared for anything if I want to apply to be a hero healer because once my employer got injured, I'll be the first to get called regardless of their injuries. And if I can't heal them, my employer will have to go to the nearest hospital. After thinking about it, Izuku confessed with a sigh. To be honest, being a hero healer is an impossible standard. Worst case scenario is that you'll get a bad mark and no other heroes wouldn't hire you if you fail to heal serious injuries. Letting your employer in a critical situation or worse, dead. My grandma told me on how hero healers got more and more scarce as time passes by. Izuku stopped his mumbling to see Itakun's wide eyes in surprise. He laughed. But it's fine, I got almost a decade in experience and my quirk made my learning experience a lot easier too. Plus, I'll also continue my study in Yua for the next three years and become a healer apprentice first to broaden my horizon. That's what my grandma instructs me. Before Ada Kun can ask further, Kakin and Heichen arrived with all of their orders. Heichen gently hands Izuku's ice cream to his hands while Kakin just placed Ada Kun's order on the table with no other words. After both alphas sat, Izuku prompted Ada Kun to ask his question. He asked with a hand chop, You said that you'll attend Yue. Izuku noticed on how Kakin and Heichen gave the beta a side eye, getting alert from his question. Izuku peered his eyes back and nodded. Ada Kun seemed to be thinking about something and continued to ask, But how? Have you trained before? How will you pass Yue's entrance exam with your quirk? Before Izuku can answer, Kakin snarls, What? You're saying he's incompetent? Heichen also glares at the beta. Ada Kun seemed to realize that he asked it inappropriately and immediately apologized. Izuku just smiles and assures him that it's okay while trying to placate both of his alpha friends. They seem to be more offended than Izuku. Kakin only grunted and continued to bite his ice cream and chewed on the dessert aggressively while Hitchin stayed quiet. I'll take recommendation exam later. My grandma talked with Principal Nezu and they'll probably prepare a separate exams and tests for me. He blinked, taking a scoop of his ice cream, I'm just not sure what. Hitchin also joins in, but I think it'll be fine. Iwa is literally his second home for years now. Astonishment flashed in Ada Kun's face, second home. Kakin grunted, MN. Shitty nerd tails his grandma to work every day. Your grandma is recovery girl. Izuku only nodded. Yup, I'm her healer apprentice at you. After that the topic changed. Izuku mostly directs the conversation, so it won't be too stiff. At the end of the day, Izuku felt a sense of accomplishment when Kakin doesn't call Ida Kun as an extra and Heichin to actually converse more with Ida Kun. Somewhere on an abandoned rooftop. How's our favorite phoenix holding up? Taoya only glanced at the incoming person and decided to ignore him, preferably for the whole night. Hawks only chuckled at Taoya's indifference, sitting next to the fire user on the rooftop and blatantly stares at the other while he let himself lean back, feeling the night breeze. He doesn't mind with Taoya's silence and kept talking to himself. Heard you're going underground. Hawks smirked when he got Taoya to peers at him, turquoise eyes glaring. He continued, is it related to the disappearance that kept happening these days? Taoya still doesn't answer. Instead he took out a stick of cigarette, give me a lighter. Whoa, demanding much. Hawks chuckles, but I got none on me. Why don't you use your quirk anyways? It's much simpler solution. Don't want to. Talia answered, taking out another stick of cigarette and hands it out to the mutant hero. Hawks took the cig and decided to rummage his pockets for anything to light it until he finally found a forgotten matchbox. Huh, what a nice surprise. He bit the cigarette between his teeth and promptly opens the matchbox and lit one of the match on. He doesn't even question Phoenix's reluctance to use his quirk, cupping the match so the fire won't get blown away by the wind. Hawks leaned closer to light his sig. Watching Phoenix's face up close, Hawks can feel his lips curls upwards. He let the silence sink in until the dark-haired hero answered, Yeah, it's related. Huh, your previous question. Holding the cigarette between his index and middle finger, Taoya stares at the blonde, I won't spoil anything else. Ask your commission to let you go underground. Maybe you'll find some info yourself. Taoya stood up and walked towards the edge of the rooftop. Also stop bothering me. My mouth will stay shut no matter what tricks you use. Then promptly jumped off towards the next building with ease. Hawks watched the man run off until he can't see the other anymore, inhaling the smoke while he stares at nothingness. They're ready. You got your bag. Food. Oh wait, will it take long? Do you need me to pack you lunch? Izuku tried to placate his mom while she's panicking about his entrance exam. Calm down, Inko. And I've already packed him something to eat. His grandma held his arm and gently dragged him towards the front door into the car. Izuku and his grandma bid mom goodbye before they drove away. Izuku still can't believe it. Today is the entrance exam. Well, not Yue's regular entrance exam, but instead recommendation exam. He turned towards his grandma. Where will brother Tenko meet us? Is he at Yue yet? 
His grandma doesn't look at him and kept her eyes focused on the tinted window. We'll meet him at you, the gates, and I'll make sure he arrives before we do, she said with certainty. Izuku doesn't utter another word at that, focusing his attention back to the passing scenery outside. His brother better be there, because Tenko is the one that recommended him. Though, Izuku isn't sure why the hero that recommends you should be there but rules are rules. Izuku probably won't be able to see his brother much considering he'll be preoccupied with his own test. The Omega tried to occupy his spare time in the car by memorizing every knowledge he learnt so far, trying his best to keep his budding panic at bay. Before he knows it, the car finally stops in front of Yue, a place Izuku is most familiar with but his jittery arms and sweating palms made the tall building more intimidating than before. He took slow steps behind his grandma. Right in front of the gates, Izuku spotted his brother waiting for them. Unknowingly, his rapid beating heart calms down with the sight of Tenko smiling and waving towards him. He smiles back, picking up his pace and jogged towards his brother, hugging the alpha tight to ease his restlessness. Whoa, his brother chuckled as Izuku hugged him tighter, calm down Zu. Izuku felt a large hand patted his back, motioning him to let go. It'll be fine. It's just an exam. Izuku lets go and frowned towards the man, easy for you to say. You've already graduated. Tenko only laughs harder. Yeah, yeah, I did. His laugh eases, turning into a small smile, but it's just an exam. Look, I've lived. He motions towards himself, and nothing happened to me. So, nothing will happen to you too. Okay, Zu. Izuku stares at his brother and glances back towards his grandma, who's now talking with Principal Nezu, which Izuku himself hasn't noticed, and back towards his brother, all right, fine. But what if I fail? Then it's a part of your learning process. His brother ruffled his hair. Both got startled by Grandma who suddenly called out for Izuku, telling him to go to the examination room for his written test. Tenko then gave him a reassuring pat, waving goodbye as he and Grandma went towards the practical examination site while Principal Nezu leads him towards his written exam room. On the way, Principal Nezu made some small talk. How are you today, Midori Akun? Izuku's wandering mind focuses back to the principal. Um, a bit anxious, but I guess it's normal. Indeed, it is. But I can assure you that your exam won't be much different than your trainings before with your grandmother. When they reached the examination room, Izuku can briefly saw Uncle Aiza, Aizawa Sensei, inside. It'll be just fine, Midori Akun. Izuku quickly thanked the principal and went inside to take his seat, noting how tired Aizawa Sensei is right now. Maybe he hasn't slept again. Izuku might need to have a word with the man later. Hitchin started to follow his footsteps with barely resting at night. Or maybe he need to talk about it with Uncle, Mike Sensei. But he's also not the best with his schedules either. Staying up most of the night for his radio show. No talking, no cheating, no eating or drinking. Your exam starts now and if I see any of you breaking the rules, you're expelled before you can even enroll here. Aizawa Sensei hands out the exam paper and don't test me. I'll know was his last warning before he went inside his yellow sleeping bag and took a nap. Izuku snapped out of his thoughts and began to pour his outmost best on the exam paper in front of him. True to his words, Aizawa Sensei does know. Three kids immediately got escorted out after they got caught cheating using their quirks. After that, none of the remaining examinee dares to play tricks or use their quirk to cheat anymore. Izuku is glad that he finished early and is able to watch the show outside the examination room. The three cheaters have been shouting and struggled desperately, denying their behavior but in the end, they still got thrown out from Yua after watching the farce. Izuku walked towards the practical exam site and meet his brother there. His grandma hasn't explained much to him on how his practical exam would work but he'll probably found out there. The only reason that he's not panicking right now is that his grandma assured him that his practical exam won't require him to fight or anything like that. Once Izuku enters the practical exam site, he spotted his brother chatting with other heroes there. He walked towards Tenko while checking the area and gawk at so many people here. Once his brother saw him, he motioned Izuku to come faster, and he did. Izuku noticed many heroes that surrounds his brother, but the only hero that caught his attention is Endeavor, as the highest-ranking hero in this place. Endeavor seems to be nagging the boy next to him, with his dual-colored hair as his most noticeable feature. Once he's next to his brother, he tugged Tenko's hero suit, is that Taoya's youngest brother. He discreetly points towards the boy next to Endeavor. Taoya did mention one or two things about his family. From his sire that kept working outside and only able to meet once a month to his sibling. His twin, Fayumi, is a calm and kind woman. His first brother, Natsuo, is wilder and more outgoing than any of them combined while his youngest brother, Shoto, is the most silent from all the Todorokis. Izuku can see on how Shoto-kun is the calmest one. He barely even answered any of Endeavor's nagging questions and harsh commands. Is this how sires raise their alpha child? Izuku isn't quite sure, but his dad has also been sterner and stricter with his brother. Not similar with Endeavor's harshness, but Izuku noticed a pattern with how parents being more tough with their alpha children. 
A few minutes passed by with Tenko conversing and introducing Izuku to them. They're mostly surprised with Izuku being an Omega and taking recommendation exam with a healing quirk. Other than that, the topics and conversation has been pleasant. His grandma came over a while later, calling out to Izuku, Dear, your test will be held somewhere else, come with me. Izuku followed her, not forgetting to bid his brother goodbye. Where are we going, grandma? Izuku asked when they passed many examinees in the practical test site. Some noticed his grandma, recovery girl, with their eyes wide and whispered among themselves as they also noticed Izuku following behind her. They passed the crowd and went to a more secluded area, in which his grandma points towards a room where Principal Nezu is also waiting inside. Ah, Midoriya-kun, come in. He gestured the Omega to come inside. Izuku glances around the room, which isn't any different to UA's infirmary. He sat on one of the chairs and listened as his grandma and Principal Nezu explain his test. Your practical exam is to heal. His grandma said, you'll be given seven minutes to heal every injured examinees from their practical test. Your scores will be calculated by your diagnosis, your method of healing, the process and result of your healing, and how you handle your patients. There will be no score deduction if you fail to heal, but it'll be your homework at home once we finish the exam today. Principal Nezu also added, and your grandmother here will be the one that supervises you. And this room is equipped with cameras for transparency. Despite all of that, I'm confident that you'll pass this exam, Midori Akun. He smiled. Well, the exam will start in a few minutes, so you better prepare yourself now. Principal Nezu gave him and his grandma a curt nod and left. Izuku just sat there with pounding heart, clammy as he tried to memorize all of the rules. He's only given seven minutes. Seven. And he's the only healer here. What if he can't heal their injuries? Even though he won't get any deduction, but what if he heals them wrong? What if someone came in bleeding with their body cut open from a fight? Oh no, what if someone comes in dying? I know you're overthinking this, dear. His grandma snapped him out of his thoughts. You'll do just fine. Izuku took a deep breath in and tried to believe her words. Okay, he can do this. He'll try his best. He has perfected his energy reservation while using his quirk, learnt to use his sweat and tears when the opportunity presents itself, able to emit his pheromone without it being too excessive and able to heal almost any injury. Well, hopefully almost all. Izuku has spent a decade, or so, for this moment and if he fails because of one in a kind mutant or quirk user that he never learnt about, he's going to cry when he'll be back at home. But other than that, he's confident that he's able to do this. Izuku is starting to doubt himself whether he can do this. What do you mean you can't heal me faster? Izuku really tried to keep calm. He really did. Exhaling the suffocating breath he held, Izuku tried to placate the other while also emitting his own calming pheromone. He can see this alpha is one minor trouble away from turning aggressive and damaging his gland on the process. You only have a minor scrape on your ankle, it'll heal within a few days. He tried to bandage the other's ankle despite the massive tantrum this alpha thrown. He can see the effect of his pheromone started to work with the flailing of this alpha's arm grew lax until he went silent. Despite the alpha not throwing any physical tantrum, Izuku still has to bear the insults this person hollers at him about not being an effective healer, useless, stupid omega and so on and so forth. Izuku is glad to do his study in his mom's hospital. He realized on how Yua has been too tame compared to an actual hospital where many patients refuse to be treated or would physically fight the doctors and nurses that are tending them. This alpha is just one of the examples of such patients. But Izuku can also understand that his frustration and anger has led him to this point. Alphas that contain too much negative emotions will gradually harm their gland and become aggressive. If their aggression isn't healed in time, they'll eventually turn feral, and from there, only the best of the best Omega healer is able to help them. Thankfully, the Alpha has a weak emitter quirk, because if he has other more aggressive quirk, the tantrum he threw could probably hurt Izuku. After this one is treated and ready to go, Izuku prepares for another batch of patients. He doesn't forget to write down everything he has diagnosed the patient with, what steps he had taken and his additional notes regarding his concern about the alpha's gland problems, hoping that his analysis can be used outside of this exam. Because if so, Izuku might be able to help someone to prevent a more dangerous health problem. Do you really have to kiss me to heal? Izuku gave a warm smile, yes, though if you're uncomfortable with that, I can also treat you traditionally with no quirk use. He can see the cut from this examinee's right upper arm towards her elbow, which he can deduce that either something cuts her or someone's quirk did this to her. Despite the injury, her skin is more elastic and seemed to have some kind of rubbery texture in it, preventing blood to seep out. Basically, Izuku can see that her injury is mostly on the skin, not harming any of her muscle or even deeper than that. But the way her skin created some kind of stitch-like pattern fascinates Izuku. Not quite like self-healing but more similar towards self-preservation type of quirk side effect. Her quirk must have been able to let her manipulate the elasticity of her body. Other injuries on her body are just minor scrapes and bruises, 
Something Izuku can heal without the use of his quirk. The alpha girl's cheek gradually stained with red, staring at Izuku with dodging eyes. Uh, um, she coughs, clearing her throat while Izuku waits patiently for her answer. Um, I don't mind. But like, do you have to kiss the injury or you can kiss anywhere? But if you can't kiss anywhere, it's also fine. She stopped herself when she realized she's rambling. Sorry about that. Izuku only chuckles and told her that it's fine. I'm just nervous when seeing a cutie like you. Now it's Izuku's turn to blush. Izuku has healed over dozens of people, with the majority only sporting minor bruises that Izuku can heal without his quirk and more major injuries are from quirk use from what Izuku can predict as combat. But other than that, none of the patients came in dying like what Izuku feared before. He also finishes his diagnosis and every possible analysis regarding the injury with the lack of their medical history, handing it out to his grandma, who's waiting outside the room, rechecking Izuku's work. Despite some hard and tiring patients, Izuku also meets some kinder and friendlier ones. Izuku is glad that he gets to meet them and listen to their stories despite the short time he's given. Right now, Izuku is notified that there's only two examinees left for him to heal. One of them is Urashikun, the beta that Izuku's currently healing. He's a friendly person, occasionally make Izuku laugh with how he recounts his own story. Urashikun is a strong beta with his build and psyche. Well, it's done. I hope we can meet again at UA, Urashikun. The Omega beamed at him, patting the other's bicep after he's done healing. Urashikun doesn't return the smile, but scratched his hair in embarrassment. Um, about that. Izuku tilts his head in confusion. I probably won't enter UA. Izuku gasps in shock. What? Why not? Aren't you the first to finish the marathon? He recounts on how other examinee, and Urashikun himself, told the story on how the competition between him and Todoroki-kun was quite fierce. Yeah, you've heard the marathon between me and Todoroki right. Izuku nodded. I decided that it's not worth it to enter you if that guy will be there. I won't go on too much on why that guy irked me, because it's already in the past. Urashikun just gave him a small smile. But no matter, I'll probably enter other heroes' school. Yua isn't the only great one here in Japan. Izuku only blinks and nod, watching the beta gathers his things and heads out. Not before bidding Izuku goodbye, it's really nice to meet you, Midoriya. Hope we can meet again. Izuku hummed at that, smiled at the other and wished Urashikun will be happier in other school of his choosing. The last one is Todoroki-kun. He heard on how other examinees described the alpha, cold, taciturn, and emotionless. Izuku felt those traits are similar to certain someone, a brother that only shows his silent and stern appearance in media but won't hesitate to smile and joke around with his family. Izuku is also sure that Todoroki-kun is just more detached than the other, probably similar to his brother, Tenko. Izuku prepares himself, ready to face the so-called Ice Prince or whatever. He really doesn't care about the titles and such. The door slowly opens, revealing a tall dual-haired alpha with a garish burn scar on the left side of his face which reaches halfway down his cheek. He tried to keep himself calm, inwardly shocked by such scar on the other's face. Hello Todoroki-kun, I'm Midoriya and I'll be your healer. He introduced himself, smiling as he motions Todoroki-kun to sit down. Todoroki-kun doesn't answer, silently sat on the wooden stool even though Izuku motioned towards the patient cot, unsure on what to do. Izuku follows along and dragged another chair to sit face to face with the dual-haired alpha. So, for starters, my quirk is called Healing Kiss, and just as the name suggests, I have to kiss you in order to heal your injuries. If you're not comfortable with that, I can also treat you traditionally. I'm not injured. Todoroki-kun immediately cuts him off. Izuku stares at the other, slowly nodding, all right. Well, I'm still required to do physical checkup on you, more preferably on the burn scar on his face. Izuku is afraid that the scar will hinder him or worse. What if there's also other scars on the alpha's body that he doesn't know? I said, I'm not injured. I'm only here because my sire told me to. Todoroki-kun is a difficult one, Izuku noted to himself. He tried to smile, I heard you, Todoroki-kun. But I'll be only checking your upper body and limbs for any visible scars or wounds because if I don't, then I'm neglecting my duty as a healer. Izuku tried to explain it as slowly as he can. Todoroki-kun doesn't answer but he suddenly shoves his arm towards Izuku, make it fast. The surprise flashes in his eyes. But Izuku only smiled, taking the toned arm and began to start his checkup routine. Alright, you don't have any major injuries, thankfully, but you do have some scrapes and bruises on your legs and arms. Do you mind if I kiss you to heal it? Truthfully, Izuku can heal the other with just cleaning up the scrape and tending it without his quirk but he really wants this exam to be over and using his quirk is the fastest way to do so. Todoroki-kun seemed to hesitate, staring at Izuku with those heterochromia eyes, which are beautiful beyond words, his brain unhelpfully supplied. Izuku wanted to offer another option but Todoroki-kun suddenly agrees. Really, I'll kiss you on the cheek, will you be fine with that? Kissing the wound directly will be faster, but Todoroki-kun might be uncomfortable with that. With a nod, Izuku began to work. 
gently placing his lips on the alpha's cold cheek. Izuku closes his eyes as he channels his quirk and let the warmth envelops his lips, spreading it towards Todoroki-kun's body. Thankfully, Izuku doesn't need to fry his brain to heal this one. All of the injuries are mostly skin traumas so after a quick peck, Todoroki-kun is completely free of any bruises. Well, the burn scar remains. Izuku noted on how Todoroki-kun's skin must have already healed long ago. From the looks of it, Todoroki-kun must have been injured similar to his brother, with their body getting burned. Luckily for Taoya, Izuku managed to be able to mimic his natural skin and prevent scar tissues like Todoroki-kun. Izuku might be staring at the Alpha for too long because Todoroki-kun started to fidget and dodge his gay. The Omega snaps out of his thought and apologizes. Your wounds have been healed, if your body still hurts, or if there's anything that I missed, feel free to call me. Your brother must have my number. Todoroki-kun seemed to have some kind of realization flashed in his eyes. Staring at the Omega skeptically, you're Izuku. Izuku nodded at that, expecting Todoroki-kun to ask more question but the Alpha only nodded, stood up and left the room without saying anything more. Izuku stares at the door Todoroki-kun left from and shook his head. What a weird encounter. The last one is interview. After Izuku finished up, his grandma came in to escort him towards the interview room. Izuku preened at how his grandma complimented at his good job, writing to the outmost detail and she'll make note of it after the exam ends. Once they reached the interview room, his grandma pats his back as an encouragement and told him to go in. Knocking the door, Izuku lets himself in after the person inside told him to enter. On the other side of the room is Principal Nezu, smiling as he held a cup of warm tea, gesturing Izuku to take a seat. The room is bare, with a floor lamp on the corner and two sets of seats for both Principal Nezu and Izuku to sit on and a wide table in front of the principal. Izuku sat on the leather seat in front of him, waiting for a bunch of questions to be thrown at him. Principal Nezu doesn't utter a single word, calmly taking a sip of his tea and once he places the cup down, he finally said, It's great to meet you, Midoriya Kun. Izuku felt his back stiffened, letting himself smile as he greets the principal back. Nice to see you too, Principal Nezu. If I may be honest with you, Midoriya Kun, this practical test and interview are superfluous for you, he admits. Izuku tilts his head in confusion. Ha, huh, why is it superfluous? I've already seen on what your abilities are able to do. For years, I've seen your progress, your ambition, and your motivation, Midoriya Kun. I've judged and assessed you for all of these years, meaning that today practical test and interview can be counted as unnecessary. He explained, Principal Nezu leaned back on his seat, but you've seen and experienced today's test. You've seen on how you're the only Omega that's taking this exam today. I wonder what's your thoughts on that? What's your opinion on being the sole healer in today's test? Midoriya Kun. Izuku is taken aback, but he tries to calm himself down. Answering the question as truthful and best as he could, to be honest, Principal Nezu, it's quite tiring especially with the 7 minutes deadline. But you made it work. I made it work. Izuku agrees to that. How is that? Izuku answered, mostly because of the injuries aren't too heavy, meaning that all of the injuries aren't life-threatening and even if there's a serious one, it's all mostly skin traumas, sir. He fidgeted in his seat, and thankfully, my quirk and experience is able to solve the problem as best and efficient as I could with the time limit. Principal Nezu hummed, reading a bunch of papers that Izuku hadn't noticed before and realized that all of those papers are his diagnosis. His palms sweated, tugging on the end of his shirt. Izuku tried to keep quiet as Principal Nezu asses his analysis. Interesting. Izuku peered towards the stoat, seeing how his beady eyes shone and smiles as he reads further. Really interesting, Midoriya Kun. You're able to write so much information without any prior knowledge of their quirk and their history. Nervous, Izuku corrected. Um, they told me some of their past medical history, sir. I also analyzed one or two bits about their quirk after they told me the basics. The principal smiled, but I don't think they know that they'll have a gland problem, or how their quirk gave a natural resistance towards the damage they took, or how their low blood level directly affects their quirk efficiency. He stacked the papers together. Your grandmother also notified me on some of the on-point analysis you did, Midoriya Kun. Izuku is silent, listening to the principal. Some of these additional tips that you've written might be able to save their life. Shock filled Izuku's body, letting his eyes widen at such statement, and you did all of this in under 10 minutes. This is why I'm assured on your test today. After the shock, joy came and washed over him, flooding every of his veins after Principal Nezu's compliment. But he kept silent, waiting for another question to be asked. Principal Nezu continued, You said that it's tiring to be the only healer? No. Izuku nodded, watching how Principal Nezu's smile dropped, black beady eyes gleamed at him. But do you know why you're the only healer in this test? Do you know why many healers won't take the same test as you do? This one question stumped Izuku, but he answered whatever popped in his mind, because, because if they took further study in a hero school, they'll automatically be labeled as a hero healer. 
and not many wanted to be a hero healer. Those are the answers he often heard from the older Omegas in his mom's hospital, explaining that even if they wanted to be a full-time healer, they'll still have the label of hero healer because of the school they graduated from. Principal Nezu seemed to ponder his answer. Well, that's one plausible answer, but I reckon that you must have no more than that, right? The Omega is conflicted, but the principal seemed to see right through the hesitation on his face. No need to be uncertain, Midoriya Kun. We're just having a simple conversation right now, and I wanted to know your thoughts on the problem. He finally answered the truth regarding the situation. Well, um, fingers clasped tight against each other, there's many problems that hero healers face, and I've heard a more serious one from the colleagues I worked with before. Those problems are the one that deters so many Omegas from ever stepping into being hero healers. And what are these problems? The expectations are the first. Many expect hero healers to be some sort of a perfect god, able to solve every of their problems but healers aren't god. They're doing the best that they can, but some people aren't satisfied with that. He listed the first reason. Um, the second one is more subjective. He musters up his courage before he explains. It's depending on the heroes, actually. Choosing the bad or good one depends your skill and luck. But from what I've heard, many hero healers encountered bad lucks from choosing their hero. So yeah, that's also one of the reasons. I see, Principal Nezu hummed, is there more? Ah oh yeah, the last, I think. But it's the responsibility. Being able to fix all of your hero's health problems is also one of the reason why many decided to refuse being hero healer. They have to at least master most things regarding bodily functions but knowing the basics of everything is already difficult enough. After Izuku list all of the known problems, he nervously swallowed his saliva, I guess, that's the problems that I can list out to you. Um, is there any more questions? Principal shook his head, staring at Izuku. You've listed all of those problems, but are you sure you'll be able to face and handle it? This time, Izuku nodded in certainty, I'm sure, sir. I've trained and learned about this my whole life and I hope that you but will let me hone my skills and experience to be able to handle those problems myself. Very well. Izuku sighs in relief, though. Before we finish this interview, I must inform you something regarding the curriculum you'll learn if you're accepted. Principal Nezu explained. First of all, we have a different study for healers, but for their first year, they'll mix with hero course students, learning alongside them regarding practical training. Practical trainings. Yes, that means every first-year healer in you. I will train their bodies with hero students. But of course, we can make exceptions as they will mostly train to defend themselves or to master the use of support items to back themselves up. Is it mandatory, sir? It is. The point is to prepare our students, regardless whether they're aspiring heroes or healers for provisional hero license exam in their first year. After that, they can focus back on healing and adjust their study separately from other courses in you. A. The Omega began to feel unsure. He still hurts himself after he tried to kick his brother's punching back let alone train with other hero students like Kakin or Hitchin. He's just handing himself on a sliver platter to get beaten up. But if he's unsure now, every of his hard work before will be for naught. Are you confident that you can handle all of that? With determination, Izuku said, yes. I'm confident, sir. Principal Nezu nodded. The smile is back on his face. It's great conversing with you, Midoriya Kun. That's all for your interview. Thank you for today. Thank you for your time too, Principal Nezu. Izuku stood up and bowed to the stoat, smiling back as he made his way out the room, accompanied by the principal himself as the stoat began to chat with his grandma on the way out of you. A. Izuku followed behind, mind wandering towards every possibilities and every better answers he's able to say at the interview before. Well, it's already over. Izuku can only hopes for the best. All he can do now it to accompany Kaken, Hitchin and Itakun for their entrance exam later.